Welcome everybody. Uh, it's Gordon Clark from Oxford University uh, beginning this webinar, this uh, what is in effect a day long event honoring Patrice Derrington and her most wonderful book. With me as well is Richard Florida, who is the co-convener and co-conspirator about this project. And as we go on, we will have, of course, many others join us as speakers, but also I expect the audience to build and build uh, as we basically go through the process. There are quite a number of speakers, and you might notice that I'm speaking to you from Oxford in the UK. Uh, we have uh, one of our guest speakers is, of course, from Belgium, and we could go Belgium, Oxford, we go then to uh, New York, to Illinois, to Chicago, to, Los, to uh, Los Angeles and Stanford. So we've got quite a spread of uh, speakers here today and more particularly people who really understand Patrice's project, which actually is quite remarkable on many dimensions. Um, very crudely, size and scope really astounded me when I first saw it. But equally, she has said something fundamentally original about actually real estate, and she's been a diligent historian, bringing to the fore many aspects of the, uh, of, of the project that uh, the book's based on. And I don't think there's anything quite like it in the social sciences. And that's saying a lot when you think of all the academics out there who uh, specialised in this kind of research. So welcome, everybody. And welcome to speakers. Welcome to the audience. We've dialed in for the occasion. Uh, welcome. So I've, I've caught Richard <laughs> indisposed. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Patrice, who will also say uh, hello and uh, also might make some remarks about uh, where she started from, at least very briefly, historically speaking. Over to you, Patrice. Thank you very much, Gordon. I'm, I'm humbled by your, your very kind words of appreciation of this. Uh, yes, it, uh, it was a long project, uh, but one I, was, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed. I'm sure like many people on this, uh, at this event, and many, many people worldwide, we love real estate. We love talking about real estate. We love being in our buildings. We love arguing about it. Uh, you know, real property, the, the things we live in every day, are uh, very, very exciting and, and you know, definitely uh, material for lots of juicy comments. So uh, having been fortunate to put together an education combining architecture, and then an MBA business degree, I have practiced in real estate for many, many years. Then um, having the opportunity to go to an academic institution, uh, wonderful ones like New, uh, New York University and then now Columbia University, and be responsible for teaching young people, young future professionals about real estate development I realized, how is it actually done? We go and do it, we try to do it well, but have we ever really thought about what are the essential principles, what are the essential motivating dynamics of this activity? And so I started looking back to see where we were doing this, where it had happened, and this took me way back to the 17th century and Covent Garden. Thank you for having me. Welcome. I'll turn it over to Richard, who will now make some introduction. Oh, I'm just sorry about that. For some reason, my connection dropped off for a minute. So I ran the hardy speed test and found that I have enough bandwidth to carry on. So thank you for bearing with me. I, I want to echo Gordon's comments. I Well, I've known for his trees for a long time. We were colleagues at Carnegie Mellon um, at the beginnings of our career, and I think somehow brought there together. We've never talked about this by one Gordon Clark. Um, an incredible person and an incredible scholar, but an incredible magistral connector of people and human beings and scholars. So 
You know, I, I, I have been an urbanist most of my career, trained in, in Columbia University, Rutgers as an undergraduate, Columbia University, where Therese is as an urban planner uh, in the mid 80s. Um, and late in life, late in life, late in an academic career, I came to the belief that real estate was important to urban development. That sounds so simple minded. When I, when I say it, it sounds almost ludicrous, but I took up an appointment, and I believe Patrice also overlapped with me there as a distinguished visiting professor at the Shack Institute of Real Estate at NYU. And I did that particularly to try to educate myself about real estate. And I learned nothing. And I'm not kidding you that I, I found in our field that there was, there was commentary, like David Harvey's important work on the spatial fix, but there was very little commentary about the central role of real estate. And particularly in a knowledge economy, there was the belief that real estate and space was no longer important. And, you know, then Patrice's book arrived, first in electronic format and then in analog format. And I was literally blown away because Patrice brings real estate, bring it. She not only provides this incredible history, she brings real estate back into our discourse and situates it where it should be at the center of urban theory and gives us, she has, I mean, in many ways, she's answered so many questions but I think Gordon would agree with this, and many of you would agree that she sets the table for so many of us to ask other questions, to, to think deeply about how real estate shapes cities, and, or, and I would say even more than urban development, mm -hmm. shapes capitalist growth. So I just want to echo Gordon's comments. I'm honored, and I feel honored and privileged to be involved. I wish I could. I love the city. I love New York City. Even Gordon compared to Oxford and London, it's still my favorite city in the world. I wish I could be with you here th there today, but hope to be visiting with you in New York uh, soon enough. Matrice, most of all, thank you for making this important contribution. And thanks to all of our, our guests, our distinguished participants, our, our presenters for their incredible contributions. Great, thanks, Richard. Um, it's worth also saying that um, in, a, in bringing together the commentators today, uh, we were very, we were mindful of the disciplines, we were mindful of, if you like, the critical perspectives, analytical perspectives that people bring to the table. And, and that, I think, is also some measure of uh, Patrice's uh, accomplishment here. She's been able to talk to a lot of disciplines and a lot of scholars who, you know, on, in their own fields may have made significant contributions themselves. And as we went around recruiting people, uh, everyone jumped to say yes. So it's quite quite a compliment personally and professionally. One thing uh, Patrice didn't mention was, uh, yes, she was in industry. Yes, she was in banks and investment groups on real estate. And um, I think it's fair to say she met all kinds of people in that <laughs> sojourn. And uh, I, was, I was particularly struck hearing one time a while ago, um, a story about uh, going to see somebody who actually owned a casino or seemed to own a casino. I think it's actually more in the latter, seemed to own a casino and uh, seemed to owe a lot of money to banks. And um, that man, uh, unfortunately, didn't seem to become president, but he became president. It's just a shocker. But uh, there you go. It's... Um, Patrice has seen rogues. She's seen remarkably talented people on the investment side of things. And uh, she has also been able to conceptualise something whole that most of us otherwise look at in part. So with that, I'm sort of conscious of coming up to 45 minutes, uh, that is to say uh, 15 minutes into the uh, presentation. We're going to, of course, start with the first presenter at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I think I'm right. Um, no, sorry, at 9. I, I'm very confused at timing here. At, at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, but before we do that, uh, we are also going to run a tape from Larry Summers. Professor Summers was very gracious in agreeing to make some preliminary comments. He has also read the book, and unfortunately, he can't be here today. I believe he's in Singapore. But nonetheless, he is also a person enormously impressed by the book and enormously impressed by Patrice's accomplishments. So, Patrice, how do we go about 
getting Larry in the frame, so to speak, to get him, his comments displayed. I am delighted to open uh, this symposium in celebration of Patrice Darrington's book, Built uh, Up. You know, there are important books, there are deeply scholarly uh, books, and there are books that are fun to read. There are not very many books that meet all three of those criteria, but at least for me, this was uh, one of them. It's famously been said that we shape our built environment and then our built environment shapes us. If that's even close to true, developers are some of the most important people determining the destiny of our shared spaces, therefore the destiny of our cities, and therefore the destiny of all of us. What they do and how they do it is profoundly important. It's not just the stuff of abstract models or present value calculations. It's the stuff of dreams. Persuasion, sales, motivation, vision. These are as important as financial calculation or carpentry or physical construction. It's the great strength of uh, this book that it tells real stories about real things and therefore makes the mechanics, the abstractions, come to life. That's why I enjoyed reading it. That's why it gave me a greater appreciation of the work of the developers I know. That's why it caused me to think differently about the malls, the buildings, the office parks, the projects. Uh, into which uh, I step. And so I'm only sorry that I can't be present physically for uh, this symposium. I'm sure it will be as great a treat as reading this book was. Okay, here we are again. Now I'm conscious that um, we are uh, 10 minutes away now, just uh, or 15 minutes away from the scheduled start. So I thought in this period of time, I might make some other comments and then get Richard and Patrice to also make some comments before we uh, introduce our first speaker. Uh, the first thing to say about this and, and to sort of reinforce some aspects of the, the debate about real estate and property in modern cities is the, if you like, the flux and flow of what happens in cities. And in my own commentary, I talk about how to conceptualize what happens in one neighborhood, one part of a city, as opposed to other parts of the same city and how they join together, if not directly in terms of adjoining land, but indirectly in terms of the financial market pricing of one parcel of land versus another parcel of land. And indeed, actually, what the future value is of that land looked in not just a local perspective, but also in a global perspective. And for someone like me who has been uh, involved in urban research for many years, but also as an investor through what a major institution in the UK in real estate, it's brought home to me actually many of the issues that I hear investors come into our discussions and explain how they value one parcel of land over another parcel of land. And it's really basic sometimes. It's, it's you know, is the land situated in the right place? And in the UK, that means being in the Midlands at the intersection between major freeways going north, south, east, west. But equally, it's sort of very basic, you know, what, what is the shell? that is the, the building on top of that land. How does, does that have an intrinsic value? Does it have a use value? Is it actually not valuable at all 
except in the sense that it occupies a space land that can be converted to something else altogether. And that's actually, in many respects, what I learned from reading Patrice's book, that sort of sense of contingency about land, about property, contingency on markets, contingency on ambitions and aspirations of those people who hold property or will hold property in the long term. The last comment I make about this is it's too often to think, you know, when you, when you sort of speculate about speculators, what they have in mind is, is the return tomorrow or the return in a year's time or the return in five years' time. But uh, in London, there, are, there is a landholder whose time horizon is almost infinite. It could be a 1,000 years out. So the Crown Estate thinks in terms of centuries, has a rate of return target over centuries, has a claim on space well beyond actually the building on the space, which is either owned or leased by somebody else. And to listen to how the Crown Estate thinks about urban space is completely different to a speculator thinking on the price of land today and tomorrow and the building that might reap a rent. The Crown Estate in London, around Covent Garden, is also thinking about what's its intrinsic value over 100 years or 200 years? How can we get people to pay not just for their current use value, but actually their use value in 50 years or 70 years? And indeed, I'm in an organisation that had to decide recently in re response to the Crown Estate whether or not to hold the lease for 50 years or for another 100 years. And we decided to hold the lease for another 100 years. That says a lot about actually the footprint of human activity and how thinking about real estate is not only in the short term, but it can be that enormous, very long term. And that's why I think Patrice's historical perspective is so revealing, so revealing. Covent Garden then and Covent Garden now, these, this is an expensive real estate, was then, was, is now. So I'll just pass it over with nine minutes to go uh, to Richard to see if he has any last comments, and then we'll take a, a brief uh, uh, comment from Patrice before we move on to Professor Darek uh, Bojic. Of course. Thank you, Gordon. Just a couple of comments on, on my reading of why work, Patrice's work is so important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are great predictions uh, and punditry about real estate being no longer important, an economy of innovation and knowledge. And, and in fact, what's so interesting about this is that land or clustering or real estate have become probably more important to capitalist growth and urban development now than at any point in history. And a couple of facts that I just included in my con uh, commentary. In the United States, just four metropolitan areas, um, the Bay Area, New York, Boston, and Seattle accounted for uh, something like 90% of all innovation job growth over the past uh, couple of decades. And across the world, just six metropolitan areas, the Bay Area, New York, London, Boston, Beijing, and Shanghai accounted for more than all of the, half of all the venture capital startups that have been created over the past decade. Um, moreover, there's a recent McKinsey report, which I find really fascinating. The study, which just came out last week and was reported by uh, Rana Fulcour in the, in the Financial Times, uh, finds that real estate today comprises more than two thirds of the world's entire net worth uh, looking across 10 advanced countries, the US, UK, China, Germany, France, Canada, Sweden, Australia, and Mexico. And an earlier study, this one done about a decade ago, the US found that the total land value uh, in the United States was 23 trillion. Now that's increased. Uh, that's 160% of U.S. total economic output at the time. Um, a new study from Zillow suggests mm -hmm. that the total cumulative value of U.S. homes is nearly 30 trillion, 
also exceeding the total value of all goods and services produced in the U.S. So real estate and land is really important. And uh, also, I think real estate is going through another, the, the ownership, their capitalist control of real estate is going through another transformation. I think part of this we see as investors gobble up uh, not just commercial real estate and multifamily homes, but single family homes. I, I forget the statistic, but I believe it's a fifth of all home purchases over the pandemics were purchased not by individuals, but by institutional investors. And, and looking out a little further, I think one of the changes we'll see if, if, if the 1980s and 90s gave rise to the securitization of real estate, I think we're looking now at the digitalization of real estate coming pretty quickly. And, and so real estate as a basic asset class, um, but one that's not only a historical asset class, one that could be traded in new ways is really fascinating. And, and just one remark on theory. Um, I cut my teeth as a kid at Rutgers and Columbia University on Marx and neo-Marxism and theories of the state and theories of capitalist development. And, have been very influenced by Marx all through all of my career. Although taking a page from the great Christopher Freeman, who I asked this when I was an assistant professor, he said, you may be influenced by Marx, but if you talk about people like Schumpeter, you get your papers published more easily. So I, I've tended not to echo that so much in my formal writing, but my insights have been shaped with Marx. Marx, and Patrice and I were talking about this, and I think we want to do more to jointly understand this. Marx more or less, famously gave real estate short shrift and he lumped the world of capitalism, I'm, I'm saying very crudely, into a model where there were two great cat classes that drove the mode of production forward and in struggle, capitalists and workers, which was the end proletariat. He didn't have much time for real estate and in the commentaries I've seen really derided it. But the person who like uh, Patrice put real estate at the center of the equation is Henry George. And I've been paying a lot of attention to Henry George. You know, land was Adam Smith's first factor of production. The classical economists like Cantillon developed the land theory of value. Ricardo was, Ricardo was very influenced by rent. But it was George who put land at the center and real estate at the center. And where Marx, and I'll say this very briefly, where Marx saw the capitalists as making off with the surplus generated by workers, George, and I'm not saying he's right in this, but I think it's a fascinating view. If you read his work very quickly, and not just the book Progress and Poverty, but the, the report he did before that, which is trying to estimate U.S. land values. If you read that very closely, what Henry George is saying is that it's real estate owners who make off with the surplus generated by both capital and labor. And why I think that's interesting today is if you look at land values and real estate values in, in superstar cities like New York or London or San Francisco, or you look at land views, values across the board, it, it seems increasingly that much of the productive advance or innovative advance or surplus that we generate in these places simply gets plowed back into rising real estate values. And, and that I find to be quite fascinating, how this classical factor of land or real estate, which Marx derided is not that important as kind of a fetter, how over time and in, well into the 21st century, it continues to be a critical factor and indeed a much larger fetter that sort of forms a contradiction in that as more and more surplus is generated, increasingly it appears that that surplus is plowed back into real estate and the home, holders of land. And I think that is Patrice's really remarkable contribution that she forces those of us who work in urban economics, land economics, spatial theory, urban geography, city and regional planning that consider ourselves urbanists to, to really think about real estate in a, in a different um, in, in and in a more important way. So again, thank you, Patrice. And I look forward to your comments and to the comments of others throughout the day. Okay, thank you. Um, look, um, I've been confused. Uh, the first speaker will in fact be Manuel Alves from uh, Belgium. And uh, just in case, uh, Derek Vojcik and uh, uh, Manuel are confused. I was confused, sorry. So, um, uh, so I would like to see Manuel come uh, on video, please. You should be able to see me now, Gordon. Ah, yes. 
<laughs> Welcome, Manuel. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about no that. No problem. Uh, uh, okay, so Manuel, uh, in for and for all of those who are listening in, you've got all of twenty minutes. Uh, you could take five minutes for questions thereafter, but we always are looking for five minutes of grace period uh, at the end of your time to the next uh, speaker, which will be Derek. So um, just looking at the clock as it goes down, we've sort of got one minute to go. I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time introducing the speakers because uh, in so many ways uh, they're well known for everybody. So I will basically give you half a minute, Manuel, if you would like to sort of uh, pick up the uh, gauntlet and uh, begin uh, speaking uh, when, when you like, okay? Yeah, thank you very much, Gordon. I, I am ready. I don't need a half minute, I think. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. That's, that's always good to know because sometimes you think you're sharing something and you're not. Only just yesterday, I recorded a lecture for my students of more than an hour, only to receive an email this morning that they could all see me, but that they couldn't hear me. Um, so I, I still make these basic mistakes. So I wouldn't want to be talking to you for 20 minutes without you being able to see my screen or be able to hear me. Uh, okay, so Gordon, thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks a lot also for inviting me. I'm happy to comment on Patrice's her book. And I'm not going to do a, a long praise of the book. Uh, I, I'm going to keep it rather short, the praise part, because I want to see where we can move on next. So Patrice Darrington provides us with an excellent historiography of real estate development since the 16th and 17th century in London. She takes us through the 20th century in New York City and then takes us into the 21st century, discussing not just New York, but also a number of cases abroad. What I find quite remarking is that the book didn't exist yet. You would think someone would have written this book a long time ago. I think Richard said something along the same lines. You would have thought someone would have written the history of real estate development. Um, so only when the book was announced, I was like, yes, I've never read that book. That is weird that that book doesn't exist. So I'm very happy that the book is being uh, written. I'm very happy. I was very happy to read it and I'm even happier to comment on it. I also wish we could have been in New York City. I used to live in New York for three and a half years and about half of that time I spent in the planning department at Columbia University. So it would have been very nice to see some of those familiar places, which I still hope to visit next year when I hope to be back in New York. But for now, let me focus on some of the contributions that we find. Let me see. Yeah. So as I already mentioned, Patrice starts from 16th and 17th century London. And what struck me is that already in that early affairs, in that early history of real estate development, that real estate development was already not just an economic, but also a political affair. It was very clear that if you wanted to do real estate development, you didn't just need the capital, you needed the connections, you needed the network, you needed to be able to get the state, the local state very often, in a way to be okay with what you do. Um, this also may be one reason why a lot of theories of real estate development fall short. They are either emphasizing this economic part or they're emphasizing the political part, but they're not so good in bringing this together. So what I would like to do today is to go a little bit into bringing them together more, starting to think from Patrice's work and then trying to bring in some other work to see if we can bring them in dialogue with what Patrice has been telling us and seeing how that could work productively. So Patrice herself builds on both the real estate literature and the urban studies literature, which I think is quite nice. Uh, it sounds quite obvious to do that if you talk about real estate, but it doesn't happen that often that those literatures are being confronted in the way that, that Patrice does. There are separate chapters even discussing sort of the critique coming from urban studies to real estate development as a discipline. So the, the approach he follows is quite interdisciplinary and I would like to go along in that way and then presenting some sort of political economy of real estate development. Although some people might say maybe it's more of a sociality of real estate development because they will also be relying on the work of some sort of big names in sociology to make my argument. So if we look at the book, um, at the end of the book in the conclusion, Patrice is uh, formulating three objections of real estate development. This, in a way we could say is a conclusion rather than something coming up front. It's a conclusion of the history 
of the description of this history of, of four or five centuries of real estate development. What we find is the first objective is the provision of shelter for occupants and the community as a whole. The second being the creation of financial assets for capital markets. And the third being the contribution to urban topography and the provision of urban amenities. I was thinking a little bit about these objectives and then I tried to reformulate them a little bit in a slightly different way. And I came up with these two, uh, and both of them actually have two elements in them. So you could say I have formulated them into two objectives or into four objectives. The first one being that real estate development has both use and exchange values. This seems pretty obvious, but it basically translates to some of the things Patrice says in her objectives. The second being maybe a little less obvious, uh, that real estate development may create both direct and indirect use and exchange value. So let me explain the differences a little bit there. If we think of the direct use and exchange value, the direct value uh, of, of the house, the apartment where I'm sitting right now, is that I can sit here, that I can sleep here, work here, and do other things. The exchange value here is that I'm actually renting this flat um, so that there's an economic value is being generated through my rent payment to my landlord and that my landlord, if she wants, she could resell the house at some point. But there are also indirect use and exchange values. So the indirect use value is what Patrice calls the community as a whole, the contribution to the community as a whole, and what she calls in one of the other objectives, the provision of public amenities, which is in a way the question, how do non-occupants benefit or are afflicted by a building? How do people benefit from my building being here? Well, my building is a pretty nice one from the outside, so maybe people would benefit from this indirectly. Uh, there is a bar on the ground floor of my building. There's also a, a dentist on the ground floor of my building. These are facilities that people in the neighborhood may benefit from. These are also facilities in the neighborhood that people might be afflicted by. My building is, is larger than most of the buildings in the neighborhood. It may take away sunshine from some of my neighbors. Uh, the bar may cause some noise. It's not a particularly noisy bar. And there are much noisier bars in the neighborhood. But it's also important here that this use value can also be a negative indirect use value. And Patrice focuses mostly on the idea that real estate development could have a positive value for the community. And that is great, and that is sometimes the case, but I think it's important also to realize that real estate development and the existing buildings can also have negative indirect use values. So if we look at the economic value that we get from a juice, it's already the example I mentioned, my landlord benefits from me paying the rent. And I usually pay it in time, so that's, that's nice for her. She can resell the building in the future, also good for her. She might be able to make some money there, or she might just get her investment back. So in this sense, real estate is rather unique. Real estate provides both a stable income and it provides a stable question mark. It's not always that stable. Uh, we can talk about it a long time, but I won't do that now. I'll just leave the question mark up there. It provides investment potential. This means also that real estate has both commodity and asset features if we look at the site from development and construction into the lifespan of the building. Real estate is also, of course, spatially fixed. And this is the key here to the indirect use and exchange values. These values are, of course, derived from the land. This is no surprise. I assume everyone knows this in this room. I'm not pretending I say anything new here. So location is key. We all know that location, location, location are the three important things for real estate, as we're often reminded. But this means that value and price of real estate and the land underlying it, or the land potentially being used to develop real estate, is derived from the values and the prices of nearby real estate and lands. So the value of real estate, the value of land, changes as a result of the changes in nearby plots. This, again, seems quite obvious, but this is quite important for how real estate development is being done. This means also that this is how the indirect exchange value is being created. The, inexact, uh, the indirect exchange value here is about how it influences real estate values of nearby plots. What's the effect of new housing going up in my neighborhood? What's the effect of the building across the street from me being fixed up and being rented out for higher prices? Is this just one building with higher rents or is this gonna have an effect on the rent in the neighborhood? Is this gonna lead to, lead to uh, possibly a gentrification process? Is it part of it? So the real estate values are always influencing the other real estate values in the neighborhood, which means that real estate development always has an indirect exchange value. It's not just about the building that's being developed, that has these exchange values and the economic uh, income coming also from rent. It also means that it influences not just the use, but also the exchange value of the buildings around it. 
So um, this means that developers, as well as investors, have an interest in increasing investment in a larger area. You would think that if you have two real estate developments next to each other, that they're competing with each other. And this may be true to some extent. I'm not saying they're not competing with each other at all. But actually, these two real estate developments next to each other, or 10 or 20 or more than that, are also working towards the same goal of increasing the indirect exchange value. Uh, of, of these buildings. Of course, they're trying to maximize their own exchange value by making sure the building can be rented out for more money, can be resold for more money, but also trying to make sure that if the whole neighborhood is lifted up, all these buildings uh, benefit from it, even uh, in theory, the ones that are not necessarily being developed or redeveloped. So here I'd like to take a step back and look at the work of the sociologist Max Weber, one of the great uh, sort of classical sociologists. And he argued that um, economic exchange is not simply about competition, but also not about competition between suppliers and competition between uh, the demand side, but it's also about coordination and especially coordination between suppliers. So coordination, Max Weber argues, in many markets might be more important than competition, hence the title of the slides to the left. So there's a power struggle between different types of actors rather than just between developers. And developers here have a joint interest in enlarging the markets. And Patrice refers here to uh, urban policies. I can also think of lobbying. She refers quite explicitly to the idea of the growth machine coming from Harvey Mollach at New York University. Uh, you could also think here of the pro-growth coalition that John Mollenkoff at CUNY City University of New York discusses. And these are sort of more the critical urban studies literature, people from sociology, political science, geography, discussing these kind of issues. But this is in a way, if you take a step back, you can think like this is why this is important, that actually developers may be working to coordinate with each other because they have this joint interest in the land values going up. So uh, then we have another possible sociological perspective here, one of the more um, recent big names in sociology, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. He speaks of different forms of capital, economic capital, social capital, cultural capital, and symbolic capital. And Bourdieu argues, and we're going to simplify his theory a little bit here, that these forms of capital exist side by side, and that to some extent, these forms of capital are exchangeable, but also foundational to each other. It doesn't mean that you can, by definition, exchange one form of capital for the other, but it means that to some extent, it is possible to use one form of capital to further another form of capital. So economic capital, in case of real estate development, that would be obvious to everyone, so I'm not going to discuss that. The social capital was actually also quite easy. Patrice discusses networks between developers, um, so this is also clear. If we extend this uh, social capital a little bit, we start thinking about something that becomes cultural capital, and this has to do with the club-like nature of real estate. And Bourdieu argues that clubs have a spatial basis, uh, and they construct relatively homogeneous groups. They also keep intact these relatively homogeneous groups. And these groups are both instruments of inclusion and exclusion. So it means that within the club, it can be an exclusionary measure to have a joint language, joint ideas, but also joint lobbying and things like that. But it's also a measure of exclusion, of excluding other groups from real estate development, other actors that may have an interest in real estate development, but are not developers themselves to exclude them here. And Bourdieu argues that if this happens quite effectively, if actually some of the um, sort of um, the, how you say it, the use of cultural capital, if some of the use of cultural capital in combination with economic and social capital is almost taken for granted, and if the effects are not necessarily seen as effects of having uh, having these different forms of capital, then he actually speaks of symbolic capital. These are the effects of any form of capital when it's not perceived as such. Other social theorists may speak of, of hegemony here, but actually the idea of symbolic capital in a way is, is a little bit sort of a less big concept than hegemony, because hegemony seems to be almost like a black and white situation, where symbolic capital was always uh, in, in relationships to these other forms of capital. And Bourdieu argues that this form of symbolic capital, the use of it where it's actually not being re uh, recognized necessarily, may also result in symbolic violence. This could be, for instance, when there's development at the expense of the community, referring back to what I earlier called negative use values. So then let's see if we can confront Bourdieu and uh, Darrington a little bit more. 
in built up, um, Patrice shows that landowners um, realized that the use, that not only the use, but also the direct and indirect exchange values of the land. In a way, she shows how this happened in 16th and 17th century London, how before it was all about use value, and these landowners started to see, we can do more with the land. We can use it in different ways, make more money on the land, use it more productively, um, and this, this is how she basically tells how the first landowners became the first developers. You could say in Bourdieu's terms that these first uh, developers used economic, social, and cultural capital to seek favorable public investments, which then became the hallmark of their symbolic capital. And this is how real estate development was born, and in a way, how it gave shape to modern and contemporary real estate development. This is where it could end, but then I found there's another interesting thing to say. Yeah? And if time is still, still on my side, and I think it is, I can go in one other perspective here uh, in which one of the great names of political economy also could be uh, put in dialogue with Patrice Darrington. Um, Patrice, in a way, um, this discusses the discovery of direct and indirect exchange value. Again, my terms, but my reading through a sociological or political economy lens of her work. And this reminded me of the work of von Thunen. Um, von Thunen is famous in uh, a land economics, real estate economics, but also in economic geography for his model of agricultural land use. I will show it in a minute. But what is interesting here is that Fontuna himself was a Junker, a Junker, uh, is sometimes translated to English, but this is basically a form in uh, Prussia of the landed nobility. It doesn't translate necessarily directly into a proper English term, but it is one form of the landed nobility. It's not the highest form, uh, but these were typically large landowners. And it's a little bit similar to what Patrice describes in London, where these first real estate developers were also large landowners. And these large landowners in London, as uh, von Thunen did in Prussia, discovered in a way what they could do with their land. And what Fontuna did is he developed ideas about land use and how to reap rent from them, how to make money on the land he uh, had. He already owned some land, and then in 1810, he bought a large estate in mecklenburg schwerin a part of what is now Germany, and uh, he developed what he called a model farm there. In 1826, so that is 16 years later, he wrote a book basically about this and theorized how you could use these large land holdings and make the best of them. So the book was called The Isolierte Staat in der Beziehung auf Landwirtschaft und Nationalökonomie, uh, the isolated state uh, with an eye on, um, you could say, land economics and national economics. So you see here the connection between the land economics and the political economy already developing. And basically, he asked the question how to develop agricultural land according to its highest and best use. If you take out the word agricultural, it just seems to be the question uh, in a way that many developers ask themselves. So here you see the model. What is most famous from the model is this lower part of the model. These rings, they're known as Fontuna rings, four concentric rings about where you would find different land uses. I'm not discuss discussed in detail. I hope many of you will know it. What is actually the more interesting part is the top part of the model, which is where Fontuna spends a lot more time about. And this is indicating how by having different land uses, you can get more profit out of the land and in a way how it works within uh, sort of the horizontal line, you look at which of the different diagonal lines is the highest ones. And that is how much um, farmers would be paying to leave the land from Fontuna. So this is assuming that there's a large landowner and he, and in most cases it would be, he is renting out this land to farmers, leasing it to farmers. So, what we saw here that Fontuna organized the land according to the economic potential of, of the land use. It was not so much about how to reap crops, it was about how to reap land rents. It wasn't about the fertility of the land, it was about which piece of land located where allows me to use the land in which way to make the most money on it. 
Interestingly enough, in the book, although this is often forgotten, Fontuna also discovers how society and contextual changes affect land rent, how technolo technological inv uh, inventions uh, affect land rent, how uh, all kinds of developments, transportation and things like that also are actually a way in which you can make more money on the existing land. It was designed to benefit the landowners, not the farmers. Um, in a way, Fontuna also theorized something that Karl Marx would later call absolute rent. And of course, it's quite interesting, Marx writing as a socialist, Fontuna uh, writing as a member of, uh, you could say, the higher classes as a representative of capital, but they came to very similar conclusions about what Marx called absolute rent. Um, Fernand Braudel, a great French historian, some people would say one of the greatest historians ever, he considered both Marx and Fontuna the two great German political economists. And why I'm going back to this history of Fontuna? Because what Fontuna did is, in a way, he discovered how agricultural land could be used uh, in a way what Patrice describes about what could happen in London by these landowners owning the land. But the difference here, these landowners in London didn't write a book. They had to wait for Patrice to write the book. Fontuna did, in a way, did the practice and then wrote a book about it. So Patrice Bar uh, Darrington, and this is where I'm going to end, this is going to be my last line, Patrice provides us with an excellent, oh sorry, I'm going back to my first line, excuse. So in closing my talk, I would like to say one more thing. For agricultural land use, it took Fontuna a few decades uh, to go from the practice that he developed himself to an evidence-based theory of land use for real estate development. Um, but such a book was sorely lacking for real estate development, especially urban real estate development. It took Patrice Darrington to provide us with the roots and the advancement of real estate development since its genesis four centuries ago. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to step in and, and thank you very, very much, Manuel, uh, taking us, uh, broadening our understanding through of, of urban real estate through to that historical beginning in agricultural value is absolutely key to what we have inherited in our minds about the importance of owning property. Uh, and, you know, the interesting notion of a diversified agricultural portfolio, of course, is now played out with institutions who, who uh, seek to hold diversified real estate portfolios. So we've got an echo of this very, very fine uh, beginnings from Von Thurer. Thank you for bringing that up. Gordon, Richard, I'll pass over to you, oh. maybe some questions. That, that was um, great. Um, one of the um, things that I've noticed, uh, as I said, uh, being an investor as much as an academic about this space, is how you construct portfolios of property and for what purpose do you construct the portfolios in a sense that they overlap thematically and in a sense I think I say in my own commentary that you bring together like types of properties around the world and what you're doing is managing risk if you like geographically across the world but basically taking advantage of the benefits of one type of property that has a not a, quite a universal value, but a sort of well understood value. Or what you do is you build a, a portfolio, say within a country that is geographically diverse. So I wondered if Manuel, you might sort of comment a little bit more on what you mean by these portfolios of property. What types of risks are they trying to deal with? Could you repeat the last line again? You said something about risk, but I couldn't hear it very well, Gordon. Sorry. Uh, I'm. I wondered if if you might explain in some with some examples about the portfolios you have in mind and what their building blocks are underpinning them. Um, oh, I need to think about that. You, you, you mean the portfolios as in the terms of indirect uh, exchange value or? Well, yes, but also how do you translate that to property on the ground? Um, well, I, I didn't talk much about portfolios, so I find it hard to, to see exactly what you're trying to get at, but I'm, I might be missing your point. Sorry. Well, it, what I'm looking for is a translation of the principles into the practice of real estate investment and indeed 
the benefits that investors want to get out of property. Yeah, well, I think it's it's what you see in many cases, developers working together in a way to develop or redevelop right. an area. So I think that is a clear example of where you see they have a joint interest. Um, so Hudson Yards in New York is, is yep. a great example where the location within Manhattan, in a way, on the one hand, is very good. It's very central. It's close to Midtown. On the other hand, it's a very bad location. Um, the infrastructure is is not particularly pretty there. Um, some blocks feel very unpleasant. And there's some mecha developments. There's a tunnel coming in with like four or five exits. So you can also say that last part means there's a lot of potential there. But if I, as a real estate developer, would put one building there, um, well, I might still make a profit on that building and it might work well. But if I really want to make money with the land I own, whether by developing or whether by, by selling the land to someone else, it needs all the development around it, right? So you need a lot of developers at the same time or in the same time frame to do something like this, to live up to the potential of the land. And this is about these indirect uh, exchange values. And to do this, it's you, you need coordination between the developers and you need to lobby the local government to intervene in this area, to make investments in the area, but also to rezone, which it doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money to rezone, um, but it still costs a lot of efforts of developers and of the governments to get this done. Um, so I think that's, that's where you, you see in practice how this idea of coordination uh, works and how through the coordination between them and between them and the local states, they yeah. shape this indirect exchange value. Yes, of course, coordination uh, comes in many flavors and uh, some of it's above board, but uh, often it is actually uh, the sort of, sort of the stuff of life of corruption and, and urban development go hand in hand. So that's I have a, two that's questions for Manuel. Um, first of all, thank you. I, I've learned a lot in this hour and learned a tremendous amount from your talk. And I, like probably everyone else on this Zoom, read their von Thunen. But I didn't read this one, tune in. and it, it, your reading is so contextualized and so important. So my two questions are, um, the first one more mundane, and you can just punt on it. Real estate has always been a very local industry. It seems to me, especially with regard to Hudson Yards, these players are now more global. So do you think that's happening, it is, is my more mundane question. And feel free to say, I, I don't know, or I don't care. The more... I think interesting question for you is you have a very close reading of Von Tunin. You have a very close reading of Marx and I've been playing around with Henry George. So theoretically, how do you think Von Tunin, Marx and George compare in their view? Are landlords a separate class? I, I'm asking that very vaguely. Are they a separate entity, a faction of capital that is extracting a tremendous amount of surplus through their ownership of land and manipulation of land and coordination? Or are they, in your view, more of what Marx said, uh, just a, a member of the capitalist class and not particularly interesting, at least in my reading? Or I may have that wrong. So I, I thought you'd be the most appropriate person to ask that question to. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, I think the first question is relatively easy. Yes, I would agree that we're moving partly to global players. But I would say it's, it's a partial globalization, right? In, in terms of investment, prime markets are very much global markets. Yep. It's big institutional capital that's behind this. Yep. Gordon knows much more about this than I do. Um, I think in terms of development, we see a combination between, on the one hand, local players, but in places like New York, some of those local players are becoming national yeah. players or international players. But rarely are they active globally. Uh, so this is another interesting thing. A lot of them are active in select locations and they might be working in other global cities, but not necessarily everywhere. Um, so yes, a partial globalization, I would say. The second question, I don't know Henry George as much uh, as well as you do. Um, Fontuna, Marx, um, I mean, have very different perspectives, but I am definitely here more on the Harvey and reading reading of Marx. I mean, I read my Harvey better also than I read my Marx, to be honest. And I, I would agree with both von Thunen and Harvey coming from completely different perspectives that you could say land use uh, and land development and landlords are worth the attention. Um, there's also, there was an interesting debate in the 1980s in British housing studies. Uh, Gordon is asking me to, to stop soon. I'll, I'll, I'll finish two sentences. And it was basically about the question, um, is housing 
just something where we find uh, the typical capital versus labor, or is there something else going out in, in going on in housing market that actually goes beyond that? And the Marxists uh, were supposed to say no, although not all of them did. And the way Barian said, actually, there's something more going on here, and I think this is true. Um, real estate markets, land markets have their own way of uh, producing class in ways that are sometimes parallel to but not necessarily exactly the same as what happens in labor markets. Perfect. Agree entirely. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. And I must say, very, very interesting. Um, uh, and what breadth. What breadth. So we're going to uh, turn now in a minute's time to Derek Poyshek from uh, Oxford University. Um, and I just want to um, bring him online so that we can see him. And... Uh, where is Derek? I'm here. There you are. Excellent. Um, sorry about the mix up in order, but um, here we are. And um, you've got um, uh, the same order uh, up to 25 minutes. It's best if you finish in 20 minutes, five minutes for questions. Uh, but I'm actually now just wasting your time. So I'm going to give you half a minute, Grace. Off you go. Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, thank you, Patrice. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I'm a financial and economic geographer. I'm speaking from my residential uh, real estate in Oxford. And uh, when I first came to England in 1998, uh, I came from Poland, so a country emerging from over 40 years of uh, communist regime. A big part of the cultural shock I experienced here, other than meeting Gordon as my supervisor, which was a positive uh, shock. Uh, the negative shock was the low quality of most buildings here, particularly residential. Uh, poor insulation, double taps, thin walls, exposed pipes, general lack of uh, solidity. I don't need to, to go on. And so first, uh, as a geographer, I, I described it, I explained it with weather, okay? Mild climate, a roof above your head is enough to protect you from uh, elements. Uh, then I came across uh, historical uh, explanations. The country has uh, not been invaded for a long time. The average building age is uh, high. Uh, old fashioned technology is... Uh, still everywhere. But with time, also as an economic and then financial geographer, I learned about financial and legal factors affecting this material fabric of uh, England, uh, the significance of which seems to be confirmed by Patrice's uh, book. Land ownership, particularly in England, is highly concentrated. Land leases are relatively uh, short. And long-term objectives in building are further curtailed by the financialization of uh, real estate development driven by short-term profits with community and societal interests, sometimes also those, uh, the interests of uh, people uh, housed in the buildings themselves uh, falling by the wayside. So Oxford, where I live, uh, is, is, is no exception. There are two more episodes in my experience of English uh, real estate that this book, Patrice's book, uh, sheds light on. So in 2006, uh, I lived in London and every second shop on my high street turned into a real estate agency, literally. Uh, television was full of programs about IT managers becoming developers because why would they be so stupid to only earn 100,000 pounds a year if you can make so much more easily in property development. So I went to my agent on the street uh, asking about the possibility of buying a lot of land to, to build a house. Uh, so this is something that people, uh, many people in Poland would, would do, uh, buy land and, and, and build a, a house. Uh, but my agent was shocked. Only developers and the super rich, uh, he said, can buy. Uh, real estate can buy land uh, here. Okay, maybe, maybe just maybe you can buy some rural land north of uh, Birmingham. 
So this was again a lesson that contrasted with my Polish uh, background where uh, buying land and building your own house is still common even in big uh, cities. And most recently, as a happy house owner occupier, uh, I realized that I actually don't know the value of the land on which my house stands uh, in relation to the value of the house itself. Uh, almost everyone in Poland would know such a thing, but hardly anyone does here. Uh, so again, these oddities, uh, at least from a uh, Polish perspective, are the product of historical, political, financial and legal processes that have been going on in this country. As the book shows, uh, they have been going on for centuries. Now, speaking about shocks, uh, when I first received Patrice's book, I was thoroughly surprised by the big format, rich illustrations, uh, not just another monograph, as people before me said, it's, it's really a work of, 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 of love, uh, not just research. Uh, just look at the ambitious table of contents, everything. And I really uh, agree with and want to emphasize Patrice's uh, identification of the research gap here. Uh, she says private development, despite extensive criticism, uh, uh, does not itself interrogate its processes or seeks to improve its practices. Uh, in this, it does not qualify as an institutionalized discipline or attracts scholarly and professional uh, respect. Well, just recently, I was reminded of how under-researched real estate was while conducting uh, input-output analysis uh, of the US economy with my associate, uh, Takis Iliopoulos. So imagine in 2020, for those of you who are into network analysis, in 2020, real estate uh, was, had the highest total strength centrality measure of all sectors in the US economy. So put simply, to those of you not interested in network analysis, this is real estate is the most important economic sector in terms of its inflows and outflows and the degree to which they penetrate the whole US economy. And its centrality has actually grown over time, uh, not only uh, prior to the global financial, to the subprime crisis, I should say, uh, but also uh, ever uh, since. Now, Patrice's book follows what she describes as a, or the historical turn in business uh, studies. Uh, but I think it also offers elements of and potential for a spatial or geographical turn. Uh, the deep dive into the private property development in 17th century London is, is, is fascinating. Uh, shows the role of shocks in economic development with the great fire of 1666 a changing the use of uh, building materials. And the contrast between innovative but conscientious earls of Bedford and Southampton on one side and the speculative Nicholas Barbon is instructive. Uh, the book is a story of property development as financial innovation, as well as path dependence, styming a feather innovation, for example, through the use of the discounted cash flow uh, model. Again, quoting, uh, Patrice, the understanding of the mutual benefit uh, achieved through designating portions of a site to positive economic externalities for the community was not explicitly formulated in the financial calculations for urban development. And as a result, uh, community, community contribution remains a qualitative assessment, not justified by economic rational and neglected when financial objectives became uh, dominant. And as she documents, uh, this process started happening already in the 17th uh, century, at least in the 17th century. Regarding the geography in the book, I really love, uh, as, a, as a geographer, I love the Patrice's phrase, distance of financial interests. Uh, this reminds us of the quintessentially geographical problem involved growing distance between investors and often developers as well on one side and communities in which property is located on the other uh, side. And this distance is enabled, if not created by financial innovation, regulation, uh, technology and globalization. Faraway investors and developers tend to, tend to 
neglect and underestimate uh, both positive and negative local externalities of real estate. And as a result, prefer reductive financially driven models of evaluating real estate at the expense of more inclusive uh, metrics. Uh, this problem is aggravated when uh, equity, particularly public equity, uh, is used uh, as a side effect of the liquidity that uh, equity uh, offers. And to compound the issues, in addition to investors and uh, developers, users can be non-local too. Uh, think of empty houses bought for investment and money laundering, uh, or money laundering, or both in Miami, Sydney, London, uh, Toronto, Oxford, anywhere. Uh, historical case studies in the book illustrate the problems of distance very well. Uh, the developers of Cavan Garden and Bloomsbury, which arguably achieved very positive societal outcomes, lived within their new built precincts. The developers of less socially successful St. James's and Red Lion Squares in London departed entirely upon uh, completion. I don't think this is a, a coincidence. Uh, the role of proximity is also made palpable uh, in the book by the fact that the birth of modern property development is located right between Westminster with its court and the city uh, with its merchants and financiers. Close connections in both places were crucial for the early uh, developers discussed in the book. And such connections are still crucial uh, for developers today. Now, history and geography in the book. Where they meet lies a potential challenge uh, to the book. So can we be sure, uh, how can we be sure to identify 17th century London as the cradle of modern property development business? Or does it smug of Euro and Western uh, centrism? Uh, it's the kind of bias uh, I experienced in San Marco library. This uh, summer I was uh, lucky to go to, uh, to Florence uh, San Marco Library in Florence was funded by Cosimo di Medici in the 15th uh, century. Uh, Medici, the founder of the banking dynasty. And the library is wooing its visitors uh, with the writing on the wall that it's one of the oldest public libraries in the world, full stop. But then when you actually read, do research, you find that Damascus had a public library 750 years earlier. <laughs> And, 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 and later the dozens of cities in the Middle East and elsewhere. Now, London's tripling of its population, mainly through migration uh, during the course of the 17th century from 200,000 to 600,000, nearly 600,000 by 1700, indeed created huge demand uh, for shelter and public space. But there were many cities that reached larger, even much larger populations of 1 million or more, uh, before London. Uh, I counted 10 such uh, cities, Alexandria, Rome, Constantinople, Baghdad, Cairo, as well as five cities, including Beijing in uh, China. All of them hosted major financial uh, innovations. Uh, so is it not possible, indeed likely, that private sector was involved in property development uh, to house the booming populations and shape public spaces uh, in these cities before? Uh, London. And if so, is it possible that these innovations have influenced developments in 17th century London, as they probably, I think, circulated in the Silk Road network, trade network, uh, connecting London with the Middle East uh, and China via cities uh, of Renaissance Italy, like, uh, like uh, Florence uh, and, and, and Venice. So there are other potentially missing links in the in the story. By the 17th century, Amsterdam uh, took over the button of the leading financial center in Europe uh, from Antwerp, uh, which uh, in turn superseded uh, Bruges and Venice, uh, that were dominant in, uh, which were dominant in the 16th uh, century. Florence, Venice, Antwerp are mentioned in the book. Uh, Amsterdam, I, I don't think it is. So uh, my question is, wasn't the development of London real estate influenced by the role of Amsterdam as the beehive of uh, financial innovation with its own stupendous property development uh, during the 17th uh, century. And, and also by 
the Anglo-Dutch personal union that followed the glorious revolution in 1688. The book says that London with rising agglomeration of migrants, flourishing intellectual activities, variety of skills capabilities and focus on financial transactions was ideal for the emergence of the early real estate developers. I agree, but, but so was Amsterdam, uh, maybe before London. Uh, another missing link that could uh, be explored, uh, building on this wonderful work, is the role of offshore uh, finance, corruption and illicit finance, the dark side of, of things. The book touches on it when it, when it mentions the, uh, the plague of unoccupied luxury condos. But when I think about the globalization of real estate that Richard mentioned and, and, and Manuel in the Q&A 10 minutes ago, it takes me all the way to a boardwalk, to the boardwalk in Miami Beach, uh, overshadowed by uh, high-rise residential uh, uh, blocks, which get totally dark uh, in the evening because nobody lives there. <laughs> uh, when you read about it, majority of multi-million dollar condos in Miami Beach are purchased with cash. Uh, often, uh, I bet, produced out of a suitcase uh, with uh, few or no questions asked by Miami realtors and uh, lawyers. Uh, so there's much more work to be done on the abuse of tax laws, uh, the use and abuse of trusts, uh, 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 secrecy in private uh, property development. Uh, or oh, this note is interesting to read in the book about the 17th century Bedfords and Southamptons invested in the Bermuda uh, company. Uh, back then, it was obviously about exploration, trade, and, uh, and slavery thrown in for good measure. Uh, now it's about another form of colonialism, uh, using Bermuda trusts, other legal vehicles to establish and prolong modern uh, English and other uh, dynasties. So questions can be asked both about the origins and the impacts of private property development in 17th century London that the book uh, focuses uh, on. The book states that uh, the model of private urban development that started in London spread across the Anglo-American world uh, and with only the slightest legal and economic modifications has been embraced by uh, formerly non-capitalist economies and other governmental uh, systems. But perhaps uh, what I said about my, my Polish uh, uh, perspective on, on these things, the statement is uh, exaggerated. Uh, what, for example, about the lack of trust as a legal construct in, uh, in civil law uh, countries? What about traditions, uh, cultures, uh, institutions of property development which had suddenly been established in many countries for centuries and do not change uh, so uh, easily. Uh, and there are vested interests involved uh, in the reproduction. Now, one of the paradoxes of real estate globalization highlighted by uh, this book so well is that this globalization has happened without much standardization of property development as a sector or a profession. So the book describes that the relative lack of professional association or regulation of practitioners uh, for the development activity continues uh, today. Uh, and this may be related, uh, I think, to the often observed low, often observed low standards and, 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 and also uh, corruption. Uh, while we read about professionaliza professionalization of architects, so think of uh, Inigo Jones in 17th century uh, London, Property developers uh, escape uh, simple categorizations. Uh, they are entrepreneurs, uh, they are professionals, uh, financiers, uh, and more at the same time. You may want to think or not to think about Donald Trump. Uh, I, 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 I leave that to you. Interestingly, in the context of real estate, as part of the financial and professional services complex, a property, property development is uh, probably one of the areas where the role of big four companies it has been minimal. Uh, big four are advisors on absolutely anything and everything, even underwriters of financial deals. Uh, but I think that real estate seems to be the market they have difficulty getting into. And this maybe says something interesting uh, about the uh, sector. So the book it stimulated me hugely uh, to reflect on topics which are 
obviously beyond the scope uh, of the book itself. Uh, what about sustainable real estate uh, development? There are mentions of ESG, uh, but what about green bonds impact investing in relation to, to real estate? Uh, in addition to community impacts of real estate, we have to consider global externalities uh, to, what, to what Manuel was talking about. For example, for climate, you know, a, a ton of CO2 emitted from a building contributes to the global uh, emissions with global impacts. What about diversity? Uh, I guess real estate development is male dominated with major consequences on its, uh, on its modus uh, operandi. Uh, many of the characters in the book itself are Oxbridge educated white uh, English uh, males. And what about technology, including prop tech, smart cities and internet of things. Internet of things in particular makes buildings and real estate tools of surveillance. <laughs> so further multiplies the dilemmas and trade-offs involved in property development as if, as if it, it wasn't convoluted and complex uh, enough already. And, and what about COVID-19 impact? So given the likely lower demand for office space, higher demand for residential building and change in the nature of what is sought after. So to move towards finishing here, I'm absolutely fascinated by Patrice's motivation, as she explained, and interest uh, for this book, and uh, her interest in real estate teaching, and, and the potential impact this book can have on uh, teaching programs. Uh, I believe, as a financial geographer, uh, that we also need to teach geographers more on real estate uh, proper. Uh, I'm sure Manuel does. Uh, personally, I'll never walk in Covent Garden or Bloomsbury uh, again, without thinking about property development. Uh, and I will thank uh, Patrice for that. Uh, I hope to take my students on a field trip uh, there. Interestingly, uh, the leading property development companies in the UK are still headquartered exactly between the city and Westminster. <laughs> so, you know, three and 50, 100 years later uh, to the events uh, described in the book. Uh, Brookfield, Prologis, Well Tower, Segro, Land Securities, the list goes on, uh, all there. And the book is a reminder that financial geography is not only about spatializing finance, but about financializing uh, space, about financial production of uh, space. So I really also love uh, uh, Patrice's use of a quote from David Harvey, that money may be, as the moralists have it, the root of all evil, yet uh, it appears also as the unique means of doing good. Uh, I haven't seen many people quoting that from David Harvey. Uh, so on this parting note, I just wanna say, maybe the book is also, or should also be a call for uh, or the moral philosophy of real estate. Uh, real estate is long-term in nature, changing communities and societies in, in the process. As such, it requires long-term commitments in not a word used often in economics, in the world where people use finance to turn these long-term commitments into short-term liquid money-like claims to make it like money, basically, uh, when people use law uh, to rubber stamp uh, such financial transformations in the form of contracts, and when people use accounting uh, to obsess with short-term mark-to-market valuation, and the government quietly approves or even promotes all of these processes, uh, the long-term commitment uh, may go missing or goes missing. And the result may be a short-term quest for quantity and superficial uh, appearance. So my question is, can we have finance law, accounting and government working towards more long-term objectives of real estate? I put it to everyone here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I wondered if Patrice, um, you, you might have some comments in response. Oh, I would just, uh, I'm so thankful to Darius uh, for expanding just my, my sort of meager exploration of this to all of those key things that uh, we are, are challenged with today. Uh, and um, I hope that this, you know, thank you. I am already making ideas for projects to continue that myself. So thank you very, very much. And that's the whole point of opening up this 
uh, you know, doing the open commander of what real estate development is about to say, where can we go from here? Thank you. Could, could I ask a, a question, Derek? Why do you think, uh, you make a point about real estate development in uh, Western cities to be, in a sense, underdeveloped in terms of the institutions or organisations that would have otherwise cornered the market, say, for example, in power generation or some, or even retail for that matter. Why do, why do you think the property market or indeed the building market is so fractured and fragmented? Right, so uh, in, in general or in relation to uh, other geographies uh, well, other than Western you, Europe? Well, why don't you start with, with respect to Western Europe? And indeed, you, you know, you're sort of making the contrast between whole industries in the UK being incredibly sort of, there are dominant firms. Why aren't there dominant firms in property in real estate markets in the UK? It's coming. So first, what I wanted to say is that where some of my comments come from. So I've been studying financial centers for a long time, not uh, particularly focusing on real estate development. Uh, uh, and something I confess, and after reading this book, I want to uh, correct. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm myself an example how you can kind of easily just kind of make assumptions about about the origins of a lot of these financial innovations and developments in, uh, in Western Europe, uh, sometimes going back to Italy, sometimes going back to uh, uh, classical civilizations. Uh, uh, but, uh, but then uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, I've been in recent years, I've been pushed to, to read more on, on China from a similar mm -hmm. perspective on India, on uh, uh, on uh, Mesopotamia and so on and so forth, uh, and the role in the, of the Middle East actually in the birth of capitalism itself, yeah. and how a lot of ideas uh, that influenced the Renaissance Italy, for example, actually uh, came uh, uh, from the fact that also Venice was the terminus of the of the Silk Road network. Uh, so, uh, so I would just say that uh, I. I cannot imagine these big cities in other civilizations developing so successfully for, for centuries and sometimes millennia without some good solutions to the questions that we're asking now in the context of 17th century London or even uh, 21st century uh, Western Europe or, or America. Okay. I, I, I sense there's a, there's a huge potential there uh, to learn and geographers should lead the charge on it. Okay, so Richard, you're, you're currently occupying an apartment in a building that is otherwise probably fairly empty, according to Derek. Um, what is it about Miami? You know, you're a recent joiner of Miami. Is, is it actually this coexistence of the occupied and the unoccupied in, in these buildings that sort of makes the economy work? Well, um... You know, partly I live in Toronto where it gets extraordinarily cold in the winter. Yes. So, yeah, we, we wanted a little bit of a getaway where things were a little bit warmer and you could have a reprieve. Um, you know, I want to ask Darius, I think he's very spot on on this. Um, I want to make just one general comment and ask him a question. First of all, I think this globalization of real estate is happening in real time. And I think you pointed out innovation, property tech, but the 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 aggregation happening with even the big four, the Goldman Sachs, is that there is a, a move now for, for the Blackstones, the Black Rocks, the Brookfields to acquire lots of smaller players. And it, 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 it's it's incredible. I, Black was it Blackstone bought AIG's affordable housing portfolio for nine billion dollars a couple of months ago. This is happening in real time. And I think you're going to see an industry that is more rationalized and where these players want to get more involved. But and you can comment on that. But I have a more specific question along the lines of Gordon's question. I think real estate is really a two hats, a white hat, black hat problem, more so than most other industries. I think there are organizations, you mentioned Brookfield. I think there are large organizations and major, many of the major pension funds, sovereign wealth funds that Gordon speak about that really want positive impact, ESG, sustainability, affordable housing. But I think there's a horrific dark side. And this is what Gordon was getting at in real estate, where it is a massive vehicle for money laundering. Uh, and for all of those, you have the Donald Trumps. 
Uh, and and I would just like you to reflect on this issue of, of not just the bark buildings, but but the real estate's role in laundering money. Um, and I think we need that's an area of capitalism that has been very not studied enough empirically or theoretically. Just like you to reflect in a minute on that. Thank you, Richard. And, and, and you uh, have one minute. Yeah, one minute is great. That's all you need. I think it, it does seem to me like I've been studying the financial business professional services uh, complex for a long time. And after reading this book, I am uh, uh, I'm kind of it, it, the book confirms my suspicion that real estate is the most opaque uh, of yes. all of these industries. I absolutely agree. And the globalization also uh, it hugely happens now through the real estate investment trusts uh, owned by institutional investors uh, and owning uh, shopping malls and, and much else uh, uh, globally. Uh, I, I think it's yeah it's happening at a, at a staggering pace that that has to be that has to be studied. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Derek. I'm now looking for Sam, and I wondered if Sam. No, no, Janelle. Janelle. Wonderful. I'll go ahead and jump uh, right in. So, uh, Patrice, thank you so much. It was such a privilege to read the book and to contribute to the symposium. I, mean, I think as the other commentators have said, it really is a remarkable uh, body of work. And for me, I read, I, although the focus is largely on 16th and 17th century London, I was really fascinated by the, the earlier origins where Patrice begins with the kind of classical orientation of, of land, privatization and property, and then the moral imperative um, that's directed through those, those classical learnings. So that's, I, I was very deeply impressed by the scope of covering 2000 years of history in some sense, and then the meticulous detail um, of the developers of which uh, Patrice wrote. So I, the, my, my commentary is gonna focus on these origins and then also thinking about pathways of development for the future. Um, so let me, let me see, how do I move my screen? Oh, here we go. Uh, so Patrice really organized the book around three questions. And I think Manuel already noted this in, in, in the conclusion. And for me, this was a way to really read and organize and understand the text. And so I also want my commentary to reflect this structure. So how and why did such a model of production emerge when it did and become the dominant mode of urban growth? Why does it take the form it does? And what exactly is that form? And why is this form of economic production so poorly regarded and charged with responsibilities for so many urban ills? Where might improvements be made? So for the first question of how, uh, this is where Patrice delves into the, the philosophy of, of Plato and Aristotle. And I think this is kind of fascinating because it's actually, if you go deeper than the neoclassical political economists, this is really where it begins, at least for the Western world. She has this wonderful quote, the better system is that under which property is privately owned, but is put to common use, a kind of public imperative um, in the writings of Aristotle that privatization is the way to maximize the value of land, but it should always have this lean or this direction of facilitating common use. And to that, I also, I think Manuel already commented on this, and I, I went back to the original um, thinkings on use and exchange value in Aristotle's writing on the politics, that he identified two uses and didn't exactly um, identify these as use and exchange, but said one is the proper and the other is the improper or secondary use of anything. Um, and then went on to say that exchange is an in fact unnatural, a mode by which men gain uh, in the most hated sort of way, and with the greatest reason usury, which is gained for money, for money's sake, um, you know, for money was not intended to be used in exchange, but instead to be put to, to sort of what he called the management of health, households. And so I think in this idea of the use value in exchange, there's two really important principles to pick up for understanding land and the privatization of land. One is that there was originally this moral imperative of public good. And throughout the book, Patrice explores that tension. How do you generate um, a, a range of different utilities for the, the, the use of real estate 
but with that always the public amenity. And I think in that moral imperative, Aristotle recognizes that privatization tends towards excess and exclusively private benefit. So I'll come back to this idea in a moment. The second is that in privatization, the land is only realized in its productive use. And to this, I think, is where Aristotle brings the idea of there's the proper and the improper or secondary use of it. This idea that to really fully make benefit of the land, you have to understand and capitalize on its productive use. And so again, I'll come back to that principle, but I think it's really important. To Patrice's question of why maximizing the use of land, here she, she drew from the Enlightenment uh, philosophers Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and again, leaned on what is the, the moral imperative. Land is tied to man's civic responsibilities. There's a natural law embodied in a constitution of a civil power, which provides for the governance of property rather than it's being administered through religious edicts. So there is a public responsibility. And then with Locke, this really interesting principle that first property not be wasted, but rather through human labor, it be used to create value. And secondly, that the quantum of property in an individual's possession should be limited so that there would be enough as good equality remaining for others. So in effect, if an individual owned land enclosed or fenced it, but did not cultivate it or make it productive, Locke argued such land was still to be looked on as waste and might be the possession of any other. And I think this is absolutely a fascinating principle because you can see the, the positive moral intent in it that you, you allow private possession of land, but always with the eye towards making it productive to public benefit and problematic because it is also the logic, if we look across the colonial world, through which indigenous and other native inhabitants were dispossessed of their land. If they weren't making so-called productive use of it or putting the land to its productive use, there was this inherent argument that it could be better used by the white civilization moving in to occupy the land. The other piece of it that I think is also really fascinating to consider is that the conceptualization of land value is in its nature extractive. It sees only the value or the benefit um, of exchange value, the, 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 the private benefit of the land realized through its productive use and fails to recognize the social costs or the indirect uh, costs that Manuel Albers addressed. So in my own work, I sort of say, well, wait a second, if we look at use and exchange value, we're really only identifying a spatial distinction. To this, we also have to add the temporal distinction. And to the questions of, of why or what is so unique or special about the developer, I think it's absolutely this. It's the capacity to extract tremendous future potential value of land and represent it in the present. So if we add not just a use and exchange, a spatial uh, distinction, but a temporal distinction and think about value already realized versus value that is potential, we have not just two types of value, but at least four. So use, exchanged, derived, and external. And a lot of my work on carbon markets has been about theorizing externalities and exter external value. But I think that for the relationships with land, this distinction is also um, really important. So if value is considered across not only its spatial, but also temporal domains, there, there, there are these four types of value, um, but also there's a recognition that we consider most forms of value as commensurate exchange, but not all forms of value are equally capable of producing social benefit. The ghost apartments in Miami are a terrific example of this. There is a sort of speculative <laughs> advantage of storing wealth in these places. Um, but then there's also a distinct difference from the capacity to provide housing for residents in the city that need it. And then to this, I would add a third point, which is the long-term or sustainable value generation must be systematic and consider not just socioeconomic, but also socio-environmental systems in the assumption that land is a commodity. There is this idea that the land is not a living thing. Development proceeds over or on top of or through what is considered to be a static environment. 
And for a range of reasons, that is incredibly uh, problematic. I thought Manuel Albers' uh, diagram from Fontunin showing the value of, of different utility of land was really in, instructive because you saw at the end of it, the thing of least value was the old growth forest. And there's an incredible kind of arrogance or human, human perspective that something that takes 500 or more years, an ecosystem of 500 or more years of growth is worth less than the agricultural product of a season. And so in that, I think you see the, 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 there's a sort of a missed opportunity to understand and fully realize the capacity of a range of values for a civilization. So, so moving on from this, I think the, the third question that Patrice raised about you know, the, what, the problem, why is, is development so problematic? She identifies from um, Covent Garden and the development of a range of, of the 16th and 17th English developers, a, a very concrete practical model that is established, a four-step model of land development. First, obtain control of the land to calculate value based on possible uses, three, determine its highest and best economic use, and four, achieve any necessary legal um, changes of use to maximize its potential. And then goes on to say that this model with little alteration adapts into the present day and then perpetuates not, not only across the Anglo-Saxon world, but also with slight modification to other uh, geographies around the world. And I, I agree with, with uh, Derek's critique that, you know, there is some, there, there, there obviously there is other influence from other older um, models and practices of land development. But I think where this is really powerful and potent is in its capacity to generate the logic of settler colonialism. It is something we absolutely see in the North American context. It is the logic that underwrites the history of settler colonialism and land dispossession of millions of indigenous, indigenous people, not only in the West, but in other colonial states around the world. With it, there's also the challenge of, of what Patrice identifies as the Faustian bargain. The developer can never stop developing. And so absent ecosystem considerations, relentless development leads to a situation where by virtually every measure, the Earth's biosphere is in decline. I see climate change is symptomatic of that condition, not as an underlying cause. And finally, this third issue, the idea that land is a commodity, this sort of unquestioned assumption, it is a thing to be possessed. Here, I think it's interesting to consider the alternate logics. And for most indigenous cultures, land is not a thing, it is relational. It's not an object of control, but rather an integral entity that sits in relation to the community that inhabits it. And with this, there's a principle of connectivity, the idea everything in the universe is connected. The spirit world is represented in this diagram is connected to the moral world. The sea is connected to the land. The sky is connected to the ground. Connectivity expresses the ontological foundations of indigenous society, um, the connections that people have to their communities, their traditional territories, and the ecosystems on the land. And so in this idea, that's not an argument that we can, we can undo 300 years of history and go back to where we began, but it is this idea that we need to return to the principle that land exists in reciprocity. It is a living system. It provides the resources a community needs, but only if they carefully steward and renew the land. All right, and so I think, you know, it's difficult, again, to conceptualize this in the context of modern capitalism of cities that are already established. Where it becomes more promising is when confronting climate change in the reality that 80% of human population lives on the coast and that in the next century, these cities, these civilists, these settlements will have to be radically transformed. These are a few images from the recent storm, Hurricane Ida, that hit New York and, and showcased the absolute vulnerability of the infrastructure because, again, it was built with this assumption it exists over a static environment. The land on which it resides, the natural environment, is a thing that sits in opposition rather than in relation. 
I wanted to briefly in the commentary, I talked through the Boston Seaport District case because I think this is emblematic of so many of the principles that Patrice describes in her book. Um, you see here a sign, it's just for the last 20 years, been a place of incredible productivity and development. But in, in, in envisioning what the developer always envisions for the city, you have these beautiful green spaces, you see kind of the ideal of the public domain that's never actually fully realized in the city. Um, so the Boston Seaport, this is an aerial view of the city. It's a 1,000 acre low lying, actually built on backfield land, post-industrial area just east of downtown Boston. It's a site that's been built on landfill. Historically, it was used for fishing piers and then for a range of industrial activities. And by the 1990s was quite dilapidated. So as the city cleaned up the harbor, um, built infrastructure to connect this, the transit and roadways to connect this region, developers began to realize there could be potential use. So a tremendous amount, billions of dollars from the 1990s of both private and public investment has been poured into the Seaport District. Originally, this was planned as a mixed use neighborhood for families with parks and other public amenities. Um, in 2010, it was re-Christianed as the Innovation District because, again, here is the highest extractive value of the property. So the intrinsic benefits, it was meant to create construction jobs, new tax revenue. It was also meant to have a housing linkage, job training linkage, on-site affordable housing, and to connect to the regions on, on surrounding it. And then there were a range of negotiated public benefits in, in the uh, plan, including a tremendous amount of public open space of cult, civic and cultural buildings, public access and recreation of a diverse neighborhood, and then water activation and transportation. And over time, you see how this beautiful vision of what the seaport could be evolves into something that's quickly ad adapted and um, acquired by elite tech and life sciences, uh, businesses, luxury offices, apartments, and restaurants. It now has the highest medium household income in all of Boston. It's predominantly white, like 89% white, exacerbating longstanding issues in the city of segregation. So here you see one of the two-bedroom luxury flats that's, that's recently sold for nearly $2 million. Um, and then I think the other really important consideration is what does this mean for the future? The seaport is being built on land that under climate projections will be underwater by end of century. And developers have been aware of this. They are building despite the fact because they assume two things. One, they will acquire the return on their investment long before this problem becomes a reality. So it's not really their problem. And in any case, it is a challenge that will be addressed in some way by government intervention. So there's a range of different ideas or plans about what all of what sea level rise means for the harbor. Um, here's here's a, a vision of this massive harbor wall system, including an outer wall, an island, island harbor island uh, wall, and then an inner city wall that could be built. And a recent study by the um, Kirshen Lab in UMass Boston has demonstrated that across all parameters, environmental, economic, cultural, this, this piece of infrastructure is unviable. So in effect, there isn't really a plan um, to confront sea level rise and to deal with this challenge. So in some, I, you know, looking at what Darrington wrote, Patrice Darrington, what wrote and, and thinking about the takeaways, for me, I think there's a remarkable history and a remarkable set of principles to study and understand. But in thinking about the origins of development, there's also this realization that the development of past centuries will not adequately confront the challenges of the next century. So we need more considered plans, not just for the city of Boston, but for other cities that will face the same challenges for thinking about the relationship between the built environment and its natural ecosystems, um, for ways of dress, addressing systemic inequities and vulnerabilities, and then limiting development in high-risk areas uh, so that we accept planned sea level rise rather than trying to build infrastructure that is unlikely to be viable in the long term. All right, so I'll leave it at that and, and open it up to questions. Thank you so much. It was really a pl pleasure, pleasure to read this work. Hi, Janelle, thank you very much for your comments. Um, 
insightful as usual. And um, I, I might uh, encourage those who get a chance to read uh, Janelle's commentary about the case study about Boston was very, I thought, very revealing. We've got, um, dare I say, uh, 10 minutes uh, till um, we have a break, as I, uh, as I understand it. Am I right, team? Yes. Perfect. Patrice Not is on. nodding her head. Yes. Excellent. Um, I wondered if um, other speakers might have comments or thoughts in reaction to Janelle before I pass it over to Patrice. Silence is gone. <laughs> Patrice, over to you. Right, well, I'll kick off then. Um, I'm sure hopefully even some uh, folks, if you have questions, just please post them on the Q&A. Uh, we would love to, you know, not have you take advantage of this opportunity to ask something directly of, um, of Janelle's wonderful work. Um, but uh, very, I very much appreciate your uh, uh, your ability to uh, utilize uh, the what I've revealed in terms of motivations of of land use and exchange and and so on. Uh, it, it, what we have done, as you say, is, is arrogantly take that as being a right to any land that we land on or that we arrive on. Um, this is going back to the indigenous uh, aspect. And in fact, you, you know, I was raised by a mother who was a historian of Aboriginal art. And she always said to us, you know, they do not own their land. They do not believe that anyone should own their land. They themselves, the Aboriginal people who are indigenous, you know, indigenous to Australia and in fact um, uh, you, often nomadic, uh, they just see themselves as responsible for the stewardship mm -hmm. in return for the livelihood that it provides. No one, no one ever would dare to have a right to own it. So very interesting, um, and you know, of course, we've all you know ignored that uh, at you know at, at great tragedy. Uh, but thank you for for bringing that up. I know she will be very touched to hear your affirmation of that. Richard, Florida. Yeah, thank you, Janelle. That was just unbelievable, and again for me, just incredibly instructive, and I learned a ton. I have a really basic, almost dumb question for you. Which, which I think you would be able to answer better than just about anyone else I've heard speak. Um, a couple of times we've touched upon the growth of real estate interest, both from the development community, but also from the investor community in, in things we would lump as ESG, impact investment, or sustainable development goals. And, and my, I myself have been asked by real estate developers to comment on that, help them formulate plans. I see that Mark Carney, uh, the former governor of the Bank of England is now a vice president at Brookfield, by the way, a Toronto-based company that operates in all these major markets. Um, he's joined them as a vice president, I think, or, or vice chairman in charge of impact or sustainability. I wonder what you make of all of this. Is, is this for real? Is, is this partly for real and partly, you know, people trying to bolster their image, so-called greenwashing? If it's not for real, can it be a trend for the good? In other words, is it something that governments or other regulatory bodies, whether national or, or local or global, can enforce or investors? Is, is, is there something, is there a there there or not much at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a fantastic question, Richard. And I think maybe it's all of those things. Is it, you know, what, what is the motivation? I, I do think I, for, for work that I did several years ago, documenting um, systems of mitigation around the world and how markets, uh, emissions markets are established. I interviewed financiers and developers and regulators and you know, often middle-aged white male <laughs> professional um, service operators in different capacities, and it was fascinating because it was almost as though they had had this sort of you know the, the religious or spiritual journey that had brought them into the ESG sector, into this idea of, of green finance, where they'd had a very productive career in traditional finance, and then realized they'd had children or grandchildren and wanted 
you know, realized they wanted to leave something else for the future. And so I think that that motivation or this realization that there is a tremendous problem and a need to generate both social and environmental um, wealth or benefit is real. In terms of the mechanisms, again, like this is where, and I, I apologize, I probably didn't, I just felt rushed for time, so fully explain this. But I think one of the challenges is this assumption that everything is commensurate in exchange, and particularly the idea of what I call derivative value, derived value, this idea that you can extract um, potential value, options, swaps, derivatives, so much of finance, and make it present, make it realized in present terms. And so what I'm finding with carbon markets and with other forms of externalities um, or external finance, it's this idea that, again, the path towards achieving green objectives is to creating a price system, creating exchange value for those environmental parameters. And I think that 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 thoroughly misunderstands the nature of use and exchange value and as a, of external value is something sustained through use, not through exchange. So it's less about, I think, a sort of malicious intent or malicious, malicious motivation and just a failure of, of, of modern economist or, or even historical, you know, orthodox um, or classical economists to properly theorize the nature of value and to really consider the dynamics of spatial and temporal connotation. Can I just catch up on that a little bit? Um, I've been very interested in this question about why ESG has got out ahead of public regulators. In the US, through the previous administration, for example, they wanted to outlaw ESG. They wanted to stop pension funds using ESG. And there was a somewhat of a constituency in the finance industry in Wall Street to do that, but it wasn't very loud. And in fact, actually, when you look at who's peddling ESG, it's often finance companies looking for an edge in a market, which they think is evolving and growing. And we know everyone wants to be in a growth market. A declining market's not great. Likewise, carbon and likewise um, power stations, uh, systems of uh, energy generation that rely on fossil fuel. You know, I would have thought COP26 was the death knell for fossil fuel energy generation. And it's not that anything was decided, but it was the direction of travel. And the direction of travel now is, of course, we'd better get out before we get caught, if you like, with our hands in the till, if you like, on carbon. So there's a sort of a momentum that is, I think, has taken the politicians by surprise. I, I'm shocked, actually, in the UK that uh, Boris Johnson is interested in the environment. You know, there's no evidence that he is, but, but it's that sort of sense that the politicians are on the back foot, finance industry is on the front foot, but they are doing it because they don't want to be caught short, that is holding, at the same time, they want a market edge looking forward. Are they genuinely ESG, you know, heart on heart? Only when they put their head on the pillow and think I made a lot of money today. That's a bit cynical. <laughs> yeah, That's no, I too cynical though. That's I, I think it absolutely is business interest. And I this is where the short termism is so critical because if if 20 years ago you could have known Google is the great you know company or Tesla is the you know it, you could have this foresight to know what's the next innovation you would in, you would absolutely invest there if you could see that in the future. We know renewable and we know there's going to be an energy transformation. You know, we absolutely, if we think into the 21st century, we're not going to be producing on coal and petroleum. And yet there is this, this latent inability to capture that advantage because there's the incapacity to think long term and to realize those gains across the long term, that the short term, the present always overrides those considerations. And so I think, you know, the business community is starting to move on mitigation. They are realizing the advantages of, of energy transformation for mitigation. But, but they also don't want to be caught holding an asset that's going to 
bleed on them. So there's that sort of sense of, gee, you know, if I don't move now, when am I going to move? And do I want to be late or do I want to be early? Where's the payoff, if you like? Right. And, and to extract as much value out of the conventional energy economy as they Just can't before it's over. Yeah. What I think what everybody is missing is the rate of adaptation, even at the COP, this, this sort of, you know, there's an undertone or an undercurrent among developing countries, among the youth, um, or non-conventional, non-state actors. But I like I doing work with tribes in Louisiana, even over the last three years, I and I've studied, as you know, Gordon, for 20 years from an academic standpoint, climate change absolutely astounded visiting Louisiana and seeing what is happening to these communities on the ground. We are in, in, in the present losing that coastline. It's absolutely devastated by each subsequent year of storms. Ida destroyed thousands of communities and we're not seeing that because it wasn't you know one big flashy city. It is a reality that we're going to be confronting around the world. Everyone is confronting. And I think, you know, Manuel um, uh, alluded to this in his talk, it, private, that the value of real estate doesn't exist in a bubble. It is subject not only on its neighbors and its external conditions, but it's on it's based on its socio-political, cultural stability climate change is going to undermine that for everyone. And so while we have this opportunity to be thinking about adaptation and development, we absolutely need to be doing that now before we have mass migration of millions of people, cities around the world destroyed. And I know that sounds alarmist, but I think it's just being realistic about what is coming. Okay. Now, thank you very much. <laughs> it's been fantastic. <laughs> Let, let, um, let me hold on. Sorry, good. We do have uh, we do have one question. Do we think we could okay. just have uh, Harpreet Gill asks Janelle? Tax revenues were labeled as it, uh, you labeled them as it, intrinsic. Um, it, it, did you know how did the question is? Uh, they're curious. Harpreet is curious about how that choice was made. Obviously, between uh, uh, you know intrinsic or extrinsic. Yeah, and I'm I'm apologies. I don't I'm not sure if it, internal or external maybe was the question. Is not seeing tax revenues as external. Um, so apologies. I'm not sure I fully ca I'm catching the reference. So for maybe for the sake of time, I'll give that question some consideration and and can add something to the chat. So thank you very much. Okay, Patrice. Um, uh, it is 3.30 in the afternoon, my time. It is, <laughs> and it's 10.30 uh, in the morning, yeah. your time. Yes. We have a break now until 11 a.m. your time, mm -hmm. 4 o'clock my time. I keep yes. saying these things just to remind me. Um, so shall we get together again five minutes before start? That, that would be excellent. If folks don't mind, uh, we would... Uh, we will then uh, have our fabulous Sam Chandran, uh, who is uh, the uh, Dean of the School of, <clears throat> sorry, the New York University, Shack Institute of Real Estate, um, and also a, a very renowned speaker globally about the pandemic and, and its aspects or its impact on real estate and so on. So we shall look forward to seeing Sam then and seeing you all back. Thank you. And I would like to introduce uh, my very well-known colleague, uh, the uh, Larry and Clara Silverstein, Professor of Real Estate and the Academic Dean at the New York University uh, Shack Real Est Institute of Real Estate. Um, Sam, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Very flattered uh, by the invitation to join you. And it was such a thrill for me uh, to read uh, the book. Uh, the thing I'd start by saying um, is that I, because I imagine this is something on the minds of a lot of people here um, who, who are both presenting and, and tuning in. You know, for me, Patrice, it's been a very long time um, since I've encountered a book, uh, particularly one as substantial as this, uh, that I would even consider um, you know, assigning to my students to read. 
Uh, but this is one of those uh, lucky times where, you know, every page I turned, uh, I couldn't help but think to myself how well that particular chapter or that particular passage or, or graphic would fit into something I'm doing next semester. Um, and I, I very self-servingly uh, am hopeful that either you or a group of us perhaps uh, will develop some teaching materials that can go along with the book uh, to facilitate our being able to leverage it uh, with our students. I think Larry uh, said at the outset uh, this morning that it sort of has that rare combination of being so uh, eminently readable, uh, but also so scholarly uh, and really filling uh, an incredible gap that has persisted for so long um, in uh, our historical uh, understanding. Um, and it really is one of those things where absent you know, this book, certainly I, I learned so much. Um, and, and by the way, I've been taking notes all morning. The, um, but um, you know, sort of, you know, a, a lot of this, I think absent the book would, would be sort of you know, lost to you know, the next generation of, of real estate and, and urban students. So I'm very grateful for, uh, again, I think what folks have described as a labor of love in, in, in creating this. Um, and it, it wasn't lost on me that you've got sort of Mark Holliday's new tower uh, when Vandy uh, right there on the cover. Oh. <laughs> so, the, the other thing uh, that I'd like to comment on briefly, because uh, you know, the, the, the conversations that uh, we've already had this morning have been um, so interesting to tune into. I think just before the break, uh, you know, Gordon and Janelle and Richard uh, were, were chatting a little bit about ESG. Um, and for folks who uh, maybe are in other parts of the world and not as familiar with you know, the real estate, real estate landscape and, and sort of uh, you know, collection of players here in New York, uh, between Patrice's program and mine, uh, we prob you know, our board members and benefactors probably own almost all of the class A properties in town. So uh, we have a we have sort of this handle on the um, sort of on, on the thought process and the thinking of a lot of people uh, that sort of you know, fall into sort of the institutional segment of the market. Um, certainly there are uh, there, there's an incredible need for and a lot of attention to um, you know, segments of the market that are uh, not as institutional outside of the REIT space, outside of securitization of debt. Um, the uh, sort of in areas related to workforce and affordable housing, which sort of only more recently, I think, has sort of you know, taken on a more institutional flavor. Um, but uh, by virtue of many of these conversations, you know, I think one of the things that really comes to mind for me um, is that sort of reflection on sort of what folks were describing just before the break, you know, uh, your real estate being a, a little bit ahead, certainly in the United States, of, of sort of where we see policy. Um, and I would, you know, looking at the examples of other countries, um, I would speculate that, uh, and I'm not a political scientist by any stretch, uh, but, I, but I would speculate part of that has to do with uh, the, uh, sort of, you know, the, the, the current state of the, sort of the political dialogue uh, in the United States um, and uh, are, are being in a place now where uh, whether you agree with the policy priorities or not, um, issues related to climate change, the environment, uh, sort of you know, equity uh, in cities you know, are, are clearly higher priorities than they might have been you know, two, two or three years ago. And again, I'm not um, sort of, you know, uh, not casting aspersions on folks who might sort of think that you know, the current environment is worse or better than, than, than where we were. Uh, but certainly we've been in a place where building a national consensus around issues related to ESG um, has been very, very difficult. And there's been a sort of a geographic element to it, uh, where in some parts of the country, um, you know, there has been a uh, sort of a different sensibility around this. Now, uh, Richard describing Toronto was very, very cold. I would remind him that he is quite close to the U.S. border and that there's an entire country north of him that's even colder. Uh, but being a Canadian myself, um, I, I will uh, I will pitch in for a warmer jacket for him because uh, Toronto is quite livable. But the um, I, I think when we're looking at the issues that Janelle and Gordon were describing, I, I do agree that you know while on an individual basis. Um, it may be the case that uh, there are folks within the real estate industry that Patrice and I and others know uh, that may have you know, very strong feelings about the importance of prioritizing issues related to ESG. 
Um, when we look at sort of the way that business decisions and investment decisions are being made, um, and, I, and I think Janelle described it as sort of, you know, a business imperative and a business decision for, for how people are pursuing things. Um, it, it, it reminds me of, you know, lead certification, you know, perhaps 10 years ago, where it wasn't necessarily the case that the investors, whether they be domestic or non-U.S., uh, bringing capital to the United States, uh, were, uh, you know, prioritizing um, sort of, you know, the, the, the importance of green building at that point in time, uh, but certainly we're thinking given their longer investment time horizons around the liquidity of those assets um, and the, you know, whether or not um, there would be a richer, uh, deeper, more liquid market for assets that were lead certified simply because of the signaling mechanism, you know, completely independent of the, um, uh, you know the you know, the the energy efficiencies that, that it might represent. Um, so I think there is an element of this that is sort of you know, market responsive. You know, what do folks uh, you know, who are developing think that or feel that sort of tenants want? What do their investors want? Um, certainly, folks uh, you know for whom uh, you know, some of their capital is coming from pension funds uh, or from outside the United States are having to be mindful of those issues as well. Uh, you know, government contracts. Uh, or, or government tenancy is going to play a role over here. But I think a lot of it is uh, market responsiveness um, factoring in the longer time horizon. And there are people having to think ahead. If I own this asset for 10, 15, 20 years, uh, you know, what is my exit? Uh, you know, what is the attractiveness of the asset on an operating basis to, to, to tenants? Maybe not today, but, but, but down the road. Um, you know, th that being said, um, you know, I think we also see that... Um, you know, there are a, a range of interpretations around sort of, you know, what constitutes ESG uh, and just how far, you know, folks are, are willing to go. And so, um, you know, that continues to present an issue for us. One of the things that, you know, in, you know places like Hudson Yards, one Vanderbilt, Scott Reckler's uh, new building at, at Grand Central, you know, come to mind, uh, World Trade Center properties downtown, certainly, uh, we do see, you um, you know, sort of an, uh, some unevenness in the burden of, um, you know, of meeting those goals where relatively newer properties are going to be in a privileged position in meeting sort of, you know, ESG goals, um, just, you know, by, by design, um, you know, and, and uh, whether it be sort of, you know, uh, energy efficiency, you know, uh, spaces that are conducive to the health and well-being of uh, people that are, you know, working, uh, you know, in those spaces, uh, the uh, ability to provide green spaces and terraces, you know, in a lot of these buildings, if you haven't visited one Vanderbilt, please, you know, folks, when you're in New York, you don't want to miss the opportunity. It's an extraordinary uh, asset. But, you know, it does raise the question of you know, the most visible participants in the market, you know, are uh, going to be in a very different situation, face a very different set of constraints and meeting those goals as compared to, you know, the investor that, um, you know, is uh, owns or is, you know, left holding you know, the, the B or C asset, the office building that was built sort of in the, in the pre-war uh, environment. And I, I think, you know, uh, we're, we're far enough along now that I have to clarify for my students when I say pre-war, I mean the Second uh, World War. The, um, the um, uh, so all of this becomes, you know, really important for us. I'm really interested in hearing uh, what, what uh, sort of what other folks today have to say about it. I am going to share a, a brief deck. I didn't want to overlap with, you know, some of the commentary from uh, earlier uh, this morning. And so I'm focusing uh, my comments on a slightly different aspect of uh, the discussion in the book. And it dovetails with, you know, uh, an area of great interest for me um, in the realm of public health. Um, and you know, this was really instructive for me as I was reading through uh, the, the text. And I've included a couple of, uh, I sort of you know, pulled out a couple of examples here uh, from uh, you know, Patrice's uh, writing. It, it was well known that the use of coal for domestic purposes brought smog conditions for many months of the year and encouraged London's wealthier inhabitants to move westwards. Um, there are a range of, or a number of different sort of references to that interaction between health and well-being, um, and perhaps you know, sort of, you know, in the early 17th century, not cast in the frame of or through the lens of uh, overall public health as much as sort of you know, individual households optimi optimization of their behaviors, um, but the interaction between the built environment 
and outcomes for both individuals and for um, um, you know, and for communities sort of has been a feature of uh, the real estate markets going right back in some cases, sort of I pulled some quotes uh, from, the, from the preface of the text uh, you know, that go back to, to, to Roman times. Um, and I think that we are at a point in the market today, and in part it has been motivated by uh, the more robust conversation around ESG. Part of it relates to sort of you know, our uh, response to the pandemic and our thinking about how we might need to do things differently. The clear observation of disparities in outcomes you know, for households, in some cases that are at a minimum correlated with where they live and their living conditions, how they work, um, the but also differences emerging, you know, across sort of systemically important cities around the world, depending upon you know how they're built, um, sort of you know how people access the transportation network. Um, it sort of, I think it is underappreciated that uh, there is a deep connection between public health um, and uh, the built environment. Um, and again, it was very instructive for me to read the text and to see references to this interaction you know, going back more than 2000 years uh, and then to review in the later parts of the text you know, to the 16th uh, and 17th century. The, uh, another uh, two quick examples, um, health governance of the area was outside the jurisdiction of the city and relied totally on uh, overburdened parish officers. Again, sort of a key thing for us here, when we are thinking in a post-pandemic environment around how it is that um, private real estate investment and development decision-making um, is uh, shaped by uh, or interacts with uh, issues around the externalities associated with private development or the need for you know, uh, collaboration and partnership uh, with, with public entities. And I think sort of, you know, Hudson Yards is an example of this. Uh, someone mentioned sort of the infrastructure around Hudson Yards. I think we can all agree without the seven line extension. Um, and again, for those who are not as familiar with New York, um, a, a real lack of subway access historically, you know, on the far west side in the, uh, in the neighborhood of, um, of Hudson Yards. And so a critical element of this being sort of the public Public expansion of uh, the subway system, so that you know, if you come into Grand Central, you could immediately hop on the seven train, and now the seven train will take you right to the heart of Hudson Yards. Um, arguably, Hudson Yards uh, would not be viable in the absence of that investment having been made, um, and certainly sort of speaks to the locational advantage of, of building like one Vanderbilt, uh, where you don't need to hop on the seven train; you can just exit from Grand Central, and and you're right there. Um, but this issue, uh, you know, around sort of, you know, where does the jurisdiction and responsibility lie for thinking about how uh, the interaction of the built environment and public health are ultimately driving outcomes for households in an environment that is more attuned to uh, ESG and, and the and the importance of equity and outcomes, you know, in the urban in an urban setting where we see a disproportionate number of income constrained families becomes, I think, critically important for us because this question. You know, 400 years later, you know, has not been entirely resolved. Um, you know, and you know, sort of we're at a place now where I think the absence of coordination, you know, between public health authorities and private real estate development uh, firms um, is still sort of you know, a stark reality for us. Finally, then they wish to avoid the unhealthy, crowded, uh, and dirty conditions of the city and to locate in the salubrious uh, emerging suburbs of uh, to the west. I think what finally what this captures for me also is that while we often will think of that interaction between public health uh, and development as being um, sort of you know, conditions in the environment, in the natural environment uh, or in the urban environment, impacting people's location preferences uh, and decisions about where to live, uh, that uh, there's significant endogeneity here. And what we know is that it's not only that, okay, you know, there's, and you know, that example of coal, you know, and air quality in 1603 is so prescient because you can go to the BBC's website today and read about exactly that same set of conditions in New Delhi, India. Um, the, um, but, but I think what we see here is that while, pe while individuals may, and households may make decisions about where to locate based on you know, the quality of the environment around them, what we also see is that the nature of the investments we make in the environment um, is driving 
uh, sort of you know, the, the, the public health uh, outcomes as well. Now, why does this become important for us? And I wanted to give this one example. It's a little bit further along in 1854, but the origins of our thinking about sort of that formal discipline within public health of epidemiology, you know, were also uh, you know just around the corner uh, from uh, you know from sort of a lot of what uh, uh, you know sort of a, a lot of the, uh, you know, the the projects and history that uh, Patrice is describing. And so the, the 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 gentleman who was considered sort of the you know, the, the father of, or the originator of field epidemiology, John Snow, you know, in 1854 was conducting field research during sort of a cholera epidemic in London. Um, and in the Golden Square neighborhood was actually looking quite specifically, you know, at this one neighborhood, he mapped out um, sort of, you know, each one of these dots, if you're able to see them clearly enough, represents sort of a household uh, with incidents of cholera um, and was able to see that there was a clear density pattern here and the density of cholera increased in proximity to water pump A on Broad Street in London. Um, and I think, again, what this highlights for us is that, you know, there are going to be associations. Um, I think, you know, one of the big things that I know Richard and, and others have, have written about and discussed over the course of the pandemic is that we should not make the mistake of associating density with severity of epidemics or infectious disease. Uh, there are other uh, intermediate causal drivers. So density for all of the things that we know are wonderful about you know, scale and agglomeration, uh, density ultimately also leads to you know, some other feature of the built environment that is a facilitator of you know, uh, disease or, or negative outcomes. But what that means for us, and this is for me sort of a conceptually absolutely critical point, density at this point in our history um, is uh, you know, perceived very, very negatively. I think sort of that's one of the outcomes of, of the pandemic. But in helping people to think about how the connection between density and health outcomes is intermediated by other factors or features of the built environment, like are we keeping that pump filtered or clean? Uh, are we ensuring that there isn't sort of you know, garbage being collected nearby? You know, these things become very, very important for us in thinking about how we can mitigate you know, some of the risks associated with density and ultimately arrive in a place where, you know, some of that, um, you know, negative stereotyping around dense urban areas uh, is better uh, understood. Now, this does become, I think, important for us, and it's a real takeaway for me from uh, Patrice's work, uh, because we're in, uh, we're at a period in time where, you know, after, a, you know, 100 years of seeing improvements in outcomes, uh, for how it is that people fare from a health perspective in the urban environment, we now find ourselves in a situation where probably over the last, I'd say, 20 years, you know, we've seen uh, something of, of a reversal there. Part of that reversal is related to what we refer to as zoonoses. Um, and so about 60% of all emergent infectious diseases uh, that we will be able to catalog our animal in origin. And what we're going to see here, and again, sort of it's that endogeneity in public health outcomes impacting the built environment, but the built environment impacting public health outcomes. What we're going to see here is that much of the reason why we have seen an increase in uh, the rate or frequency of emergent respiratory diseases, uh, SARS, MERS, COVID, um, is going to be related to issues uh, of, of urban development uh, and, and development uh, overall. And I, I'm, I think, Gordon, I just have a couple of minutes left here, if that's right. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you could see me creeping up on you. That's yeah, true. yeah, yeah. The, uh, so in short, I'll, I'll simply say that sort of there's, a, there's a considerable body of research work that's been done to identify you know, how it is that changes in the way that we are developing the intensity of development activity when it is not tempered by sort of an appreciation for um, you know, that intermediation between density um, and, and disease outcomes um, is allowing for those disease outcomes uh, to increase in frequency. Um, and so identifying sort of what that intermediation is so that we can mitigate it uh, becomes critically important. And it was, it was just so instructive for me to see in Patrice's book that uh, you know, there were references to this you know, going back you know, you know, very, very far. Uh, for those of us uh, briefly who may be thinking of 
uh, sort of, you know, the, the critical conditions or sort of, you know, the, the necessary conditions for the emergence of a new zoonotic disease, you know, being something that sort of, it happens very far away. Um, you can see here on this map, certainly sort of, you know, the a critical, sort of, the necessary conditions, uh, unsurprisingly, South Asia, uh, Asia Pacific. But what you can also see here is that those necessary conditions, you know, uh, exist in a very concentrated area in the Northeast of the United States, you know, along through the, the Northeast uh, Corridor and in parts uh, of Europe as well. So it's something that we need to be mindful of. The last piece of this is that while coming out of the pandemic, we are acutely focused on the need for pandemic response and to be better prepared uh, for you know, the next time something like this happens. What we, the, as far as the relationship to the built environment goes, what we also know is that the United States and many other advanced economies over the last hundred years have experienced what we refer to as an epidemiological transition. Um, and by that, I mean that we've moved from a scenario uh, where you know, most people, when they die, you know, die of some kind of infectious disease. If you look at this uh, chart, and I don't know how clearly you're able to see it, you know, the big killers are going to be diphtheria, gastrointestinal infections, tuberculosis, pneumonia. Um, we didn't live long enough or have a good enough control over many of these diseases prior to the introduction of antibiotics to actually uh, die of the things that kill us now. And so while mortality rates have declined overall, what we also see is that you know, infectious diseases, while the idea of Ebola or COVID um, you know, sort of might frighten us, and there's a set, clear sense that sort of, you know, there's an increasing frequency, um, ultimately the things that are killing us uh, are, are cancer and heart disease and diabetes. And this becomes, again, another critically important part of our thinking about you know, the built environment. Um, what this chart shows, and uh, Gordon promises my closing one, um, is that uh, the, uh, you know, th this is a map of uh, you know, percentage of the population in the United States that lives within half a mile of a local state or, or national park. What we do know from the research is that proximity, when we're thinking about the built environment, proximity to well-developed usable public spaces as was reinforced by the pandemic, is actually quite critical to the public health outcomes that we observe. And so our thinking very holistically about this relationship as part of the built environment, uh, the need for public spaces, access to transportation, good quality public schools, how it is that we might think about directing some of uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the largesse of, of, of the Build Back Better Act, you know, uh, becomes sort of a, a critically important piece of, of this conversation um, and uh, you might, you know, one of my key and many takeaways from, uh, from Built Up um, is that this has been an issue that has remained underappreciated um, in our thinking about the built environment, you know, going back uh, to uh, the Roman times. Uh, so Patrice, I think we all owe you a great debt of gratitude for your work. Uh, and again, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Great, thank you very much, Sam. Um, I'm conscious that uh, my, fellow uh, participants might want to have a question, or Patrice, you might want to have a, a brief response. We've got... Well, no, I thank you, Sam. I, you know, the critical uh, analysis is perfect, and Covent Garden, of course, renowned for its public open space, provided by a private owner and continues to be. So, but uh, Richard, Florida. Sam, nicely done, and great to see you. Um, I guess my question to you is, given, given your role, um, it, 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 one about public health and, and the contemporary scene, why do you think that we have what I would call an ironic, if not counterintuitive, if not insane thing happening in the United States principally? I don't think it's happening in France. I don't think it's happening in England. I don't think it's happening in Canada where the places that have done the best at protecting themselves from this virus, New York, San Francisco, that have had the most stringent public health measures are the places that either rightly or wrongly are speculated to be seeing the greatest out migration. And, and one hypothesis I have is that Americans are uniquely crazy. Uh, sorry, you know, uh, who was it? What's his name? Marty Lips had always said, the best thing you can do by moving to Canada as an American is come to understand your country. Uh, you could say that Americans are uniquely insane, or you can say that Americans put an incredible value on liberty. And I'm not just talking about Trump, Trumpers or populists. 
that Americans put an incredible value. I, I'm, I'm not saying this is right, put an incredible value on liberty and don't want anyone telling them anything else. But I just find it very interesting that the places that have done probably the most to protect their people with regard to public health have seen arguably large out migrations. And, and those out migrations have gone to the places that have done the worst, whether that be Florida, Miami, you know, Port, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, Texas, Houston, Dallas. I just wondered if you had a, re a reaction to that or uh, rightly or wrongly. Absolutely. It's not just the pandemic when sort of you, we talk about sort of, you know, people migrating to some of the places that have performed quite poorly. I think to Janelle's point earlier, uh, folks are also migrating to some of the places that are at the greatest risk from climate change. Um, and so while sort of, you know, we uh, profess to care deeply about ESG, um, you know, we, we, you know, for both firms and, and individual households, we don't always see that concern and that commitment uh, reflected in uh, people's location preferences and decisions. Um, I would suggest that there's two things. One, uh, a broad misperception about the role and contribution of density, um, you know, where uh, we don't see the intermediate factors um, the, in the United States. And part of that reflects um, you know, people's reading of um, uh, pe people's reading of, um, of uh, you know, New York having been hit hardest first and just simply assuming that that must be a function of density. Uh, the other to, to, to round it out um, uh, is that um, I think what the pandemic has done and this is unrelated to the disease issues and the public health issues is, is shown for many people that they have the ability to exercise some kind of geographic autonomy in work. Um, and so the issue that is vexing New York and Boston and some others is not really density in the pandemic in some of these cases. It's that we are fiscally inefficient. And in terms of what the, you know, so the contributors to the cost of being located in these high agglomeration locations, whether it be local fiscal policy, the taxes that are being levied, uh, issues around the quality of life and quality of infrastructure, I'm done. It's a tough place to live. Thanks, Gordon. Hi, my word. Um, thanks very much. It, really a tour de force, Sam. A tour de force. It was really impressive. Now, Jerry's got his hand up, but I'm afraid Jerry... Oh, no, 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 no. Please, please let him. Jerry, please jump in. <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick Pizer's here. Hi, Rick. Do you mind a minute or so? Well, just One a... minute. Thanks. <laughs> I can do it in one minute. Yeah, Come on, Jerry, go. go for it. Off you go, okay, Jerry. Two quick comments. One on, uh, on Richard's comment about uh, people moving out of San Francisco and New York. Uh, for San Francisco, for example, they didn't move out of the Bay Area. They just moved to cheaper apartments further out because they could. Uh, they were working from home. So I'm not sure that it was they wanted freedom rather than lower rents for the year that they were out. And, and second comment on the map, uh, which I thought was really significant about open spaces relative... Uh, um, I think one needs to dig down a little deeper. So, for example, in Los Angeles, you have pro uh, high proximity to, low, to open spaces, lots of open spaces in the mountains that run through the city, but you don't have transportation from the lower income neighborhoods to those open spaces. So they could be 100 miles away as opposed to the 10 miles that they are. I did that Thanks, in one minute, right, Gordon? I look, you know, beautiful. Um, you've, um, yeah, we we like Sam, both comments, don't yes, we, Sam? Sam, Sam quick. Yep. Quick. Uh, totally agree. I think what we see is that in a lot of cases, the migration is just a little bit further out. If you live in New York, uh, you know, in maximizing your utility function, you need to be close to work because you know, sort of, it's it's costly in terms of time and and patience and sanity to be able to have to commute you know, uh, a lot in, in New York City. The, uh, but I think what we see is that with people expecting that, you know, I'm gonna go into the office three days a week, two and a half, um, the geographic radius over which they can optimize their location preference is just wider. And so they're maybe outside the core. Okay, to someone who follows Z um, Zillow and house prices outside of New York City through, not, through to the Connecticut uh, border, what we saw was house prices in big blocks, mm, beautiful houses go up through the pandemic. What we're seeing is them going down on the other side of the pandemic. Interesting moment. People are coming back to the city, Sam. Watch out for them. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Just super good. And let me pass over to Richard Pisa. Pisa here. Hi. Sorry, Pizer. Pizer, Richard. Pizer, Pizer. sorry. Welcome, Richard. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm being English, uh, asking the obvious question, but anyway. So, um, Richard, over to you. 
Oh, it's a pleasure to take part in this, and I'm very grateful to Patrice for not only writing a very uh, provocative and uh, thoughtful book, but uh, te teeing up a very interesting conversation. And uh, I know I've learned a lot, and I hope others have as well. I, the uh, current conversation actually tees up what I wanted to focus on, uh, which has to do with, is the pandemic uh, causing a return to urban sprawl? Uh, before I jump into this, let me just say that a few years ago, uh, we did a small research design project on Covent Garden by, for the owner, which is a big insurance company. And at the time, uh, Covent Garden was actually starting to fall on hard times. Uh, the, the retail was really not in great shape, and, uh, and uh, they were bemoaning the fact that all the retail around Covent Garden was sort of low-end tourist stuff. And, uh, and so... Uh, uh, we were looking at uh, design interventions to take advantage of the wonderful uh, public space around Covent Garden uh, with uh, uh, temporary uh, facilities uh, to really enhance programming, which I think just speaks to uh, uh, how, uh, as Patrice very uh, so nicely notes, uh, uh, how these uh, uh, critical central, center city areas uh, uh, change over time and uh, how they go up and down, but uh, places like Covent Garden will always be uh, uh, very special. And I think the perspective of uh, the forces that cause them to go up or down, as Patrice uh, emphasizes in her book, or uh, I get to the heart of why uh, all of us urbanologists uh, love the study of cities. So with that brief preamble, let me just jump into uh, a brief presentation uh, on uh, some research that I'm doing uh, uh, right now. So uh, can people see my screen? All good. Thanks, Richard. All good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so it, it happens uh, that urban sprawl has been a topic I've been writing about for uh, a lot of my career, and I was uh, pleased <laughs> to see uh, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, change uh, from in-migration to out-migration from major cities that I think this raises the question again, uh, are we seeing a, uh, a fundamental shift uh, in, uh, in patterns of migration? And of course, that has huge implications for the future of cities. So uh, as you've noted, there are many uh, stories uh, about people moving to the exurbs and to uh, rural areas uh, this is brought about by people working from home, uh, the need to commute into the office, either not at all or looking forward uh, one or two times a week. And the question is, is this really a fundamental shift in migration patterns? Or is it a natural change as millennials marry, have children, move to the suburbs uh, for schools and to raise their children? So uh, looking back on writings about urban sprawl, I, I it's a very misused term in my view. It's been a catch-all term for everything that's bad about urban growth, uh, including congestion, blight, uh, monotonous urban development, ecological destruction, and so forth. Uh, there have been many strategies uh, to try to control urban sprawl. Uh, one that I was personally involved in uh, years ago was when Florida passed concurrency legislation that required developers to only develop in those areas that had uh, traffic intersections that were rated A, B, or C, uh, whereas uh, D, E, and F were the uh, uh, too much congestion. And uh, Florida was uh, uh, very surprised to find that instead of pushing development back into the city, it tended to force development even further out uh, because the worst congestion was uh, in the suburbs where uh, uh, and the city where uh, development was occurring. And the way developers uh, could get around uh, this concurrency legislation and fight intersections that were congested was go out to the rural areas. So it actually had a very counterintuitive impact. And uh, often I think that's what happens with urban policies designed to control uh, urban growth. So uh, when you read about uh, uh, sprawling cities today, uh, Ewing and Hamidi uh, point out that Charlotte is competing to be the next Atlanta. And uh, being from Dallas, uh, Dallas has always vied with Atlanta to see who can have the most uh, urban sprawl. 
Now, we've seen an urban renaissance from uh, 1990 to 2015. Uh, no one's written about this more than Richard Florida with his fantastic work on the creative class and uh, who is it that has helped cities turn around. And I think there's a consensus uh, that signs of inner city revitalization uh, were appearing in the early 80s and began to grow in the 1990s. And uh, by the early 2000s, especially with the growing growth of technology and life science firms wanting to move back to the cities, repurposing post-industrial real estate, and the focus on EDS and MEDS, uh, we've really seen a rebirth of urban cores. And uh, one explanation for the population influx uh, is that these are the most desirable places for young college educated migrants uh, who uh, desire uh, services like restaurants, bars, hair salons, uh, and uh, similar places. So uh, in a recent study by Brombeck, uh, uh, looking at where growth was occurring in four cities, uh, uh, if you look at where growth was occurring in Atlanta, uh, in the upper left, you can see uh, 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 in the period from 2000 to 2010, Atlanta grew even far faster, uh, farther out from the city core, uh, whereas Boston uh, was uh, uh, actually uh, uh, grew, uh, uh, well, it was quite flat. Uh, Philadelphia showed uh, some uptick, but uh, uh, comparing uh, 1990 to 2000, uh, the later decade, uh, uh, the growth in Philadelphia, you can see, actually was greater uh, close into the center city and uh, flatter as you move farther out. And um, Portland, uh, uh, similarly, uh, the uh, very high growth in the 20 to 30 kilometers from the city uh, was reduced uh, in the early 2000s. This slide's a little bit hard to read, but if you just look at the right-hand corner of it, what we see is that uh, the most recent change in migration, and this is after 2015, uh, the uh, places that were growing uh, the fastest uh, were suburbs, followed by exurbs, followed by mid-sized metros, uh, uh, growing uh, less than, uh, um, well, actually not growing. Uh, uh, we had uh, 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 small metros, there uh, was a, a, an uptick in exurbs, which were still uh, not growing. Uh, uh, there was more accurate migration than in migration. And uh, at the bottom, uh, we saw that major metro cores actually went down. Now, this, of course, is before uh, the pandemic effects. So if we look at monthly net out migration uh, from uh, I, I, in the uh, last two years, there's been a huge uptick in uh, monthly urban uh, uh, net urban out migration. Now, uh, and there are some articles just came out uh, yesterday uh, that were pointing out that this net out migration was more caused by uh, 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 not the fact that more people were moving out, but uh, fewer people were moving back into the uh, urban core. So uh, is this a short-term or long-term change? Uh, is it a return to urban sprawl? And I think what we find is a tension between uh, technology and life science firms who are catering to millennials' desire for 24-hour cities and other firms that are not so focused uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, these uh, areas that particularly cater to the, uh, 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 to the millennials and uh, the kinds of lifestyles they prefer. And just, uh, I, 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 uh, this brings you to the end of my uh, uh, prepared remarks. Uh, I, I happen to be teaching a class right now on ESG, and uh, I, I know that's been part of our conversation. Uh, I, I do think uh, that uh, ESG, uh, we're at a pivotal moment in uh, in development firms. I think uh, ESG uh, is uh, it's here to stay. I, while uh, yes, uh, as was noted a little earlier, uh, there's some uh, uh, pandering to ESG on, by the financial firms who are trying to get a leg up uh, on uh, uh, raising money from other uh, uh, private equity funds and so forth. 
I, I think that the development industry, which in the U.S. is probably at least six years behind Europe and facing up to uh, uh, ESG demands and requirements, but uh, this is the freight train coming down the track and I think is going to fundamentally change uh, uh, how development, uh, uh, well, how developers uh, deliver buildings. Uh, we're seeing this first, I think, in the office market, uh, and uh, uh, but it's coming to uh, all all aspects of development. And uh, uh, well, while uh, whereas right now there's more emphasis, I think, on uh, uh, the E on the environmental side uh, of the equation. Uh, that increasingly there's going to be a focus on the social and governance sides. So uh, uh, let me uh, stop my share and see if I can, uh, uh, we can get uh, some dialogue going. Thank you very much, Richard. Absolutely. Uh, you know, interestingly, uh, as the development of cities occurs, we have this larger dynamic of you know, into the centre and away from the centre and all sorts of reasons driving this. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm really not surprised that you're adding the ESG issues to this because they're absolutely integrated uh, in how we go about that dynamic. Um, but thank you for that. That was, you know, really, uh, really a wonderful uh a parlay of what is what happened way back then uh, in terms of the sprawl in London from the west of the city, from the city centre, west towards Westminster, um, and in fact then turned around to be a healthier, uh, more optimal uh, space for people and so on. And then interestingly, as we see today, as you say, uh, areas come and go, and once upon a time, that square mile of London City was not in favour uh, in terms of location by by uh, businesses and major major tenants. Uh, in fact, Canary Wharf was built and developed primarily to offer a, a, an alternative. But what's happening now? Everyone's flooding back to that square mile of the city, and those buildings are going up. So you know, an extraordinary. Uh, dynamic that keeps uh, that keeps changing, and and you know, which you explain very very uh, nicely in that notion of sprawl and and you know back and forth. So thank you, um, Gordon. Would you have a yeah. question? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a couple of questions, Richard. I I mean I I get it, gained a lot from listening to you, and I was sort of really you know a lot. So <laughs> the questions I'm going to ask are really sort of eliciting. Uh, comment on whether my uh, presuppositions are correct or not. Um, I've heard two comments recently about the US um, housing uh, industry, and they go as follows. First, um, the housing industry used to be uh, driven by the fact that people owned a lot of land and wanted to realise the value of land, so they built houses on them and sold them. So in a sense, the argument there was that it wasn't really housing. It was the capitalisation of the value of the land that they were trying to realise and that we got basically what we got in the American city by virtue of the land holdings of these developers. And so sort of housing was the byproduct of realising the value of land. The second comment I've heard recently is uh, an immense um, or accelerating concentration in the US housing development industry, such that there are more and more, well, more and more of the housing each year is produced by fewer and fewer but larger firms. So I wonder if you'd comment on those two comments that have been made to me recently. First, is it that actually in the past, the urban world that we got was the urban world that was, if you like, was the property that it was built on and wasn't actually conceived other than realising the property land. And then the question, the second question is, is the industry consolidating around really big 
players? And what's, what do you think are the likely implications of that? Well, these are two great questions. Uh, uh, first, uh, unlike England, where I spent a lot of time since that's where I did my dissertation, uh, 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 there are very few cities where uh, one has dominant uh, players who have huge tracts of land. And I really don't think, uh, well, yes, every landowner, every farmer would like to someday monetize uh, his property. Uh, but uh, the, I mean, it's well known why people uh, start with houses at the urban fringe. Uh, that's what is in demand. And uh, if you're trying to monetize your property, uh, uh, you uh, 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 just looking at where the demand is, uh, and I've worked on uh, everything from small subdivisions. Uh, my specialty is new towns, and I guarantee mm -hmm. if you if you have uh, uh, six thousand acres or up to twenty thousand acres, and they're trying to develop that land, that the great majority of the land is going to go into uh, housing because that's where the demand is. Now. Uh, what, what to me is very interesting is the best planned uh, suburban and exurban places are ones that uh, carefully, uh, uh, they, they make room for the future uh, infill of higher density housing and also create town centers and shopping nodes that uh, become the places uh, uh, that are, will be very exciting. Um, I think you can look at your own new towns in England uh, and and see uh, you know some of the uh, earliest uh, are, are still largely residential. So personally, I, I don't see this as just a phenomenon of uh, landowners uh, who are trying to uh, uh, monetize their land and and put houses there. I think is more a reflection of the market and uh, supply and demand. On the issue of consolidation, the housing industry. You have to remember that we start from uh, one of the uh, least concentrated industries uh, 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 across the whole uh, spectrum. So there really aren't that many, uh, I, I, well, in the good old days, and I've seen the current numbers, but uh, I, I think it was the five largest players accounted for less than 5% of the homes built. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very different from the car industry where the five largest players would be, uh, you know, almost all the cars built. Um, so, yes, there is consolidation in the industry, uh, and uh, that, I actually think, on balance, may uh, be having a, a good impact, at least on the quality of what gets built, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, firms, uh, larger firms that are doing multiple subdivisions uh, uh, of a 1,000 homes or more, I think, are able to maintain uh, standards, uh, uh, factory development processes, uh, and just efficiencies of uh, of uh, um, of uh, design and building and marketing and finance uh, that uh, overall lead to a better product, and it also uh, in the battle between uh, uh, the cities and developers, uh, uh, where you have a very large developer, uh, they will become much more the focus and much more a balanced negotiation. I think in 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 this uh, developer paying for and providing more urban services than mm -hmm. where you uh, uh, don't have consolidation and just small individual developers uh, like me uh, doing uh, small subdivisions where we just look for land and uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and we're not negotiating to offer any set of uh, public goods beyond uh, what we might be required to. Could, can I just ask one follow-up question about housing dynamics in the US? Where, where do you place Zillow in this? Um, yes, I know it's in the media and all this kind of stuff, but, but, but it is an intervention in sort of uh, orchestrating demand and supply, transparency in pricing, um, the visual imagery gives you some sense of what you get for your money, uh, it's really good on placing in terms of location in relation to other places. Is, is Zillow just an extension of real estate dynamics or is it actually a game changer? Well, I was chuckling because Zillow is most in the news because of the yeah. failure of their AI uh, to uh, accurately predict uh, housing prices and the fact that they've lost 
a couple of billion dollars, uh, I think, in Phoenix, uh, uh, which most of us academics who, who follow Zillow are not surprised because we think there's still uh, an uh, uh, AI hasn't quite gotten to the point of replacing uh, uh, all the factors that we uh, uh, humans are able to uh, incorporate as we assess uh, uh, value. <laughs> but uh, uh, Zillow is one of a number of firms that are on the forefront of uh, of PropTech, uh, um, uh, the, the, well, the revolution in PropTech yep. that is absolutely going to have huge impact on the real estate markets uh, through transparency, uh, uh, greater data, uh, easier uh, interface between uh, those companies and uh, uh, buyers uh, and sheer knowledge of the market. And so I think uh, Zillow, Water, I may be critical that often if you look at their values, they're based on property taxes and may be 50% off of what uh, uh, one, someone on the ground knows is the true value. Uh, over time, those, uh, those get better. And uh, I think uh, overall that's that's a very good thing for the real estate market and is uh, is absolutely a, a game changer, not just for Zello, but uh, the other firms in that space. Okay, look, I'll, I'll pass it over to Richard Florida if he's here or... No, I, I might just jump in, please, Gordon. Yes, okay. uh, Richard, Richard Green, uh, who will be speaking to us a little later, uh, just uh, is providing a note here to us and our audience that there's a paper by Luis Quintero that supports the idea that local concentration, that the local concentration of house, home building or house building subdivisions is actually having a price effect and they, they are tracking that. So that, you know, contributes to that uh, discussion that Richard had raised. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, thank you for that, Richard, uh, Richard Green. Uh, Richard, um, Paisa, now you, uh, are renowned from even my days of studying real estate for having done uh, the inaugural book on real estate development, a textbook on real estate development, published by the Urban Land Institute. Uh, I'm not going to mention the date of the original publication, but now into its fifth or sixth edition, uh, called Professional, Professional Real Estate Development. And so, um, you know, it was it was really your book, uh, and it's it's attempt to talk about well, it's it's success in talking about and describing the process uh, that made me realize that there is so little uh, known and researched and understood about this process. Um, and so, and and you and I have both seen the rising of real estate education. Uh, even at this graduate school level uh, over these uh, decades since you've written the book. And I was wondering if you've noticed differences in how that education might proceed today uh, with respect to uh, you know, what, you, what you presented in that book initially. Well, first, uh, thanks for uh, your uh, kind comments about the book. Uh, I'm right now in the middle of finishing up uh, the fourth edition. I write a new edition every 10 years. It's uh, pretty much a largely new book, all new cases and everything. But uh, I, and I don't want anybody to run for the hills, but I would just note that uh, every time I publish the book, it's usually just after there has been a cataclysmic event, <laughs> starting, with, starting with the SNL crisis, then the tech crisis, then the great financial crisis, and now the pandemic. And, and we hope before uh, the book actually hits the street in the next year or so that there isn't some other crisis. But uh, yes, I, I, as a, I got my start actually as a developer. I, I started with Gerald Hines. I'm from Houston and I, I, I thought I got my job as through my great credentials and it turned out because uh, he knew my father and uh, remembered him kindly. And, and got my start on new towns and, and then went into home building and apartment building and more recently industrial and other stuff. So I've always had some foot in the development side. And, uh, and I've just personally been fascinated by uh, the delivery of uh, different kinds of real estate. And uh, I, I found that the uh, sort of my main competitor is Mike Miles' book, also published by the ULI. 
uh, which uh, takes more of a process approach. And uh, I guess the main distinction is uh, I think each product, uh, the way it gets delivered is quite different so that I, uh, I, I, I approach it through the lens of land development, apartment development, office, retail, and so forth. And uh, of course, the changes that are happening in each of those product types uh, from retail to office, residential, uh, are just so enormous, <laughs> you know, uh, over a 10-year span. And uh, uh, things are happening now that one really uh, never dreamed of 10 years ago. Uh, uh, um, ESG wasn't on the horizon. Uh, sustainability was, but uh, uh, prop tech really was in its infancy uh, and uh, no one expected a pandemic. Uh, so, uh, no, it, Patrice, I'm just uh, thrilled that, uh, that you are uh, uh, both uh, leading or the one of the great programs. Uh, uh, the other thing I just note on education is that over the last 50 years, we've seen a real professionalization of how people get educated in real estate. I did my degree in the Department of Land Economy in, in uh, Cambridge when I thought land economy uh, had to do with land development. And it turned out it was about the conversion of uh, rural tribal societies uh, to uh, uh, more sophisticated societies. But I was there as uh, Gordon Cameron came in and, uh, and the change to uh, urban development uh, as, uh, has ascended. I see Richard is here, uh, maybe because uh, Richard's seminal book on the creative class. And in fact, we met, he may not remember, at the RICS uh, many years ago as that was just coming out. Um, uh, so Richard? Uh, well, I do remember Richard and thank you for that fantastic presentation. We don't, we don't I can see Gordon want to interject because we're almost out of time. No, I, I th thank you for being part of this and thank you for all you've done. I guess if I had one quick question, if you could make a half minute response is, what do you think the biggest impact of the pan the single biggest impact of the pandemic will be on real estate? Oh, that's a tough one. Top three? <laughs> well, I, I think of it in terms of, uh, of the product types. I, I think it's, uh, it's very much exacerbated uh, the pace of online retail. I think has really changed uh, totally uh, uh, how people are going to work and the implications of uh, office development. Uh, uh, for my book, I was talking to uh, uh, Owen Thomas just yesterday, who was uh, pointing out how many of these older office buildings that one would like to convert to residential have floor plates that simply don't uh, make that feasible. So there are going to be so many changes uh, related to the pandemic uh, that I think are going to change, uh, you know, what gets developed and how it gets developed. And uh, I also, as I was presenting, think there, it, um, I think the jury's out, but uh, I do think we're going to see a more of a return to uh, 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 out migration. And while certain cities that are huge in the techs and life sciences, like Seattle and Boston will do very well with the core. I think many other cities are going to have a real, real trouble uh, 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 energizing uh, uh, their downtowns and we'll continue to see this change. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, next time you go past Gun Hall, look up on the corner um, as it fronts on to what uh, Broadway or no near uh, looking towards Broadway that was my office once so uh, ah. <laughs> just go and knock on the door and say Gordon Clark was once here but anyway <laughs> well thank you again he was yes I remember <laughs> thank you thank you Richard uh, thank you so this brings us to Rachel Weber yes Rachel, you. can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Rachel. Good to Good. see you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Patrice. Nice to see you all, even through this uh, strange and uh, disembodied format. <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're all expert Zoomers now. It still feels a little weird. But... No, no. <laughs> it's great to see you, Rachel. Nice to so, see you all. Why don't you, off you go. Oh, okay, sure. Well, my, my presentation is a little different from the two previous ones and in, in this sort of uh, the second panel. Um, 
but I'm, I'm more of a political economist or an economic sociologist or an urban planner. I teach in the urban planning department at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And um, I've been conducting research on development and urban development uh, for the last 10 or 15 years. So um, I'm assuming that you've all read the book uh, by Tom Wolfe called A Man in Full. It came out in 1998. And even if you haven't, you're in luck because apparently Netflix has optioned the rights to the book and the actress Regina King, who I love, is what? going to be directing a, a six part series based on the book. Um, but in the book, the protagonist is a developer named Charles Croker and he is a developer and he's in Atlanta. And he's there's one scene in the book where he's looking out the window of his private plane and he's admiring the skyline of Atlanta. And he says to himself, I did that. That's my handiwork. I'm one of the giants who built the city. I'm a star. So I just want to sort of start off with the idea that developers like Charlie Croker, we often see satirized in pop culture for having giant egos, right? From George Potter in It's a Wonderful Life to George Bluth in the television show Arrested Development. Um, and there's some basis for these caricatures. You know, if you read the autobiographies uh, of real estate giants like James Rouse or Donald Trump, uh, these authors portray themselves as lone wolves, right? As lone visionaries in whose hands the keys to the city can be found. Um, and I've been, as I said, sort of, I've been interviewing a lot of uh, developers over the last couple of years. And I do find that they often subscribe to a theory of the world that grants them considerable agency as strategic risk takers in, envir in, in an environment that is according to them, entirely of their own making. So you can, you can see how easy it is to develop a kind of God complex when you do have so much influence over the physical settings in which millions of people go about their daily lives. Now, what I, one, of the, one of the many reasons why I appreciate Patrice's opus is um, that we get a much more nuanced analysis of these individuals, um, of the kind of corporate organization that development takes, you know, in the intervening couple of centuries, uh, you know, since the you know 1600s, 1700s, about which she's doing a lot of uh, her writing and her history. And so we really see um, commercial real estate developers portrayed, I think, in a more realistic way. Uh, we learn about how this new professional class emerged in the Anglo-American world and how certain financial and legal practices became established norms in this field. And as we've already said, Patrice emphasizes the significance of London in um, the 17th and 18th centuries, because it's during this period that we see these kind of nascent developers who were somewhat adjacent to the landed aristocracy, uh, but still were sort of titled men like, like earls, and we see them completing successful large scale building projects against all odds. So we hear about the Earl of Southampton's Bloomsbury and the Earls of Bedford's uh, you know, development of Covent Gardens and even reckless Nicholas Barbon who developed Red Lion Square and its, envir in its environs in Holborn without the government permissions to even to do so. Um, and it's interesting, I kind of thought of him uh, in terms of, you know, his abuses of his contractors and the court system as something of a 17th century Donald Trump. Um, but regardless, their designs, these, these early developers became models for beneficent, harmonious and high quality residential and mixed use developments uh, for which central London is still renowned. And their methods of financing, their methods of gaining site control, laying out different land uses and engaging in site planning, uh, project management and mar marketing are still in use today. So I think this book is really helpful for seeing this kind of uh, long durée, the sort of the, these, these historical antecedents for a lot of the practices that, as I said, have become sort of norms or conventions in the field. And I think also from Patrice's book, we see a lot to admire about commercial real estate developers that you don't you know, hear about in Tom Wolfe's book. Um, 
Patrice makes clear that private developers were creating planned spaces long before public sector planners ever got in on the action, right? And we don't see the sort of, um, you know, if you look at the, sort of the history of state formation and the development of municipal governments, you know, it's sort of understandable that they were not yet really sort of players in this field, but you see master developers in some ways, um, you know, again, sort of acting as sort of precursors to what public planners have have you know sort of learned how to do. Um, they were able to mandate a uniformity of style that temporarily tamed the chaos of urbanism at this time. And they were not seeking just to maximize the rental potential of their buildings, but instead were concerned about the public types of collective amenities, public gardens, piazzas, courtyards, um, and they also experimented with social planning because they were creating units with very different designs and price points. And so we're sort of thinking about what kind, I mean, in some ways the precursor to kind of the mixed income developments that have uh, replaced, you know, section eight or, um, you know, sort of public housing in the United States. They were also strategic risk takers. They were the first one, ones on the dance floor um, they helped open up new markets and absorb some of the initial risks of building in particular places. And in doing so, they de-risked those neighborhoods or particular building types and paved the way for others, maybe with less capital, less information, um, and you know, sort of fewer social networks to follow suit. And they were, uh, I'm not sure where I got this expression. I think it was from the, um, uh, there's a, a book by Miller called Here's the Deal, which is about the, it sort of tells the history of the si si urban development in the city of Chicago by looking at just one parcel of land. And it's also a sort of a great companion piece for Patrice's book if, if other instructors and professors are looking for good teaching materials. Um, but he was talking about Ar Arthur Rubloff, who was a famous developer and property manager in Chicago and called him a radical reimaginer of land. And I have always really appreciated that phrase, um, the ability, the capacity to see the development potential in places that few other, others could see it. So I think Patrice is trying to get a handle on and sort of define the parameters, boundaries, contours of this field or profession um, called commercial real estate development. And that's kind of hard to do. That's a hard task because you know, human beings have been building physical structures to house themselves and their business operations since time immemorial. Um, you know, we didn't have the Urban Land Institute back in the 17th century. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not such a simple task. And even today, it's sometimes hard to get a handle on who is and is not a developer. When you see, uh, you know, the field is crowded as it is with general contractors and brokers and property managers and owners reps and the financiers and the corporate tenants and the architects. And you do see a re restructuring within this industry. I mean, Gordon was asking this question about consolidation and concentration. You do see the sort of firms themselves, the corporate organizations themselves sort of shape-shifting over time. And in some sort of periods of time, we do see more vertical integration so you have developers that also have, you know, are REITs, you know, the real estate investment trusts, or they also have brokerage firms, or they are also um, lenders, you know, they're also, um, you know, mortgage brokers or mortgage banks. So it's sometimes tough to distinguish between who is and who is not a developer or sort of part of the development team. And when I teach this material, I like to tell this, my students that developers are like the producers of a movie, not to keep on using kind of you know, pop culture references, but they're involved in every aspect of the project. You know, they're arranging financing and hiring the general contractor. They're the ones whose collateral and reputation and equity is on the line in the event that the project goes south. But in some ways, um, it's kind of less what developers do and more sort of why they do it that helps to define them. And Patrice argues that what really sets the professional developer apart from the amateur from the occupant, from the landlord or property manager, is the act of speculation, of speculating for, for profit. Um, so Patrice's book for me got me thinking, got me speculating about the meaning of speculation and also it's kind of ethical or moral valence. 
Um, so just looking at its etymology, speculation has a dual meaning, right? Just from the sentence I just um, spoke, you can see that, uh, you know, in, on one hand, speculation means to think about or to contemplate the future. And in Latin, speculatio means observation or the act of looking. But it also means to take a, a risky position in that future with capital that turns on an envisioned or expected outcome. So there's a sort of element of expectancy, there's an element of risk, um, and there's a kind of dependence on the future that is very important to commercial real estate. So commercial developers are speculators in that they produce space to generate future income and capital gains, it's really the capital gains, it's that appreciation where the, the real treasure lies. Um, so they treat landed property more like a financial asset, more like a stock and bond than as an input in production. So writing it the, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote, um, or he defined speculation as a financial practice that involves attempts to anticipate or outwit short-term price movements ahead of the general public. And he distinguishes speculation from enterprise, which is, in his mind, earning money in the productive economy. So that productive economy, you see sort of reappear over and over again in these sort of um, different analyses of what speculation is. And Keynes also famously wrote that speculation and investment, that these were both subject to animal spirits, right? The spontaneous urge to act motivated more by emotion than rationality. So during the time when Patrice was writing about, um, you know, her developers in, in London, um, speculation had a very bad rap. Um, up until really the 19th century, the late 19th century, when we see the development of, you know, the, of the bourse and the stock exchange, um, speculating whether it was on tulip bulbs or on property was really viewed as quite uh, disreputable. And the sort of boundaries between speculation and sort of acceptable economic activity were policed um, by religious authorities, there was a sort of a, an irreligious or a, you know, sort of connotation associated with speculation. I think, you know, it was considered wild and savage, compulsive and uninformed. Um, Max Weber, who Manuel brought up early on and who has, you know, no, uh, you know, blood, blood relation to myself, um, he felt speculation was pre-modern in that it was out of line with the Protest Protestant ethics of self-discipline and rationality. Um, Marx also thought poorly of property speculation because he did not believe that it involves any productive labor. Um, and you know, Janelle was also talking about sort of Locke and you can go back to Ricardo um, and to Henry George, right? Who talk about the sort of the kind of unearned increment um, from, from investing in, in land. Um, that you could just own land and it can increase in value without you having to do anything to it. So uh, yeah, Marx argued that the value of land was a structurally necessary, necessary fiction because so little labor went into it. And Marxists to, the, to this day continue to, to, to prefer to talk in terms of rents, right? The ground rents that can be generated by land as opposed to something like value because they ascribe to a kind of a, the labor theory of value. So as I, I mentioned, speculation really only became viewed as a legitimate economic practice in the late 1800s, uh, the stock market channeled some of the sort of popular passion for gambling and games of chance. And then, you know, I see a couple of decades later, at least in the United States, um, more government oversight over financial activities uh, to help better inform and protect investors which, with what eventually became the corpus of securities regulation. So we see sort of the in institutional foundations um, for speculative investment taking place that kind of helped to sort of stabilize and popularize um, and make it more acceptable, made, made, made speculation more, more legitimate. So I was wondering about what the sort of ethical or moral valence of property speculation is today in an era of financialized capitalism or what some have called the asset economy. So on one hand, we're witnessing an extraordinary ability for you know, ordinary people to engage in real estate speculation. 
whether it's your pension fund owning a slice of, you know, uh, Richard's new residential tower in, in Toronto, or the, the new possibilities opened up by crowdfunding, um, or the fact that shows like Flip That House or House Flippers are so popular, they're even video games, um, or that monitoring Zillow has become a national pastime. Apparently, we are all speculators now, and I don't know how many of you saw, there's my prop, you know, the, the front cover of the New York Times uh, magazine this past Sunday was about housing prices in Austin, Texas, and sort of made this point that, you know, you know because of the sort of, um, you know, the fast pace of, of transactions and the, you know, uh, very uh, high rates of price appreciation in Austin, again, sort of anybody who wants to buy in that growing market is now a speculator. I take issue with their definitions of speculation. But anyways, I've been interviewing the, the developers and like I say, no one really wants to own up to this term, right? So there's still a kind of a reticence um, to being called a property, uh, you know, to be, being called a property speculator, even though developers call certain buildings of theirs speculative, right? If you're, if you're building a, a building and you don't have it pre-leased, um, you know, if you're, you're, if you're building and you're expecting or anticipating that, you know, the occupants will come, you know, you, you very casually call that spec development, but the individuals themselves were reluctant to be called specular speculators. And the developers I interviewed, you know, they were very quick to distinguish themselves from pure speculators who they call, who they consider to be um, folks who were banking and flipping land. He said, although, you know, some of those are the real speculators um, because they're not adding to or they're not changing them physically. They're just buying and selling. They're just exchange. You know, they're investors and they're quickly buying and selling either buildings and structures uh, or, you know, and, and or the, you know, and the land that they came on or just simply land. And you do see a lot of this, these kind of sort of acrobatics in order to distinguish between um, productive labor, right? When speculate, you know, speculation still makes people uncomfortable because of its supposed lack of productive labor. Um, economist Bill Janeway likes to distinguish between non-productive bubbles like the Dutch tulip bubble and the recent housing bubble and productive ones such as the tech bubble of the 1990s. So developers expend labor to build environments and urban spaces in which we all live and work and we play but they are still building speculatively in that they, again, they may not know who their tenants are, um, but they are also, you know, they are expecting the assets that they build to in increase in value. But it's hard to argue that they do not put any productive labor into this, into their work. I mean, I'm, I uh, am not just an academic, but I am, I sit on the board of a, a, a small development organization, a public private development organization. Um, and I see how much work is involved, particularly when there's NIMBY sentiments expressed. And I see how long and drawn out of a process is, but the, you know, you definitely see the, the, the productive labor that goes into developing the built environment. Um, but I also think, again, this sort of speaks to our, our present moment that speculation gets a bad rap because the price of property as a financial asset has become increasingly separated from the asset itself, the, the sort of the, um, you know, the, the, the apartment building or the office tower, the, the asset, the economic asset that is generating cash flows. Um, and I think there's some insecurity or uncomfortableness about this sort of act of sort of dematerialization. Um, so, you know, I, and I do think that this, in this time of financialization, um, that development means something very different than it did for, say, the second Earl of Bedford, right? Whether it's, bank, you know, bankers, you know, we feel like, you know, in previous eras, uh, bankers and investors really only entered into the picture when visionary developers sought backing to make their plans a reality. And today, many people would argue that you kind of have the tail wagging the dog, the influence of financial markets over what gets built and where it gets built um, has grown a lot. Right? Pro property and financial markets are much more tightly coupled and the value of property is more intimately related to risk and to the credit system and to the stock market. We've got complex securities that are built on the backs of real estate assets and their mortgages. 
Um, and many of the developers that I was talking about when I asked them, like, how did they know when it was the right time to build? They weren't looking at demographic trends or market analysis. They were looking at CMBS yields. They were looking at commercial mortgage backed securities and how they were doing. So as the instruments and processes become more de dematerialized and the distance that Derek mentioned between investor and place becomes more attenuated, the buildings sometimes drop out of the picture. I mean, you can have securities that are being hedged against other, you know, ostensibly property-based securities. Um, and other people have mentioned this, but that's partly driven by, or the, the sort of short-term uh, horizons of developers are part, partly driven by the short-term horizons of investors and of capital markets. Um, and the key to most speculative development as Patrice notes in her book is getting one's money out of the project and unloading one's holdings as quickly as possible during what property developers know are finite windows of opportunity. And I think the, although the book highlights the work of a few long-termers, most developers today tend to focus myopically on the short-term performance of their buildings rather than surveying future user needs and market conditions. And this is concerning, obviously, for all the reasons we've just been talking about in terms of ESG and responding to climate change. But you know, the sort of accelerated path, pace of transactions um, is something that it's easy to get addicted to. And when because when buildings are flipped, um, you know, that that brings sort of immediate returns and benefits to the original developers. Prices rise and the building's occupancy becomes someone else's problem. So this deeply ingrained short-termism is encouraged, I would argue, by capital markets who put pressure on developers to forego the kinds of improvements that Patrice praises in her in her book. Um, you know, things like courtyards and um, you know, really sort of high quality site design because those things have high fixed costs and potentially long run payoffs. Sometimes they are very difficult to capitalize into the sort of immediate price of, uh, of property. And so they often have to be sort of pried from developers unwilling hands uh, by municipalities who bargain for them these public benefits in exchange for additional floor area and development rights. So just in sum, I realize I'm a little out of time. I just wanna say that property speculation in a, in a capitalist economy um, means sort of building to this sort of the highest and, and best use, which often involves uh, you know, price inflation and developers are very dependent on that, on that price appreciation and, and inflation uh, because they're able to extract rents from their monopoly ownership of space but we also have to think about those who are not able to do that and those who do not have that property claim to space. And I really do think that some of the, the projects that we've been talking about today and, um, and the, the profitability of real estate does, it does have the potential to exacerbate asset and place-based inequities um, you know, and, and, have, and, and can lead to the kinds of dispossession and displacement that we've talked about. So that makes me a little uh, shy about um, trying to resuscitate the reputation of speculative developers, even though I recognize all the good things they bring and that the incentive of profit leads them to do oftentimes great things in cities. So appreciating Patrice's wonderful historical research and compelling argument, I still want us to sort of think about um, the fact that the ability to accumulate capital from speculation is unevenly distributed. And that also needs to be sort of part of this story. So I will stop here. Wow, that, that was really um, very, very impressive. Very helpful, very helpful. Fabulous, Rachel, thank you. Thank you. Oh. And your conversations with the black hats or are they the white hats? <laughs> um, hmm. Hard to say sometimes. Any any giveaway um, clues? You know, you're sitting there for five <laughs> minutes and you realise hmm, definitely black hat, or is it hmm maybe white hat? Uh, um, you know, I've interviewed all kinds of developers. I mean, from like I say, sort of small land flippers on the south side of Chicago who are just waiting until there's more speculative activity, right? Because it's really hard to speculate on your own. It's not a kind of solo activity. 
Um, and again, this goes back to Manuel's earlier comments about how um, there's there needs to be some coordination and cooperation, and you need more of a crowd. It's hard to it's, it is hard to do it on your on your own, no matter how big of a developer you are and how big of a project. Um, but I've you know between talking to them, but then also some of the big global real estate firms, you know the 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 ones who are multi-divisional and vertically integrated and who, and who have operations yeah, around the world, you know, the JLLs and the CBREs and the yeah. Tishman Spires. And so, you know, sort of a pretty big range. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, well, Rachel, thank you so much. You're absolutely right. And that's fascinating. And I'll be so keen to read about these people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing, and, you know, like you, I've wrestled with this, who is a developer? And in fact, you know, what I try to sort of start to unearth in this book is that speculators or flippers of land are not developers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, it, it, although I do raise Nicholas Barbon as the one who came and did this with, you know, great fervor, um, you know, that's where I said it was all ruined. What a developer <laughs> could do and should be doing was all, all ruined because he was so solely interested on extracting the benefit as quickly as possible and moving it on. And that benefit, you're absolutely right, is the appreciation, the value appreciation, that speculative part. Whereas what originally began and what still remains important for long-term holders is the ongoing rental income from someone's productive use. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, you know, and that's what you referred to as enterprise. And I am so grateful that is exactly the term. Mm -hmm. You know, real estate development should be an enterprise like being a lawyer is an enterprise. We are going to put our skills to work. Does a lawyer speculate as to whether a contingency fee of taking on this matter is going to be hugely profitable? Maybe they do within the contingency fee system. And, and then I would say, just as the contingency fee system may have created some moral degeneracy for lawyers, it also creates the moral degeneracy of real estate developers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're both, you, I really appreciate how you've identified that developers do do something. They, they should uh, do something or I, and you know that sort of supports what and and, and the problem with what they do spec, speculatively which I really put on and as my students know I mm -hmm. found the table on mm -hmm. being that exit value mm -hmm. <laughs> that exit value which is all appreciation what a lot of nonsense and that's mm -hmm. speculation yes mm -hmm. so thank but it, you but it is hard it hard it is hard to distinguish the two right because if we if we're looking at if we're estimating the future value the sales value the termination value of a building right it's going to take into account the the you know the rental income yes a, that that can be generated from a place so it's not as it's it's very that's they're very hard to distinguish and it, it is very hard and the problem is we use that pro forma that takes annual mm -hmm. in that holding period all the annual and you know net income and then takes the income expected mm -hmm. for the following year mm -hmm. but the key is it's not just that rental income the real problem that is applied is called the capitalization the cap rate. Rate mm -hmm. that is applied to that Right. And that is where, you know, the belief system right. and, you know, and, and so on. Rental growth, you know, can be probably extrapolated by a very clever computer. <laughs> yeah, and, there, and there's the magic involved in choosing your cap rate, right? If you're off, if you're, you know, if you change that by a, you know, whatever point quarter, zero zero quarter, of a basis a point, whatever, exactly. you'll have a very different project or a very different expected project or sales. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what they'd like to believe in. And that's where all the, you know, the, the uh, card game begins. Or they, you know. <laughs> so, you know, but thank you. I appreciate that. It's, you know, it's so, so rarely do urbanists really, you know, break out what developers are doing. And I really appreciate you're doing that for us. Thank you. Welcome. And um, as I said, you know, you've got 25 minutes max. Yep. And, uh, if you 
finish earlier than that, you can have more questions. How about that? Beautiful. So hi, everybody. I'm Ashby Monk. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, this book is, is a fabulous book. And I, I heard somebody earlier talk about just like the feel of it and like the desire to assign it to students. And I have that same sense. I, I so rarely protect books from my pen, but in this case, I did not mark it up with a pen because it's just such a lovely item. It should be on a coffee table without my notes. Um, anyway, so I'm Ashby. I, I, I run a new research program at Stanford as of Monday this week. So I actually have a new job. I've, I used to be the executive director of the Global Project Center. And as of Monday, I'm the executive director of Stanford's research initiative on long-term investing. So I, as you can imagine, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the world of long-term investing, rooting it in this fabulous book, um, providing some interpretations out of the book, and then moving into the world of um, the future. Um, as, as an academic inside an engineering school, we have a pretty unique mandate to solve problems. So our literally our charter includes the solutions to big problems at, at the engineering school, which can leave some academics feeling a little bit uncomfortable as we move into that world of normativity and subjectivity, but I'll try to control it for this, this group. But yes, we often think about how to solve problems and how to interpret from the models. And there's some great models in this book. So I'll jump into it. Um, I study investors and investors are in the business of making projections. They have wealth today, some form of financial capital today. You need money to make money is the old saying. Um, and they allocate their present day financial capital to investment opportunities with an explicit expectation to receive some future economic benefit. I take my cash and I don't spend it today because I want more cash in the future. Um, as this implies, the, the process of giving up your present day consumption means having um, confidence in your ability to make predictions about the future, about your portfolio's value in the future, about the value of assets that you're investing in the future. And so the, the best investors, according to the work that I've done with Gordon Clark and a few of the others on this um, conference, um, try to understand how their own objectives interact with the investment opportunities that exist in the world. They seek to define their own risk tolerance, and then they seek to understand the risk and return profiles of the assets that they're going to rely on to go and generate performance. And that's my co-author back there that just walked by. Um, his name is Mega Dog. Uh, so this can be challenging. Uh, because some investors have extremely long horizons um, and certain assets have very long lifespans. Um, I can tell you that some of the pension funds that I have studied have 100 year liabilities on their books today. So they are thinking about what could prevent them from meeting their objectives in 100 years. The Canada Pension Plan states on their website, they have a 75 year holding period and investment period. That's a very long time. Um, and then the assets themselves can have very long durations, which may not affect everybody if you can sell the asset today in a viable market, but it could affect the price upon which you sell it. If certain risks materialize in the next 10 years, even if it's a 50-year asset, the price at which you can sell that asset in 10 years' time ch changes. Um, real estate, as an example, we're going to talk about a lot today, have been talking about, exposes investors to an intergenerational location-bound risk. The buildings are often seen as permanent when they're put up. There is no intent to remove them, and they are immovable. And this means that analyzing those long-term risks is much more difficult, but also much more important. If you're a long-term investor investing in a long-term asset, you need tools to really begin to understand what are the environmental, societal, and governance threats, ESG, that could prevent us from achieving our goals. And so this is precisely why real estate has been so important in my work, 
but also important for the transformation of finance. It's one of those asset classes, we might argue the first asset class that truly required investors to consider intergenerational risk. The long-term value of real estate is a function of its long-term resilience. And that's why the, the title of my paper for this is Value the City, Intergenerational Risks, Returns, and Real Estate. And I've been informed and, and truly inspired by Patrice's book to see real estate as a role model for the broader investment industry. So taking that lens, as I always do, of the world of capital allocators, the book reminds us of that interplay, and I would even argue mutual dependence of real estate developers and capital markets today as in the past. The book notes, sorry, um, I'm getting text messages somehow. As the book notes, um, there are really only three core goals of developing real estate. And one is to create financial assets for capital markets. So that's a big goal. And, and the book puts uh, the provision of financial assets to capital markets on similar footing with the provision of shelter and the provision of public amenities. And this means that real estate developers are incredibly well attuned to the needs of investors. The developers need to understand the investors. Um, on page 277, um, Patrice talks about how um, capital is a critical part of the model of urban development. Costs are incurred to produce assets, which will deliver a regular revenue stream over the length of the leases of the completed buildings. And over time, that revenue will repay the capital and provide a competitive compensation to the investor for the use of that capital. This is going back half a thousand years. You know, th this is an incredible foundation upon which to begin to understand and analyze the role of financial markets and its interaction in some of our key societal needs. Um, put another way, the investment community has greatly influenced the evaluation of real estate. So I think there was a certain point, uh, uh, page 334 talked about how um, investors push developers to privilege certain types of assets, such as the upper and middle class residential projects over other types. So that's an interesting influence of the financial community on the built environment. At the same time, the real estate developments have helped to shape financial markets. The market-led concept of valuation has been transformational for the pricing of all sorts of other durable goods, not just real estate. And so my interpretation of this is as real estate having the capacity to change financial markets, and if done correctly, improve them by rooting them more directly in long-termism. Obviously, we've seen the real estate industry have interesting consequences to the financial markets in the past decade, but I think there's still an opportunity to use this interaction um, to our benefit, especially as I'm going to talk about in a second to solve problems of climate change. In the book's conclusion, we are told that the investment community needs to change their methods of valuation to deliver a longer term understanding of the stakeholders' needs and requirements. Patrice calls on us to focus on the long term by better calibrating the risks and returns beyond the dominant narratives of short term capital markets. I feel like I've almost written that sentence 20 times in different papers talking about my work, trying to push the capital market community to move beyond short-termism. It's amazing to see that reflected through the developer community in the built environment. It's a very similar set of problems. And I think the fact that both are suffering from those problems speaks to their uh, mutual dependence. And so that's the opportunity here. And this is almost where my point of departure is because I asked the question, can real estate development be the role model for long-termism among investors generally? And you know, the problem that I see everybody trying to focus on that is the kind of quintessential long-term problem is that of climate change. And it's becoming obviously increasingly clear there is an interaction between climate change and the built environment. Um, and the question that we all are wondering is where and when will the investment and capital market community truly 
begin to integrate climate hazards and risks and vulnerabilities into their decision making, such that that decision making can then flow back into the built environment and change truly the, the shape of the world we live and make it more resilient. And so that's what I want to speak about, which builds on the model in the book. Um, there's huge vulnerability to the built environment today from climate hazards. There's a bunch of data that I have in my paper on this. Um, you know, the economist said that under aggressive climate change ch scenarios, 10% of global assets are at risk from climate change. Um, and, and there's, you know, Munich Re said the global losses from natural disasters jumped in 2020 to 210 billion compared to 166 billion in 2019. Um, and all of these folks, the economists, Munich Re, project that these numbers are going to continue to rise. Um, and the kind of interesting thing here is a third of these losses are generally uninsured, um, which means that the owners of the assets, the long-term investors, are getting hit with the full weight of a third of those losses. And so all of a sudden, climate change is becoming incredibly material to that profit motive. And that, and therein is the real opportunity to transform how they deploy capital. Um, and, and I think the financial markets will be called upon to help incentivize and manage this transformation to a more resilient built environment, just as the provision of shelter we learn in the book was intertwined with the investor's profit motives. So too will the provision of climate resilience be a function of risk and return calculations of today's investors. As Patrice explains on page 285, successful real estate projects must take a long-term view, which I again interpret to mean that modern successful real estate projects must consider climate. This is what the entire world is searching to do. And this is a focal point that could actually serve as a role model for the world. Um, if investors can get the right signals and they can meaningfully integrate climate change into their core risk decision-making, we can rebuild this, um, not only capital market decision-making process, but then that ideally would flow through into the real estate developers to integrate climate change into their plans and intentions, building a virtuous cycle on the back of data and process and valuation and pricing. Encouragingly, the risk of climate damage has triggered a huge um, uptake in ESG and climate data analytics being sought after by investors. In May 2021, a global poll of over 40 in institutional investors ranked climate change as the top issue, um, most likely to prompt engagement with an underlying asset. Um, and also thanks to like the rise of sensors everywhere, what we call the Internet of Things and advanced computational toolkits, we really can start to collect data and analyze it in ways like never before. Um, and with these new analytics, the idea would be we can shift how the investors understand their exposures to the built environment. And in turn, that can change the real estate while changing finance. Again, that virtuous cycle. The challenge here is to date, the ESG reporting landscape has been um, helpful, but not entirely useful. Environmental factors tend to include proxies for climate related risks that are kind of pulling um, policy statements or carbon emissions. Does not really get to the point of translating a climate risk into something an investor understands in dollars and cents terms? What is missing is how material these risks can be for specific assets, facilities, and portfolios. And ultimately, that is the work that we are doing at Stanford. How do we translate these intergenerational risks, this long-term focus on the built environment into something an investor could quite literally drop into a discounted cash flow analysis? The good news is, there's all kinds of models in the insurance industry that can give us guide, guides on how to do this. The work of Alex Gelber, um, he's at UCSD, uh, on a methodology for translating climate risks into damage projections is incredibly valuable. He, Gelber shows that catastrophe models are the foundation from which we can build climate risk pricing for property insurance premiums. And ultimately, this is about translating 
climate change risks into financial risks. And he has a two-part model for doing this and you need to combine them both. And I'll talk about it for just a minute. You start with a hazard module that specifies the frequency and severity of climate perils, such as hurricanes, wildfires. That hazard module is linked to the climate scenarios into the future. You can downscale it, tie it to local addresses. The next component is a vulnerability module that estimates how the magnitude of a physical hazard will translate into monetary value of financial damages. You can think of this as an example of, say, how a hurricane would um, create damage losses related to wind speed. And this is the type of data that insurance companies have today, whereby we can see claims data showing exactly the vulnerabilities of locations to these different environmental factors. Again, all of this data, the hazard modules and the vulnerability modules can be developed. The data exists and the tools exist. It's the work to connect the hazard to the vulnerability that is the next phase for us in developing um, correct pricing of these risks. By combining these two sets of information, again, the probability of climate events and the impacts of climate events on financial outcomes, um, we can help investors assess how climate will impact financial outcomes for assets, facilities, portfolios, both now and in the future for any location on earth, literally an address. We can understand the building, we can understand the vulnerabilities, and we can understand, will an asset be insurable? Will your home in Napa Valley be insurable for fire? We can begin to inform you on that and help you begin to make changes to your portfolio. What this means, I would argue, is that empowering institutions with this decision useful climate risk analytics Yes, it will help improve capital allocation. It will also increase the incentives to launch mitigation and adaptation measures. There again, the financial markets creating the cost, internalizing the externality today, creating the cost and benefit of investing in resilience. That's the goal. That's a lot of stuff in 10 minutes. Let me begin pulling some of these threads together for you so I can start to leave you with some kind of core thoughts. So the book reminded us how the profit motive investors, the profit motive of investors, capital market participants was important to the provision of shelter 500 years ago. And similar to then, the profit motive will be critical to the provision of shelter from the worst effects of climate change today and tomorrow. Investors saw shelter at the time as an opportunity for profit. It was an objective to attract their capital into this asset class to generate returns. It was partly why they avoided the construction risk and the development risk and wanted it after that, as Patrice talked about in her book. Um, similarly to now, we can't expect investors to see climate change or resilience in a different manner. It can't be, and it is not their sole objective. It is not their job to solve climate change. The plan sponsors have set these organizations up to generate high risk adjusted returns to pay pensions or fund universities or bolster healthcare promises. As much as it pains some of us, they don't exist to solve climate change. And yet they have the long-term horizon. They have, if you sum up some of the data recently, about $150 trillion. That's a big amount of capital. If we can show them that these risks are material and translate climate into dollars and cents, we can begin to do what occurred 500 years ago as investors participated in the development of shelter. Um, and so that is the ultimate challenge here. How do we illustrate how climate affects their portfolios? And I'm convinced even more, if I was already convinced, I'm more convinced now that real estate is that central lens to do it. Patrice demonstrates the huge importance of real estate then as now for people, for government and for investors and the role of the private sector in building and solving really critical problems.
It's also important to note the community of long-term investors truly relies on real estate to meet their investment objectives. This is perhaps the biggest allocation outside of fixed income and public equities. Real estate is where they turn next to get diversified return streams. <sighs> so long-term investors are not fully integrating that risk into their decisions just yet, but based on the model, I think we can push them to do so. Um, to be clear, this would not be financial innovation to hide risk. Okay, This is what occurred in the subprime mortgage industry prior to the financial crisis of 2008. That was about smoothing away vulnerabilities through widespread diversification. If you didn't have the data and analytics, that would be the least bad strategy. Let's diversify, let's spread, and let's allow investors to deploy. But with today's technology, we can do better. The goal should not be to diversify away this risk. It should be to reveal to investors the actual downside in their portfolios stemming from climate change. We want granular, bottom-up understanding. We should not be satisfied with a top-down approach to managing this risk at the local level. And so ultimately to do this, we need to shift their focus to the vulnerabilities, translate their hazards into um, dollars and cents terms. And if we do that and we use similar, if you read the stuff about valuation in Patrice's book, it's gonna be similar, that process of forming valuation toolkits. Um, and just the last statement, the correct pricing of risk will change where capital goes, thereby changing the incentives in our economy and the economy itself. Real estate developers can shape the future of finance, which in turn can transform the entire built environment. And I've tried to communicate 10 years of research in about 15 minutes, so I probably left some things out. <laughs> Over to, back to you guys. Uh, no, you, it's, it was very succinct. And, uh, and Ashby, just, you know, you, you are taking on that exploration of, you know, how do we just change the thinking yeah. about this? How do we change? We know the impact is there. Uh, you know, and we have wonderful Rachel Weber has spoken for decades, you know, a couple of decades about the impact uh, of, of capital, of poor capital decisions on our built environment in terms of urban uh, impacts. And you're now saying, well, similarly with respect to climate, uh, you know, so it takes a lot to tease out all of these pieces uh, that make up that, that clarity of understanding. So, you know, all kudos to you. It's, it's fabulous. And you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's, I can see it having the same sort of intricate uh, balancing of in financial impact as we go along, plus that end piece that is off into the future you know, where we speculate about what the world will be uh, into the future and hopefully support speculation in a good sense of how we can invest in a better future. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the points you mentioned, you can't regulate in the impact. And, and I think similar in this world of long-term investing, we can't force them to do you know, to truly consider this stuff. We need to reveal to them that it's in their interest. And I think in thinking about your model and, and how you manage to pull together that those, those different interests, governments, markets, and developers, and, and the fact that like some of the people that are investing aren't using the asset that they're investing in, whole set of different stakeholders, very similar to the world of long-term investing and managing all these different um, pulling constraints. Yeah. I was struck by um, the use of property as a kind of a lens through which investors understand actually aspects of um, the downside, if you like, of or the risk management part of um, climate change. Um, you might have, and I'm sure you've got lots of experience on this, you might have talked also about the opportunity represented by climate change, yeah. particularly in technology, production technologies, but also in in sort of distribution technology. So what's your take on that? 
Yeah, it is a huge opportunity. And I think in order to spot it, part of the part of it is like understanding this risk is there to your portfolios and then taking using your fiduciary duty to manage that risk means managing the downside, but also leveraging the upside. And the upside mm-hmm. are the solutions, the new resilient buildings that people are going to end up moving to. You know, th- this is a two-sided coin. One is let's avoid the, you know, the damage to the portfolio that we need to control to, but also let's reposition for the upside. Mm. Who's, who's going to pay for um, the investments abandoned or rather the investments discounted and dropping out of a portfolio to somebody else? Who's going to pay, if you like, for the rebalancing of portfolios? So the people who haven't correctly assessed and understood these long-term risks will be left holding the bag. Mm. And so this is, this is like why when I say to these organizations, like, look, you, you need to integrate your ESG into your risk management. This is what we call portfolio resilience. You need to be building a long-term portfolio that correctly spots the threats to you achieving your goals. Holding a piece of real estate on the coast in New Orleans is probably not a risk return bet that you want to make. And and so as we begin to see those properties sold and other properties purchased, we're starting to put a price on this risk through that market lens. Sadly, today, the mortgage market in the US doesn't price, doesn't use location as a determinant of price of mortgage. So your mortgage in Ohio will have the same price as it does on the coast in Florida. Now, that means all the other individual specific factors are being taken into consideration, but not the location factors, when that seems like it's a complete mispricing to me. So, so why do you think the finance industry has been particularly open to this conversation where other industries have heads in the sand and otherwise, but what's, what's special about the industry that gives you, if you like, an audience? Well, the, I think part of it stems from the long horizon investors. I think if you go talk to the, the shorter term fund managers, it's simply trying to respond to the pension funds. So let's differentiate the fund managers or the external asset managers that often do the investing. The pension funds are the asset owners that have the intergenerational time horizon. The fund managers are responding to regulators and the desires of the asset owners to consider these things. They don't yet truly integrate this risk. It is sadly, and this is where like why we need dollars and cents pricing of this through a vulnerability model, we, they just don't see it as important for their investment strategy. The pension funds have stakeholders that really care about this stuff, you know, like Harvard University divesting from fossil fuels, the students care, right? And so the, the, the long-term investors are gonna drag the managers And the property developers who are kind of sitting there building these things ultimately are going to respond to the managers. And so it's that kind of, I mean, I hate to say trickle down set of incentives, but it it almost is like if we can't get the big pensions to truly price this stuff and care about it, then we're going to have to rely on government on that far side to put a price on it through regulation. And maybe we need both but I'm not willing to wait for the government to put the price on it. Let's instead make sure the pension funds are pricing it themselves. Um, And then if we get two levers pulled, great. But at the very least, we need that one lever pulled with the pricing of climate risk. Patrice, any last comments? Because I I can see Jerry there, but Jerry's going to speak anyway. So... All right, Jerry's Jerry, going to Jerry has to hang off. Okay, all right. Uh, Richard, um, you're fine? Richard, uh, Richard Florida, you're all good. No, I think um, it was terrific. It was terrific. No, nothing to add. It was just terrific. Oh, thank you. Absolutely terrific, Ashby. And you know, we 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 will prod each other along with how to better hone this understanding. So, really thrilled. Thank you. Thank you for having thank me. You very much. Thank you, Ashby. It was terrific. Okay, now, Jerry, where's Jerry? Okay, I'm right here. Can you see me? That's, yes, yeah. I can see you. It's um, and, and and you've been very patient, and um, but uh, you you get to um, speak as as you know for up to 20, 22 minutes. Take okay. a few questions, and and the re- and the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, so let me make uh, the comment that I wanted to make on 
uh, Ashby's, and I really appreciated uh, Ashby's remarks, and it's a, a nice segue to what I'd like to talk about. But uh, the comment that I wanted to make was, um, you know, when we're talking about risk and climate change, uh, government disaster policy uh, takes away that risk. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we don't see as much of a shift as, as we might. So if you're a property owner, uh, I, I think, Ashby, you pointed out the risk of wildfires in Napa Valley. Uh, but if you are in Napa Valley, you get subsidized uh, insurance through CAL FIRE and you get uh, FEMA as well. And, and so the risk is mitigated. And if you're a, a corporate owner, you can always sell to individuals. That changes um, the, you know, the, the risk return and keeps developers from taking climate change seriously because that residual value is really protected in that way. So I think that's a real uh, problem, at least in the United States, that disaster policy is doing. Do you think, that. Jerry, um, there will come a, a storm too big? There will come a string of storms too big. You know, one day government won't be able to do what they've done, say, on, on the Gulf of Mexico. It's, uh, do you think there's a limit? I mean, you would think so, but when people have their homes destroyed and they're sitting out there looking at their lives uh, disrupted in that way, there yeah. is a tendency to say we have to help them. Okay. I mean, there is a movement to try and move, uh, you know, buy land and, and move people off uh, away from, but but it's fairly small and it's it, it would be expensive to do. So I, yeah. I think it's going to be a long time coming and it won't be in response to a hurricane or a wildfire, but rather a more thoughtful policy, which sort of turns me to uh, my remarks. So I'm a, a macroeconomist interested in regional economies and transportation economics, uh, but also interested in policy and policy, particularly as it affects uh, 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 things like residential construction uh, that gives you the trajectory or the forecast of what's going to happen uh, in uh, any particular economy. And, and that's why I really appreciated uh, Patrice's his book. So I'd like to begin uh, my remarks with some reflection on the discussion about housing in the urban environment uh, here in my home state of California. And it may be sunny in the uh, Bay Area, but it is cloudy. And for us, it's cold here in Southern California. Um, Housing is clearly expensive here, and, and particularly in the coastal cities where most residents live. And, and this is what's called an affordability crisis. And we have uh, vociferous discussions, but they're really not discussions because people are talking past each other than with each other. So between NIMBYs and YIMBYs and politicians and journalists, et cetera, uh, and, and importantly, the why of the situation uh, seems to be relegated to bad policy uh, on, uh, on the part of um, homeowners and their elected representatives. Uh, you know, in Connor Doherty's book, Golden Gates, he, he points that out and basically says, um, uh, if we were only like Austin, Phoenix, and Seattle, we wouldn't have this problem. And, and I think it was, uh, who was it was uh, maybe uh, Rachel who uh, uh, mentioned that recent New York Times uh, cover where Austin is facing this, you know, the same problem that, uh, that we see here in California. And, and so that leads me to what I see as really an important contribution uh, of Patrice's uh, historical study of property values and urban development in London. And, and we learn a lot from that and, and it should be instructive for policy today. Uh, and Patrice describes a trend towards increasing outsourcing of growth of cities to the private sector in the context of, uh, of this long span of, uh, of history with different economic and social and political conditions. Uh, but it, you know, it was clear to me in reading it that the incentives and the tensions that she described uh, are, are very similar to the ones that we see today, that, uh, that things haven't changed much, if at all. And, and so this analysis really provides a historical context uh, to evaluate, you know, not just the evolution of the urban landscape, 
how we got here today, uh, but also the current move to make high cost of living cities, such as those here in California, uh, more affordable. And, and I think the way to think about this is that the public sector is optimizing the social utility functions somehow defined by the political process. And so this has got a lot of arguments in it uh, of, of what is in the social good. The private sector, uh, you know, as was just uh, succinctly pointed out, is focusing on creating a satisfactory return for investors. And, and these two objectives are clearly in conflict. And, and so to highlight that, uh, I, I'd like to, in the balance of my remarks, uh, take on one aspect of the urban environment uh, that's at the heart of this dis the discussion of the densification of cities in the United States, that of the provision of open space. And, and we've heard uh, quite a bit about this from Sam, Richard, uh, Manuel, and others. Um, and, and just going, going back to, to the history that uh, Patrice outlined, uh, early London, uh, you had a lot of open space. And you know, part of that was uh, for the commercial use for markets. You needed space for markets. Uh, and, and the 16th century enclosures, you had this real conflict between those who were using the open space and those who were enclosing them. Uh, and, and people were forced off the land. Uh, and what that privatization resulted in was migration to the cities. And, and we heard in earlier remarks about how demand was driving uh, farmers, landowners on the periphery to monetize their land by building homes and selling them. And, and that was really part of what was going on. And because of this migration, uh, you had a lot of pressure on the government to do this outsourcing that's described in Built Up uh, to the private sector to build houses uh, you know, what we hear today, build, baby, build, get more supply because people need shelter. And, and so things like open space were subsumed to having as rapid a growth in shelter as possible. And, and today in high cost of living cities, such as Los Angeles and San Francisco, there's some uh, real sense in which the same thing is going on as was described in uh, London after the enclosures and, and later. Uh, you know, what, the, the attitude that we hear here, and, and you hear it in New York and other high cost of living cities, but now you're hearing it in places like Austin, is it's all about supply. And there isn't a discussion about uh, the externalities and open space externalities. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, one of the things that happened in London that, uh, uh, that Patrice describes is uh, the se mid 17th century, the plague and the great fire uh, really provided an opportunity for a reset. And, and it's not that dissimilar to the opportunity for a reset that we see today in a post COVID world where one can work more remotely uh, and we can redesign our cities around that. Uh, but we, you know, we have to keep in mind that, uh, that there is this tension between the private sector and the public sector. Uh, now in the rebuilding after the uh, great fire, uh, we saw things like Covenant Gardens and Queens Road. Uh, those have been described earlier, but they're really for wealthier L Londoners. And, and, uh, and you see that as well in the United States where you can, where developers are able to privatize open space and sell their uh, homes at a higher price because they can privatize that, that space, but it's not really for the general public. Uh, and, and when we think about this, you know, for, the, for an individual, uh, open space is monetized through the value of the land that they live on. Land closer to open spaces, uh, commands a premium over parcels further away. And that's just a you know, rent gradient that we see uh, in, in every city. And that was my earlier comment about uh, Los Angeles has a lot of open space and it's priced into uh, the price of land. And if it's priced into the price of land, a developer can't capture that because they have to pay for that uh, in their purchase of the land. So there's little a developer uh, can do in, in, in that sense. 
And, you know, it's also really difficult to capture the externality uh, by the private sector that is the widespread enjoyment, the social cohesion, and a sense of well being of the population at large that, that it gains from an open space. So, you know, when I go to the beach, for example, I enjoy being at the beach and I would be willing to pay for that enjoyment, but I don't really recognize that the other folks at the beach are also enjoying it and that is creating a social good. There's an externality there. And so I'm not really willing to pay for it because I don't recognize that benefit to myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so, you know, as I was reading through uh, the history of London, uh, I was thinking, how generalizable is this? Uh, it seemed clear that the privatization of development resulted in a suboptimal amount of open space in London, uh, but that might be idiosyncratic uh, as uh, other cities have different characteristics, the availability of open space uh, the presence of mountains, bodies of water, climatological conditions, and the sorting of land between residential and commercial use are, are just but a few. So is London and kind of the other examples uh, in uh, built up unique or is it generalizable? And, and what can we learn about that? Uh, so in that regard, uh, I wanted to look at the United States uh, and started with the following working hypothesis, that for cities where developers could incorporate open space, so these would be cities with uh, a large amount of flat land, uh, and, and they could build their housing around some central space, making it more costly for those outside of the development to use that open space. Uh, could they then capture the value of that open space to the renter or buyer? And that therefore the private sector would have an incentive to provide, if not the optimal amount of open space, at least near there. And, and then for cities uh, that would be, you know, where we have densification, it, it's really hard to, uh, to, to achieve that because if you put open space there, Anyone can use it. You have a lot of, uh, of people in buildings that are close to that. And so it is much more difficult to capture the value of the open space to the folks who are living in, in those uh, developments. So there should be you know, a, a real difference between cities such as, as Dallas and Los Angeles and New York in the amount of open space that's being provided uh, by private developers. Uh, and just as kind of a digression, you know, we know of uh, places like Newhall Ranch that's in Santa Clarita, California, where they specifically advertise, you know, come buy your home here because we have hiking trails and, and we have uh, bicycle trails and lots of open space. Uh, and, and so uh, in order to look at that, uh, what I did was put together some data uh, on uh, MSAs in the US, so these are um, uh, metropolitan areas, uh, and looked at some preliminary regressions. And so this is not an extensive study, but just really a data exploration exercise. And in, in that, uh, so I was looking at, uh, at the land form and the US Department of Agriculture has an index on that and comparing it to two measures. One is called park score, which is the amount of open space in, in, in a city. And the other is an estimate of the amount of loss of open space by development on the periphery uh, by city. And so that is uh, from the National Wildlife Federation. And you would expect, you know, what I just, uh, just said, that cities such as Dallas, where you where you have plenty of room to expand in Houston and the like, uh, that you would see uh, more open space and cities that are more constrained, you'd see less. But that wasn't the case. There was actually no correlation between, uh, between the two. Uh, and and uh, you know, looking at different ways of, of analyzing this data, 
you simply can't come up with any support for the theory that the private sector is providing uh, optimal open space, that it's very similar to the case of London and that uh, what uh, in, in Patrice's really amazing study of the history of development of real estate in London, uh, you know, points out there is generalizable, that you get suboptimal open space. And as a consequence of that, uh, you know, one has to think about development and, and in the context of, of uh, making cities more affordable, the public sector has a much greater role than uh, even though the public sector may be limited in uh, in its um, in its finances, it has a much greater role in providing for open space uh, in creating the kinds of cities that uh, urban planners and urbanologists uh, and, and I think we all know are going to be uh, much better places to live and to increase the overall utility of the residents of the city, uh, but. You know, there, there, there are some experiences that I think we need to uh, look at and have some uh, real skepticism about the way in which uh, that's achieved. Uh, and so one place to look um, is uh, Christine Miller's uh, description of what happened with the POPs program in New York. Uh, her book is Designs on the Public. And the POP system, so I think that's POP stands for privately owned public spaces. And so this was an incentive that changed zoning uh, so that developers who wanted to build higher, uh, developers who wanted to increase the value of their development could do so if they provided these privately owned public spaces. And, and many did that. But what you found over time was uh, the incentive for the owners of the buildings, particularly when the buildings were sold to a different owner, and, and so they didn't have the same energy in preserving that open space, the incentives were to privatize that open space. And, and uh, you know, for example, if you had some open space that you would walk through uh, in order to get into the building, by doing various things so that homeless people wouldn't come and sit in that space. And so that folks who are entering the building would have a better experience, uh, that would allow you to charge higher rents. And so this resulted in uh, these open spaces not being quite so open. So I think there's a real object lesson there that, uh, that the public sector has a much greater role than it has played in the past if we are gonna provide the optimal amount of public goods. And I'm only talking about open space. There are other public goods associated with the urban environment. And I think that, uh, it, you know, as, as I read through uh, Built Up, I, I see it in sort of many other dimensions, uh, but it is illustrative that uh, to create the optimal urban environment for the city's residents, one needs exactly what Patrice uh, was advocating in the last chapter of Built Up, a new model, a model that emphasizes the role of public goods in creating uh, a quality urban environment. And so with that, let me stop my remarks. Uh, Jerry, thank you very, very much. Uh, you don't need to stop. It was, we were, really uh, very engrossed uh, you know there's it's it's extremely hard to see and you've you presented that in your study there that you know case study is extremely hard to see how um, economic uh, benefits of of open space um, can be identified justified utilized and so on um, uh, and you know but once again you're also, uh, you know, pounding the table on the fact that we, we need it for a variety of things uh, uh, in terms of our human condition, uh, particularly within cities. So thank you very much for that. Richard, um, you got 
Great stuff, Jerry, and thanks for being part of this. Um, you know, it, it's really interesting because I remember when I met Jane Jacobs, um, she had one of my papers marked up by hand next to her rotary phone. And um, she said, outliers really matter. I remember her just focused on outliers. And, and I guess I keep thinking, I totally agree with your empirical results. I, and I, I find them fascinating, but th then I see like what happens with the Highline Park, right? And, you know, I know the founders of the Highline Park and they're very well-intentioned people concerned with inclusive development. They, are, they never, you know, they wanted to build a park which celebrated in their view, the gay male heritage of that neighborhood. And real estate investors and developers took great advantage of that. I mean, they saw the park coming, they saw the open space there, and they knew, maybe they didn't know quite to the extent they would gain from the availability to that open space, but they knew. And, and I guess this is the question. And, and now the Highline folks have set up not only their own organization, but a national organization to help open space folks not kind of figure out ways to gain some of the, potentially gain some of the financial upside that developers gain. So I guess that's the question I'm asking you. When, when we build these urban parks and public goods, why do we allow developers to capture all the benefit? And are there mechanisms for enabling some of that benefit, community development to be plowed back into the neighborhood or into other parts of the community? Uh, right, so I mean, the, the, the high line may be the exception that proves the rule. Um, and, and um, exactly. you know, because one of the things that was surprising, I expected San Francisco, okay. uh, and, and that's the metropolitan area, it's not just uh, the city and county of San Francisco, but San Francisco to be very different from Dallas in, in, yep. in this respect. And it's not. It's not. That's uh, and, and, and so that was a surprising uh, result. Is there a way for... Uh, the, the city to capture uh, these benefits? I, th I think the answer is yes, but you have to start off with, here's the amount of open space that we want to create the quality of life that we want for our citizens. You developers are, 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 are welcome to go ahead and build, but we are going to tax your building so that we have the funds to develop this open space. That if you do the opposite, like in the POPs program, then that space is privately owned. Yep. And over time, uh, it, it's going to be privatized. I mean, one of the one of the issues there is, you know, with, with the POPs program and other similar programs is enforcement. Yep. Uh, it, it, it's, it's all well and good, but those open spaces require maintenance and, and they require care and feeding. And once they're there, the city will ignore them because they're private. Mm. So I think that I have one more, is... more follow-up. Um, one of the things we see in the current post-COVID, emerging post-COVID environment is that open spaces in cities, um, which seem to have had a glory day, we want to build more of them, we want to figure out public-private partnerships to do that, they're a part of quality of life, they're a part of attracting talent. There is a, a beginnings of a reversal. You, you see it in New York with regard to Washington Square Park and other parks, which are now thought to be, you know, bastions of attracting a all night party crowd and disrupted to the neighborhood. You see it on Miami Beach on Ocean Drive, um, where the mayor just allowed cars back on Ocean Drive because he was concerned about disruption. You probably see it in parts of Los Angeles. I, I'm guessing like Venice Beach, you hear, the, you hear the tall tales, at least out here on the East Coast. I wonder if you see any of that, that there is a reversal um, in the regards of cities about, about open space, which used to be seen as a talent attractor now being a kind of a void that's being filled by, you know what I'm saying, less, in, in their words, not my words, less desirable elements, nighttime activity, urban disorder, that is uh, less desirable. Do you see any of that or sense any of that? Uh, you know, there, there, there definitely is, and, and particularly with respect to homeless encampments. Yep. So you referred to Venice Beach. And, yep. um, and, and, and there's a fairly sharp backlash against that. Yep. But to me, what that says is we are way below optimal open space. Huh. 
right? Because we're not we're not providing enough open space for teenagers to gather, for uh, yes. for seniors to gather, and so on. And so everyone is crowded into Washington Square or yes. Golden Gate Park or or Venice Beach, and and, and uh, so it's not that there's a problem with um, having open spaces, there's a problem with not ha having not enough open spaces. One thing, yes, Richard, you know, you did reference and, uh, and Derry spoke, you know, mentioned this, and it's not just the ownership of the public space, that's one thing, you know, that can be, uh, if, if it is owned and given to a municipality, a municipality often says, no, 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 we can't afford to manage it. We can't afford to operate it. And, and, and that's why I say that the very, one of the key things about Covent Garden was that not only did Bedford provide this open space, but also dedicated the rent revenues yeah. from three of the houses to support the open space and the church. And the church was made responsible for the administration and maintenance for that public space. So there was a distinct understanding that it's, you know, real estate once again has no value or is no good to anyone if it's not uh, able to be utilized in the, you know, in the desired manner. And that is as a place, a safe place, an inclusive place, uh, you know, and so on. And um, an example in recent times here uh, in New York was Domino Park. The Domino Sugar mm -hmm. Factory was developed by Two Trees. They gave a they they took a, a waterfront portion of their uh, of their land and has made it a public park. Not only did did they make it o totally open to the public, you would never think it was private land, which it remains. But they also spend 0.9 million dollars on operating and you know managing and maintaining this park every year. The fact that they can weave that in to their economic evaluation of their development project and its long-term uh, economic viability and so on, I think provides hope that there is, uh, there is something important happening there. Uh, but we do have to, we can't just talk about uh, uh, the space without talking about its operation maintenance. And as you say, through the POPS, the POPS were coming in with the operational budget on top of the publicly owned land, which once again is a necessary combination. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. And here in California, we have a nonprofit organization that um, that takes the so the state and, and and the cities will give open space land to this organization, and its only purpose is maintaining the properties, and it has a source of revenue from the state. And so that takes it out of kind of the each municipality's budget fight every year. Mm, mm. And, you know, the, it, it has a dedicated mission. But I think we have to, you know, we have to think through these uh, these things in order to uh, make sure that they're not unintended consequences. Okay, um, might I um, just interject a little bit of comparative um, economics? Um, so I've lived in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, South Shire, Chicago, Pittsburgh, wonderful places, mm -hmm. historical places, history, um, full of parks, at least parks in the inner city areas or inner city sounds a little bit not quite right, but certainly um, within the beltway networks that surround the cities and um, so history matters a lot, actually, for American cities in terms of provision of open space, and they matter a hell of a lot for the UK uh, because, again, you know, look at central London. You know, it's full of parks, but the parks weren't made in the 19th century. Parks were there and been kept, and some of the parks, of course, owned by the Crown Estate. Um, the question is... Why, and, and the UK has kept a heritage of um, parks, although more or less good, depending on the new development. Is it that in the US that the issue is confounded by the fact that you're building housing 
for relatively lower income to higher income. That's the mass housing building market. And there is an issue of disposable income, which is the justification for not providing parks because you're sort of filling up the available space with a house or houses and a park would be in a sense an added cost to the sale price of the existing homes. Is it that it's an income problem that American cities, ex-urban cities, are the cities they are, in, or is it an unwillingness to tax property developers? And what would then be the basis for unwillingness to tax property developers? You've got all of 30 seconds to answer. Okay, so I think it is both. Property developers are politically very powerful. Yeah. And, 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 and they don't want to be taxed. And the argument that they make is, if you tax us, we will have to raise the price. And we're okay. trying to provide housing for middle-income Americans, and we're going to have to build luxury housing. Right, uh, okay. So, so then you agree with me, it's actually partly of the explanation is the income of the purchaser mm -hmm. uh, that makes all the difference. Thank you very much, Jerry. But also, also, Gordon, if I could add... One thing that I point out in the book, you know, Jerry said real estate developers are very powerful and they work hard to maintain that power, particularly with respect to municipalities. The question is, why did they become that way? Right? Sure. You know, they just didn't get up and say, well, I'm going to throw all my money at, you know, local politicians. But what, you know, I describe in the book is, you know, how immediately they realized this connection to local politics was critical. Right. For their success and yeah. you know, well, it didn't begin also, also in the uk you know well, uh, right. property developers are very influential in the conservative government throughout the, the world in china in china right. yeah. 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 okay enough enough <laughs> jerry really interesting we're talking too much thanks for contributing thank both you jerry. written and also your presentation very helpful okay richard g richard green we're just full of Richards today, aren't we? <laughs> is there too and many? Is it, I noticed past speakers have, I prepared slides. Is that all right? That's all right. Off you go. Or am I supposed perfect. to just talk? No, you've got no, to no, share no. screen. You, you can do whatever you like. You, all you're, right. Okay. You're between us and drinks. Because so. what, what uh, I wanted to prove to you, even though I'm an economist, I'm not necessarily a Philistine. <laughs> Although you may you may decide that I'm Philistine at the end of this. No, 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 I no, no. no. We started with like... an economist who claimed not to be a Philistine. So, you know, Richard. Yeah, they... I know who that economist was. It was. I, I, and forgive me, I did not get up at five in the morning to listen to him. And 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 so you'll be able to me. watch the rerun. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, well, again, thank I'll you go, very Richard. much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm not sure why I was invited here. I don't know that I'm particularly competent to comment on this book, uh, but I'll try my best anyway. And it will be from the, the perspective of an economist. And it will be from the perspective of someone who thinks there are tools in economics that can be very helpful to achieving some of the aims that are described in the book that are not used as well as they should. And, and to some extent, the, the conversations uh, from Professor Weber and from my friend Jerry uh, pointed in that direction, I think. Um, I will say this, first of all, Patrice, thank you very much for sending me an actual copy of the book. Um, because I, I really wasn't expecting you to buy me one. I just figured Columbia has money and they could send me one. Uh, but it is, it's a beautiful book. And I'm not saying that in the sense of, oh, I got to find something nice to say. So I'll say it's beautiful. It really is uh, aesthetically a very wonderful thing to read through. And uh, because of that inspired me in this presentation to share pictures instead of, I don't think I have an equation. I have a couple of graphs, but I don't have any, I, I, I have a, quite a lot of pictures. And, and I'm gonna divide my comments sort of into three. I wanna talk a little bit about London. I don't know anyone who doesn't like London. Uh, I, I, but, but that's also kind of a problem with making it an example is it really is, uh, I mean, Richard F. talked about Jane Jacobs and you've got to pay attention to the outlier as well. If any city in the world 
is an outlier in many, many dimensions. It is London. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I think is really important in here from a real estate teaching perspective, real estate education perspective. And then I want to talk a little bit about some economic policies. And I am going to, and I'm going to focus a lot on the last chapter of the book, which is about criticisms of the development process. And I'm going to say something that's going to get me into trouble with the place I used to teach, uh, which is the, I taught at the University of Wisconsin Madison for many years. And while Jim Grasscamp was an inspiring and in many ways admirable person, I think he actually uh, was part of a tradition that in many ways led to some pretty bad outcomes. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. All right. So uh, I can't help, you know, thinking about London is fun, but I just a couple of quotes from a couple of my favorite uh, pieces about London uh, from Pip and Great Expectations. Um, after this escape, I was content to take a foggy view of the inn through the windows and crusting dirt and to stand dolefully looking out saying to myself that London was decidedly overrated. So, and, and of course, Dickens, his love of London comes through his novels, but he had a very also um, keen eye about its limitations and its problems. And it's what made Dickens such a magnificent writer is, is he could describe vividly the complexity that was London at it, it, during his time so well. And then from my all-time favorite musical, Sweeney Todd, um, this is the more uh, PG-rated quote about it. There's a hole in the world like a great black pit and the vermin of the world inhabit it and the morals aren't worth what a pig could spit and it goes by the name of London. So that was sort of London reflected in the mid 19th century, right? But whatever the development process has been since then, however, good or bad in a sense one could say it is, London has done pretty darn well. So I, on the left is, and I'm sure everybody in the room knows this, is, this is my favorite part of London is on the left is Bloomsbury. And may, maybe the reason for that is I'm an enormous fan of John Maynard Keynes. And actually this picture doesn't do Bloomsbury justice because the sky is blue in this picture. And I actually think Bloomsbury is at its best when you have a misty rain, a little bit of fog, the street shimmer. Um, it's a really beautiful place. And of course, on the right is Covent Garden, which one of the things is so interesting is it's been repurposed many times since its original development with different uses inside of it. And yet it continues to be, um, you know, there are periods when it's been better, there have been periods when it's been worse but a, a central gathering place in London that works pretty well. And the other thing about London, and I, 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 to me, this is the most important indicator of how good a place is to live. If I could use only one statistic, it is life expectancy. And if you look at life expectancy in London from the late 18th century through what I will call the point where the industrial revolution really got going, um, the Metropolitan Line uh, opened in 1850, which basically transformed how London could develop as a city. That was a little before things started to take off, but by 1875, boy, we start to see that really strong upward trend in life expectancy. World War I and uh, the Spanish flu, of course, interrupting that trend. And now um, COVID and drug dependency are creating a I mean, not that sharp downward phenomenon we suffer from World War II, but, but really problematic. But nevertheless, I think we need to appreciate how much better things are now in a very important way. You know, we think every year of life has some value to it from 150 years, 170 years ago. So, okay. Uh, two of the problems that, you know, developers in London faced um, that Patrice brings out in her book that are, are remain difficult for us to come to grips with uh, are for the, the problem of land use succession. And this is one of the places in the world that actually allows it to happen. The, this is the HSBC headquarters on the left before um, the Foster HSBC headquarters succeeded at same location. Look at that building on the left. That looks like a pretty much a fortress building that's never going to get torn down. Um, but given the density levels in Hong Kong, it didn't make sense economically for that building to remain in that place. And so 
it was torn down. And, and the problem is if I had scaled this right, uh, if I had the pictures reflect the size of the building, the one on the left would be, I don't know, about a fifth the size that it is compared to the one on the right. The one on the left is not even 20 stories tall. The one on the right is well over a thousand feet tall. People, sometimes economic pressures really do tell you, give you the right answer, which it is, is time to do something different with this property. And convincing others, and developers had a hard time in Patrice's book, convincing lenders, investors, et cetera, that it was time to transform farmland, agrarian land on the edge of London into urban land is a problem that remains. People want things to remain as they were, even if what was is not very productive anymore. And something I find remarkable about Hong Kong is it still has land zoned for industrial use. The government is hanging on to the idea that maybe manufacturing can come back to Hong Kong someday. It's not going to happen. It's too expensive to do it there. And so using that sort of romantic view of the past as a way to prevent the development of, and I'm going to come back to this phrase, highest and best use, I, I think is, is misplaced and was so 300 years ago. The other thing, the thing I really liked in the book and, and um, it is absolutely relevant today is relying on discounted cash flow as a mechanism for determining use. And I've become a person who in general prefers just income capitalization to determining what to do right now, because at least then there's lots and lots of market signals forecasting for you. Whereas when you use a DCF model, um, you're making forecasts about values in 10 years and about discount rates in 10 years, things that you can't possibly know about. And on the, the left, I have the history of 10 year, um, I'm sorry, on the left, I have the history of commercial property values in the United States going back to uh, the 1950s. As you can see, it's quite volatile. And on the right um, is the 10 year treasury maturity, just going back nine years. And you can see it's also quite volatile. And one of the things about real estate is it has lots of what we call duration in finance. And the thing about duration is it means its value will be very sensitive to changes in interest rates. But you can see in just the past four years, we have a 200 basis point swings in interest rates, that long-term interest rates, that's actually a pretty modest swing by historical standards. But basically that means if you're looking at a 10 year horizon, you get a 20% swing in value based on that two percentage point change in interest rates. So the problem with DCF, I think, is it lends a patina of scientific respectability to what people are doing where there is nothing scientific about it um, because we don't know the parameters. We don't know the appropriate parameters going forward, and we should be modest enough to accept just sort of what the market is telling us at the moment when we're looking at cap rates. We can argue they're too low or they're too high, a little bit here and there, but in general, that makes more sense. The, the only place for DCF, in my view, is if you are acquiring a building and you have a bunch of leases expiring during the time that you plan on holding it, of course, you need to think about that from a risk management standpoint. You want to identify that. But yeah, I think uh, let's do a static analysis, less dynamic analysis when we're making these decisions. All right. I want to move on to, and I can see I'm running out of time already. Um, you know, imperfections with the development process. Well, you know, I've heard Ricardo already mentioned. I don't know if Henry George has been mentioned yet by a, a previous speaker. Uh, I looked through the book for Henry George. I think Henry George certainly didn't get everything right, but he had very useful things to say about this problem of the, the monopolist owning land. But there are some correctives to that from economics. On the left, you have um, uh, Frank Plumpton Ramsey, who is one of the great economists of uh, the early part of the last century. He died at age 28 being as one of the most productive economists of his time. And he had this idea called the Ramsey tax, which is it taxing inelastic things is an efficient thing to do. And land is, by its very nature, particularly well-located land, is inelastically supplied. And as a consequence, let's go after that. Um, and Henry George said, let's do that with the Henry George tax, which is about you apply taxes to property, to land, but not to improvements. Now, I think that's naive because I don't know exactly how you measure one and the other always, but nevertheless, I think the principle is the correct one. And on the right, 
was William Alonzo, who wrote um, The Competitive Theory of the Land Market, which pointed out that if you don't allow people to have concessions in lots and lots and lots of applications, not all of them, you actually do get quite a lot of competition in property markets. And so you don't have these Ricardian rents as a result of that. And very often what I see through the regulatory pro process is effectively the creation of concessions that lead to the possibility of these monopoly positions in the property market. Um, uh, beyond Ramsey taxes, something I love is value capture. And this is not a um, sort of theoretical construct. There's a place in the world that, where it's done really well, which is Hong Kong. And basically what they do is they put property out to bid in auctions. There's a reservation price so that if the highest auction value bid is not sufficient to deal with the infrastructure necessary to support Hong Kong. And by the way, that infrastructure includes subsidy for housing for lower income residents of Hong Kong, but it's also, this is the MRT, one of the most magnificent transit systems in the world. Don't give property away. And in the context of an American city, don't give entitlements away. So here in LA, we are under zoned. We need to be zoned more densely. But instead of just deciding this developer gets more density, but that developer doesn't, auction off development rights, auction off air rights, and use that as a mechanism for returning that property value increase that happens from the development rights and put it into things like housing subsidies, transit, parks, et cetera. I think this is a much more sensible thing to do than community benefits. My problem with community benefits is I see the money gets given to people and I don't know actually what happens to the money. I don't know how the community benefits from it. But you put it in a metro line or you put it in a BRT or you give people vouchers for housing, then I think you have something that is tangible and useful to the people who are surrounded by um, or nearby to the property that is developed. Uh, Okay. Pollution, obviously, there are a lot of externalities involved. And again, it's, so I like Pagu. Let's let, um, let's tax externalities. Again, I think we know how to do it. I'm a big fan of carbon taxes. Why we're not spending 80 bucks a pound on carbon emission is something I don't know, uh, but we're not. But, but that would certainly change the shape of cities and, and go a long way toward making them more environmentally sustainable. And that said, of course, in general cities, you know, to the extent you keep people from living in cities, you're worsening the planet, right? It, to the extent you're restricting the ability of people to move into cities, you are not living lightly on the earth. You're making the earth worse off. And one of the ironies is when cities become regulated, you have more greenfield development, which is environmentally work. And on, on the right, and when you have um, uh, arguments over how to use property, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is Crocker's spite fence. To uh, he, he couldn't acquire a neighbor's property. And so he decided to basically put a fence around it that kept it from getting any sunlight and can't allow that sort of externality to, to happen. All right, um, I'm going very fast. I, I just want to start with how planning is part of the problem. And Jane Jacobs and uh, Ellen Berto wrote a wonderful book called Order Without Design uh, about the development of cities as organic instruments and I highly recommend it, but I, I want to finish because I'm running, I'm out of time already, but the, the, um, in her book, Patrice talks a lot about rethinking the highest and best use. And, and she refers to James Grasscamp, who talks about most probable and fitting use. And here's where I have a problem with that is it leads people to claim that things are externalities when they're not externalities at all. And if we go back to this Wisconsin tradition of urban led economics, it's one rooted in Richard E. Lee and John R. Commons, who were, among other things, eugenicists, and led to a movement that proclaimed that you wanted to keep people of certain races and ethnicities out of certain neighborhoods within cities. This was followed up by Homer Hoyt um, with his um, dissertation at the University of Chicago, 100 years of land in Chicago, 100 years of land values in Chicago, and he, who he wrote the FHA manual that specifically maintained that places that permitted African-Americans, um, Mexicans, and my favorite category, because I would have pit, fit Russian Jews of the lower class from living in particular cities, um, because th they were not considered fitting. 
people. And, and Graskamp didn't do this himself at all, and I wouldn't want to imply that he did, but he came out of a tradition that countenanced the idea you had to basically manage the kind of people who were living cheek by jowl with each other. And that's really problematic. And people use the externality argument as an argument of exclusion. It's why I was thrilled when Minneapolis got rid of its single family zoning, making the argument that zoning had been used as an instrument of exclusion for many years. And so I want to finish with just a little trivia question, which is, I wonder if anyone knows the large American city with a substantial African-American population that is the most racially integrated is measured by the similarity index. And I don't know if anyone wants to guess, I, I guess I could just say. And the answer is Dallas, Texas. Okay, the, the most, the least segregated city in America, large city is actually San Francisco, but basically it's lost all of its African-American residents. It's 5% African, so I don't think it really counts. Um, Dallas is a, about 20% African-American. If you look at its dissimilarity index, it does far better than cities that purport themselves to be much more progressive. And Dallas is a city in which it is pretty easy to build. And I think there's something to be learned from that. And I have gone on too long. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Not at all, Richard. No, not, not too long at all. But thank you very, very much for that. I truly, truly appreciate, you know, the, uh, the macroeconomics and uh, these, these aspects are, are central to what real estate uh, is about, can do, and is able to utilise uh, in its role within urban areas and society and so on. And so I very much appreciate your, your coming in strongly and, and talking about, you know, let's not get too fuzzy on, you know, what is really driving these things here. Um, and, you know, and, and you're absolutely right, raising the notion of, you know, are there, are there things which we falsely categorise as externalities, which in the end aren't, they're part of what we actually do, they're not external. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we, so where's our responsibility for them? Um, I think that, you know, we could look, we, we, unfortunately, we don't have James Grasscamp camp around with us these days, but, uh, you know, we could, we could certainly spend some good time, you know, talking through how he saw things. And he was of an era, you're right, he was of that, coming out of that 60s, 70s, 80s era where, the notion of urban planners defining how cities should be and who should be there and how they should be, you know, was was definitely still a force uh, of uh, of the urban uh, evolution. Um, I think he, you know, one thing he was trying to say when he th said, you know, probable and fitting was, um, yes, the planners uh, would have their say, but he also did concede that it wasn't just an economic, a purely economic decision, but you did have political salience, you did have community issues, community concerns, and so on, coming into way on these things and whether they would impact it. So, um, but thank you very, very much for that. It's, you know, it, I love the way it goes back and forth between social concerns, macroeconomic issues and so on. And I'll, I will send you Larry's little snippet uh, so you can see how you're providing a wonderful bookend to his uh, launch this morning. But thank you, um, Richard. Well, Richard, it's great to see you. It's been it's always been, good to see you, Richard. It's been far too long. It's been far, far too long. It's great to see you, and I know you're in your you're in your actual office. I know your office, so that's particularly nice. I I don't think I'm not in Toronto, but I don't think we're still we may be allowed back, but it would be just the beginnings of us being allowed back. Um, it's it's interesting. Some you you were not the only person to use slides. Someone this morning had a very wonderful slide deck. Um, and I, I, I sent to you in the chat, I mentioned Henry George. And I, I would just like your reaction to the comment I made on, on Patricia's wonderful book, because I said she's done a great job of bringing real estate back, back into urban theory. And in a way, her book reminds me of Henry George. And, and I contrasted George and Marx. And I said that where Marx denigrated real estate, thought, and he actually denigrated George, there's correspondence of him denigrating George. Uh, he saw the world as, as pit, the modern world, his modern world, the industrial world, pit against capitalists and laborers, and the capitalists made off with the surplus. George, not only in Progress and Poverty, but in that wonderful pamphlet on whatever it was, on land or something, wherever it yeah, was. Yeah, I think it was called On Land. Yeah, The empirical one. 
he kind of says, no, 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 no. There are three classes. There are capitalists and workers, and there's these people called landlords. And, and indeed, the last one is the one who runs off with the surplus produced by the former two. And it kind of reminds me of today. Like, like so much of the wealth that's being produced is sort of just finding its way back to land prices. Um, and it's, it, they're surging all over the country. You know, I'm talking to you from Miami Beach where prices are up. We, Austin, we can go down the list. You know, I just wondered what you thought about this conceptually. And also not just with regard to those two. You have a great sense of economic history with regard to other contributions in economics and land economics. How to, how to think about that issue of who's making off with the surplus? Yeah, so, so I think a, a couple of things. One is just the world is awash in savings right now and it needs to, <laughs> it needs to show up somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And I think that reflects the fact that we're aging as a, anyone with mo- any society with money is aging yeah. and the places that are young don't have any money yep. and old people are afraid of running out of money. So they say, so ironically you'd think, Hey, I'm only going to live five years, might as well party on, but that's not how actually people behave is, is, mm-hmm. is they save. Um, and so they need, a, the, you know, any, any elastic repository yep. is something that is a natural place for money to go. But, I do think this inelasticity is created in part by the political process and particularly by, so I don't object to regulate land use regulation per se. Um, What I object to is when it is bespoke and untransparent and political. And let's talk about two places, let's talk about Los Angeles where I am, let's talk a little bit about London on that. So here in LA, basically all new zoning is spot zoning which means everybody is competing for the politician and they're giving political contributions and so on. And, but if they get it, if they get the entitlement, they get an enormous windfall, which leads them to have an enormous incentive to bribe city council people. And it gives city council people an enormous uh, incentive to accept bribes. And again, this is not, um, uh, um, hypothetical is we've had three of the 15 city council people in Los Angeles indicted by the FBI over the course of the last two to three years. And it always revolves around land dealings somehow. Uh, So I think if you have a transparent process that allows for the change in use, and that's why I like auctions. And again, this is not a hypothetical. They do this in Hong Kong. They do it in Singapore. It actually, I think it works. It gets the money, also government more money than other, um, mechanisms. The other thing is I'm a big fan of property taxes. And I look at Texas and, you know, people here in California yell at me for saying nice things about Texas, but and there's stuff about Texas I think is awful, but they rely very heavily on pure ad valorem property taxes for raising money. And I think that does a really good job of basically capturing most of those land rents, maybe not all of them, but a, but a good share of them. In London, I think one of the issues is, and this stunned me, but I learned that there was no zoning in London. And that doesn't didn't mean that people could do whatever they want. It meant that people needed permission to do anything, including like fen- refenestering a building. And so that gives enormous opportunities for mischief. That gives enormous opportunity for monopoly. Uh, and, and so that's why the Alonzo point about making the land market as competitive as possible is another important element of this. Very true. And, uh, you know, competition uh, is also a way into having, um, to stopping exclusion and allow much more inclusionary entrance of people and so on. So, um, Gordon. Um, Yeah, look, Richard, uh, Richard Green. Um, it was it was great to hear you give your presentation, not least to which to talk about Bill Alonzo. So that was uh, that was a blast from the past. Which and I was a faculty member with him, and um, I thought he was a really well an imaginative guy who who did excellent urban economics. And there was a, it was it was a funny, but some some of the brethren. Your, your brethren sort of cast him a little bit as a, as a sociologist, uh, sort of running in guys. But um, no, he was a very imaginative guy about land and land uh, pricing and these types of things. So that was, that was excellent. About London, 
and actually the UK in general. Um, if we wanted to put a shed at the bottom of our garden, uh, we would have to go to the city council in Oxford and get permission. And they would say, yes, you could do that, but look, this is what it has to look like. Oh, by the way, it can't have running water or sewerage. Um, it can't actually, it can be insulated, but it can't, in a sense, be permanent, you know, so... So it's and and this person will come around and actually look over your shoulder as it's being built and say, mm, oh no, this doesn't really. So there's that level of intrusion. As you say, it's not zoning, but it is actually land use regulation against norms rather than standards that are sort of set out in concrete, so to speak. And it's a very interesting thing to watch. And I get really irritated at times because we put a big skylight in. And we wanted a big glass canopy. Oh, you can't do that. You've got too much glass. What? How can you have too much glass in, in, in England? But anyway, um, these things are important, but they also go to a really fundamental issue. That is the relationship between the form that regulation takes and the choice of that form and then what you want to achieve for society. And you and Jerry are beating the drum properly so, I think, about not just what is the form of the city, but its equity consequences. And then if you sort of take that a little bit further, green space, a living organism of a city as opposed to something simply built around tarmac and lines on a road. So I really value your presentation. And, and I think in lots of ways, you've sort of captured uh, Patrice's sort of big agenda, because Patrice has written a book that's big. It isn't Bill Alonso doing a, a, a sort of handbook on, on yeah. Heavy. Yeah, heavy. That's heavy as well. Bill's books were small. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, look, don't, it's valuable. Don't, don't throw it around. No, no, it's no, 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 no. I was doing, I was doing, I was weightlifting with it. No, of yeah, course. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I hope I can get a signed copy at some point. Yeah, no. A doorstop. <laughs> Weight lift, many uses. Enjoy. <laughs> so, thank you, Richard Green. Very, very helpful. And Can I say, it, it was a continue. pleasure, you know, uh, just quickly on Alon. So, it was fun to have to write something, although I, I'm, I'm a little annoyed that I had to keep it to 2,000 words. That huh. were, were, I think almost all of, I think Alonso might be my most recent reference from 1961 or something like yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, 64 was is the book. Mm. So, I know. There you go. Those were the days. Okay. I think Patrice is over to you. Oh, thank turn? you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. No, it's definitely not my turn. I feel um, I feel very indebted and um, and as I say, you know, really humbled by this uh, array of scholars and and the the fascinating insights that. Uh, the scholars have provided uh, that they've sparked in terms of additional uh, comments uh, by other speakers, uh, questions from the floor, uh, and so on. So one thing I just would like to do before I uh, do some final comments is ask if there's anyone, uh, any of one of, from our audience, who would like to throw a question into the mix at this stage. Um, appreciating that, you know, many people are weary. We're in between, we're keeping people between their uh, various uh, after work activities on a Friday evening. But uh, is there anybody who'd like to chime in? Uh, Richard Green to Kendra wants to say um, a welcome to Kendra Stenson. Stenson, wonderful. Great to see you. Uh, uh, Kendra, Stenfin, and, uh, you know, to have Richard Green be able to speak to you over these, you know, across the years, across the geographies uh, as part of this. So that just indicates uh, how many folks we've had come in from all, uh, all different perspectives. And that's been the key. Um, so perhaps uh, if there's no more questions, uh, what I... I, I wanted to continue that and say, you know, that driving my exploration 
uh, of this book was to understand all of the many details, the nuances, uh, the contradictions, the, the frisson, uh, that is part of this process of how the built environment uh, is envisioned and delivered for us in our cities globally now. Um, and as I said, the uh, utilisation of the model has expanded from the, that Anglo-American beginnings, uh, you know, to now being uh, adopted uh, through many parts of the world. Um, I, I thought, so... Uh, I, I was interested, uh, but, you know, what made me think it was worthy of a book was how many other people, how many people are just generally interested in real estate and whether it is uh, speaking about their uh, apartments between Toronto and Miami as per uh, our Richard Florida and, um, and the changing pricing uh, that occurs during our holding periods and so on uh, to what it means for us status wise. Uh, it means in terms of economic security. Uh, it means in terms of inclusion or exclusion from communities. This is what occupies you know, many, many people and probably all of us uh, in many ways. So I thought you know, to really explore how, how this gets delivered was uh, worthy because of that broad general popular interest. Um, what today's symposium has done, and, and you know, I, as I say, I'm, I'm overwhelmed and, and very, very, uh, very, very grateful was how many areas of scholarship um, can adopt, you know, what I provide in terms of this exploration of this real estate development process can adopt it into their critical uh, and important areas of, uh, of, of research on the human condition as a generality. We're all concerned essentially with our human condition. And uh, for instance, these speakers today, and I'm just going to uh, run through and thank them all. Uh, firstly, our Gordon Clark, um, someone I've just known and respected enormously over, over many, many years, um, who, who has led the way and perhaps probably influenced my thinking in terms of constantly relating what happens in our economic world uh, to the impacts on society, on communities, on, on people and so on. And he has taken this uh, to talk about the rise of institutional capitalism, of course, and the, you know, the challenges for responsibility that come with that um, and, you know, and, and how it then works back to being a responsibility for real estate, its production, its ownership, its management and the occupation of it. Um, and then Richard Flora, my, uh, the co-host of today, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Richard, of course, is well known for having, having, uh, having spurred our interest and understanding in, in actually how people live. Who are the people who live in cities? Who are the people who thrive in cities? Why do people want to do that? And why do they want to be there? And, uh, and of course, you know, to, to be able to... Um, contributed a little to his discussion of that about that behavior and the clustering and how things uh, how things play out um, offering you know some of the economic or the financial understanding behind that um, I'm really grateful to Richard for uh, including that thank you um, Larry Summers of course uh, you know is uh, has a macro view of the world uh, and uh, but he and uh, you know his tradition, his family tradition, has been one of um, economic behavior, and uh, of course you know to talk about how real estate uh, shapes us and how we shape our world, uh, you know, was a very very nice compliment, and you know in in support of the book, I appreciate that. Uh, of course, it makes me feel even more responsible for trying to get this right. Uh, but um, uh, uh, Manuel Albers, uh, who has also been at Columbia uh, University um, and done his studies uh, early on and has really made an impact now in talking about how this financialization, we heard it many times today, how the financialization, the players, the financial players, the capital players all over the world are affecting how decisions are made because they are influencing decisions that were once just sort of qualitative aspects of our human condition, uh, they're financializing it. They're turning it into a financial metric 
and therefore changing the way in which it's incorporated. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for Manuel for including that um, and, and linking, uh, real, you know, uh, appreciating and, and pointing out how I'm, I'm in reintroducing real estate into that discussion that he, he, uh, he leads on labour and capital. Um, and of course, Derek uh, Wojcik is, you know, so well known uh, for looking at uh, these, um, you know, the, the sort of economic, uh, financial economic, finan economic geographies and so on of the world. And uh, to include real estate into his discussion um, of, of that and, and the total economy um, you know, thank you very, very much. Um, you can see it so much, so much more clearly than I. But it does, it does make me feel uh, very, very uh, interested in pursuing this with rigor. Um, Janelle reminded us. Janelle Knox Hayes, of course, reminded us that when we're talking about real estate, we're talking about people and their conditions, and reminding us that that condition. Is, uh, is particularly pertinent to people who are Indigenous landowners uh, and all of those who are vulnerable to the problems of climate change and how it will affect our relationship to our land, our real estate, and so on. So, Janelle, um, thank you very much for including me into that and, and really then launching the discussion of climate change and the pandemic and our, you know, our health and our social uh, situation, uh, which Sam picked up on, and uh, you know, linked once again the the, the question of the pandemic uh, through to notions of urban density, and reminded us or warned us not to just make a very simplistic, an overly simplistic and er erroneous um, a translation of pandemic to density, but to look at actually what we do as human beings in terms of, once again, our economic behaviour, how we actually build our buildings, how we create spaces between ourselves and so on, uh, that is the intermediary between the pandemic and, and the density of the urban city. Uh, and Rick Pizer, whom, as I said, uh, you know, has had inspired me about the education of future real estate developers um, and, you know, uh, for, for Rick to be working, continuing to work with this question of urban sprawl, the dynamics, the back and forth between uh, urban centres and urban outlying areas and what it means uh, to how our environments uh, are managed and, and support communities or don't support communities. Um, that was very, very, very uh, pertinent, I think. Um, and of course, Rachel Weber, who is, um, you know, who has had my uh, um, most profoundest um, recognition for her incisiveness. I mean, she is the one who just really zeroes in with a laser beam on developers and what they're doing and how they're acting in the city. Uh, in urban construction and talks about the things that are motivating them uh, and, you know, the, and, and helps me uh, understand the difference between the provision of shelter as, a, you know, a, a, a very valid professional and, and economic activity within a community, the provision for shelter for a decent economic reward, uh, and that is what we could call enterprise, to going too far with that and raising the notion of speculative self-interest uh, and how that, that begins to undermine the whole productive process. Um, so, Rachel, thank you very much. And, and of course, then, you know, Ashby uh, takes it further to say, uh, you know, it's real estate is a perfect manifestation of all the problems of climate change. Uh, it's it's there. It's fixed. It's suffering. It's vulnerable, and uh, you know if we can use it as a sort of uh, you know as as a proxy for ourselves and and what's going to happen to us um, by looking at the financial impact on buildings uh, with respect to um, ignoring uh, the building for resiliency and and environmental conditions, um, then you know that's uh, you know that's obviously a, a going to be an important. Uh, role for understanding real estate, um, which cannot be 
anything uh, removed from from the climate and the impact of climate, um, and and one and not only climate but even specifically that open space. Um, I'm really grateful to Jerry uh, for Jerry Nickelberg for reminding us that you know the question of open space is something that we all think just a knee jerk reaction. We've got to have. We've got to have it, and it's got to be there, and so on. But how does it? How does it? How is it? How does it appear? Who looks after it? Who? What does it? What impact does it really have? And so on. And the details of that are much more complex. And of course, you know that was followed up by by Richard Green, who reminded us that you know some things, some external externalities, and you know we can give macroeconomists full credit for this for really not taking the notion of uh, externalities uh, at face value, but rigorously checking to see what can be regarded as such and what, what can be responsible for such. So such a tremendous input by so many people today. Uh, I'm very, very grateful. Um, hopefully the discussion uh, around the book, uh, the book itself, will continue to uh, drive some interest and thought and discussion about all of the things that impact our built environment and, and our human condition within it. Um, I want to thank my students, of course, who over these years have, uh, have asked the hard questions and have refused to take pat answers and really were uh, the compelling force for doing this book. If this book and its discussion continues to inspire them, then it has been worth every minute of the writing of it. Thank you once again to our hosts and to all our fabulous speakers for being here. Thank you, thank you. I'm honoured and sincerely very, very grateful. Richard? Well, th thank, thank you, Patrice. And thank you, Gordon. And uh, thanks to all of our contributors. I. I don't think that I have anything additional to add and it's Friday afternoon other than what I've already said. Um, but it just to echo, I think, which we heard from every single presenter, it's a landmark achievement. It's a magistral work of history. It synthesizes that work of history in the context of urban theory. And on top of that, it's beautifully done. It's, it's just a beautiful book. And so most of all, I just want to convey my congratulations to you, Patrice. And I guess we've known each other for, for a long time, brought together by Gordon. And I, and I hope I really get to see you in, in, in person soon. And I would say that for all of our, our participants, I, I'm now up and around and traveling um, again a little bit. And uh, I'm paying the price with back and shoulder ailments. It's funny, which my, my physiotherapist said, you haven't done this for 20 months. And it's no, no wonder, you know, you've been exercising, you've been doing all these things, but you're back. So be careful when you get back to travel. Um, but I, I hope to be able to see each and every one of you and Patrice, particularly you, and to congratulate you in person in, in, in New York City again. Thank you so much for such a marvelous contribution. So Patrice, um, this, this started off as um, an idea rather than a fact of matter. And um, I think I was taken by the sheer scale and significance of the book and um, it's been uh, ast astonishing achievements and you should be very proud indeed of what you've accomplished. I think I've been very impressed by the commentary that's been presented today, um, not least of which they've engaged with your book in a detailed way and a sort of a, in a conceptual way they'd marveled at your history. So, so that, that doesn't happen that much in academic life. Um, and, um, you know, it's a hell of a compliment for the, for the book that you've written. The, um, the other thing is all of us have got sort of an angle on the book. And um, it's been great to hear some of those angles. You know, I... Um, I was very impressed by each one for their specifics, if you like, and their take and the confidence in which that their take is presented. You know, they're not intimidated by your book. They learn from your book, but they've also built on your book. And that hasn't come a big compliment from that. So just to 
last sort of points of organization. Um, we will be back in contact with all the contributors um, if they're on the line or still still listening in, but we will be basically collecting the final drafts of the commentaries. I guess, Patrice, you will um, either make them available when they're complete or when they're final. Um, but equally, these commentaries are going to be part of a, a uh, be published in Environment Planning A um, when they're sort of complete and full. And that's, I think, also going to be something to watch and look for as well, because in lots of ways, the written commentaries, they sort of go deep and, and are interesting in their own right that go well beyond actually what has been presented today. So in my, my world, it's 10 to 8, that is 10 to 8 p.m. Uh, in London time. And um, I'm, I'm sort of keen to um, finish the last uh, couple of chips on my fish and chips and um, have and a... I hope something, you know, nice and red and, you know, yeah. that goes down smoothly will accompany that. Yes, yeah, so, and, and I must say... Again, to thank Richard Florida, because um, between the two of us, uh, we, we really been able to put together speakers and ideas here that I don't think um, by ourselves we could have possibly done. So I think, you uh, have, you have, you and you know, you. if you think you know, the trio began many, many years ago. We're not going to give yeah. them, yeah. but uh, thank you to come around and recircle back with this. Uh, it's so delightful, and I'm truly so, so grateful. Thank you to everyone, okay. and we will look forward to um, publishing and talking further. <laughs>